Hello everyone, it is spooky season. Welcome to the Tardis Steel Chess Festival, which is now <laughs> on tour in The Hague. And uh, it's not Halloween out there. Uh, will the players feel possessed in this dark and uh, terrifying arena? Daniel, it's round nine, Tardis Steel Chess. There's some movement in the background, but uh, yeah. what about this change of scenery? Uh, Daniel Narodisky, uh, thank you for joining today. I had to check the date, David, to make sure it wasn't October 31st, uh, but it is in fact January uh, the 23rd, which means it's day for, time for another day of action. I love the environment. I hope the lights come on at some point, and I hope uh, the players will vike up in time in order to make their way to this historic, storied Dutch city of The Hague for what should be a very action-packed round. That's uh, pretty much guaranteed. And we know that yesterday was a rest day, but we saw a bunch of action in round eight on Sunday, uh, just before the day's play of uh, day of rest. And uh, here we were the results. We saw five draws in the master section, five eventful draws full of twists and turns, but ultimately only two victors. It was Jan Nepomnishi defeating Nodibek Abdusatorov in a really classy positional effort and Alariz of Ruja blowing world champion Dingleren off the board with a sparkling attack. And uh, that, yeah, I mean, that entertained us, Dania. It shocked us. Uh, Ding, Nodibek up to Storov. They'll have been grateful for the rest day uh, to be able to recharge and reset. Yes, yeah, so, so difficult to build momentum uh, in this tournament. You think you have it figured out, and then boom, you suffer a devastating loss. Those two wins could not have been more different. Um, and just a big shout out, Nepo, playing some amazing chess the last couple of rounds, moving up in the tournament standings, but he is still half a point, David, behind this group of three leaders, Giri, uh, Gukesh, and of course, Ali Reza Faruja, who's had an up and down event, but uh, his ups so far have superseded the downs, and he's done a great job of bouncing back from some painful defeats. That's right. We see Gukesh and Alareza Faruja joining Giri in the lead, but they've both lost two games, both won four games, and actually only one point uh, difference between first place and ninth place right now. So it's a really open field and a lot to look forward to today. And uh, talking of today, let's go check out what we have in store for you. Okay, uh, here we go. To start, Donchenko against Alareza Faruja. What do you make of that one? Yeah, it's going to be a challenge for Donchenko, but he's been very solid throughout this tournament. Um, and there isn't a single easy pairing, as we know from Ju and June, David, who's had such a great event. She faces Pragnananda. What a matchup that's going to be. Yes, and uh, Abdul Sotorov aiming to bounce back from that defeat, as we mentioned. Uh, Yana Pomnishi on a bit of a roll right now in his match. But uh, for me, the match of the round, world championship, uh, world champion, Ding Loren against Anish Giri. <laughs> And uh, what do you make, uh, what do you predict for that one? Well, he will be playing a world championship uh, soon enough. <laughs> I mean, time is, time is flying, isn't it? Um, I'm very curious how that game is going to go, David. I, I could see it being a quick draw. I could see Ding saying, listen, I'm not having a good tournament. Let's play it safe. I could also see him, I'm not having a good tournament. Let's not play it safe. And I'm really hoping for the latter over the former. But also Noderbeck versus Vin Forest. Big emphasis on Jan Nepomnishi. I'm curious how he's going to handle the black pieces. Will he take a lot of risk against Wei, or will he default to the Petrov um, and the solid repertoire that he has showcased over the past few years? A lot of questions, a lot of exciting games today for the spectators who've made their way to uh, The Hague to watch yeah. the games in the darkness. <laughs> I can confirm that this is not Anish Giri's basement. This is uh, <laughs> the Athos Circus Theater. <laughs> I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh -oh. uh, Afos Circus Theater, I'll say, <laughs> for those uh, Anglophiles out there. But uh, either way, we can now see the spectators. Wow, I've very rarely seen chess in this atmosphere. Um, they often say chess players look better in the dark, but I'm hoping at some point we get to see the players uh, shine a light on the boards. Yes, I'm hoping for that as well. But uh, this is great. I mean, it's innovative. It's you know, furthers the atmosphere, particularly for newer spectators. Um, it might seem like an, you know, irrelevant show, but I think it's really, really nice. I think it sets the tone for the spectators and the players. It motivates the players. And I really like the fact that um, tournaments move city to city. That's kind of old school, David. A lot of people might not know that 
uh, some of the early World Championship matches, such as the one between Steinitz and Zuckertort. Uh, the first ever World Championship match was played in three cities. I think New Orleans, St. Louis, and I want to say Baltimore. But it was very common for tournaments and matches to move from city to city uh, so that spectators from all across the country uh, could attend some of the games and revel in the atmosphere. This is awesome. Yeah, this really is awesome. Chess on tour. And uh, even as recently as the days of Kasparov, there were World Championships uh, held in different cities. So, yeah, really nice to see uh, Dutch fans being entertained like this. Uh, this is the... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this is... it would be nice if eventually, you know, at some later point, the lights came on. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, I mean, this is basically blindfold chess, right? Except uh, with the added flavor of having to move the pieces <laughs> without being able to see them. Um, normally you can just shout out your moves, but um, I'm expecting a grand entrance from the players any moment now. Yes, maybe they will descend from the sky like, you know, a Cirque du Soleil show. Like some <laughs> unseen force will propel them to the ground right at the spot that they're supposed to be in. Ah, for Circus du Soleil. That's uh, definitely... Uh, on the cards any moment now and uh, no gong this time now we're no longer in Vikanze no gong to start the round but I'm expecting something a bit flashy they're definitely building the tension here setting the scene for us yeah definitely the figures moving about nefariously lend this air of gravitas to the round the show is being prepared and there we go a view of the spectators looks like a full house David yeah that's hundreds, uh, hundreds of uh, spectators already thousands, in uh, tens the playing hall. Thousands, of thousands. <laughs> Let's say hundreds of thousands. <laughs> yeah. Do you um, do you frequent uh, cinemas, theaters uh, like this one, Daniel? Um, I'm not a big theater person. I've been to like a good amount of plays. I can't really remember the last time I've been to a cinema. Maybe to see Oppenheimer. Um, mm -hmm. I think that was the one time in the last couple of years. But this seems like an old school theater. Probably in existence since, I don't know, 1500s, 1600s. The Hague is a very old city. It, um, its first mention was in the 13th century. So here in the US, you come across a building that was built in 1890 and we think it's ancient. And you look at the Netherlands and you look at some of these cities and when they were founded in 1233, <laughs> 1266, pretty incredible. Yeah, that's a bit vague talking about The Hague. 13th oh, century. We wanna... <laughs> oh my god, I'm, uh, I'm very jealous. <laughs> and the lights are on. Wow. Uh, the players not yet at their seats. We're expecting some big announcements. The tournament organizers clearly about to introduce the players uh, in a bit of a flashy way. And there we go. Parham Magzuli, first to take his seat. Beautiful. Parham getting ready. He's had a rough event, obviously. Several painful losses, but we know that that doesn't really impact his mood, he is a fighter. Um, he really plays for the love of the game in kind of an old school way. And that makes his games so fun to look at. Yeah, yet to click into gear, but today he has the white pieces and uh, now his opponent, Max Varmadam, takes his seat. This really reminds me of uh, the tournaments that actually got me into chess, Dania. Uh, the 1994 Intel, uh, these rapid tournaments uh, where the players, they were sat on the stage, the lights would dim and uh, yeah, it was just really dramatic stuff, and uh, yeah, fast forward, <laughs> fast forward thirty years, and uh, this is what we're left with: chess uh, in an auditorium. This is beautiful to see, and uh, now it's the turn of Jordan Van Forest. Um, yeah, all the Dutch players uh, entering the stage first. To rapturous applause, clearly in the background. <laughs> oh yes, the deafening. <laughs> Absolutely, I mean, they need to check their ears afterward. But uh, Jordan Van Forest has won this event before he is a very streaky player all smiles to start a handshake against Noderbeck Abdusatorov but of course the smiles will be wiped off the players faces as they always are once the clocks are started um, Noderbeck definitely has chances to win this event but he will have to shake off his painful loss against Yanda Panushi uh, from the day before yesterday that's right and more players taking their seats now I really love the starry starry Sky, the starry, starry night above uh, on the ceiling of the theater. Um, as we see more players being introduced. Who is it now? It's Wei Yi. He poked his head out there just very briefly. Yeah, yeah just briefly. <laughs> so just make sure the commentators don't get the name wrong. Tournament director, thanks for standing in front of the camera. Uh, oh, no, it's a photographer. And there we go, Wei Yi 
with the uh, stars behind him. Will he be a star of today's round of today's show? He has a big game of him ahead of him, of course. And uh, very good. Yeah, <laughs> the way he incorporated stars. I'm curious if it'll actually be a combative game, or will it's, it all be theater? And will we see a quick draw? <laughs> it's the Milky Way behind him, Danya. No, way you can't, dis oh, can't disappoint sorry. the guy. That was a galactic level pun. <laughs> I try my best. And uh, Yanda Ponishi now, his opponent, as we mentioned, uh, on a bit of a roll now. Nice victory before the rest day. Um, he will want to keep that going. But with black, it's not going to be straightforward at all. And uh, that leaves us with just a few players uh, yet to take their seats. And any moment now, we'll be off. Yeah. Round nine will begin. They're keeping us, uh, <laughs> keeping us guessing. Yeah, they're definitely taking their time. We're used to this tournament starting you know, uh, well, 8 o'clock for me, I guess it's 1 p.m. in the Netherlands on the dot. And uh, this organization has been honed over the course of Tata Steel's 80-year history. It's gone through many name changes, but the tournament is still the same. It's still the prestigious, incredible event that we are all used to and love. There was Pragnananda also poking his head out of the darkness. He faces Ju and Jun, a <laughs> woman in red, <laughs> Ju and Jun, at the board as well. Yeah. Roman world champion. We're lucky we have uh, both world champions playing in this field and she's done fantastically well and looking dangerous as well. Uh, she's got a great score but could have been more yeah. and uh, she'll be aiming to counter if Pregnananda pushes too hard with the white pieces. Meanwhile, Alexander Donchenko, we mentioned this matchup as well against Alireza Ferruja and I mean, he's just probably the most entertaining player in world chess to watch right now. Um, Dania, do you think this kind of uh, roller coaster of win followed by a painful loss, do you think it might continue? Oh, absolutely. I think Alexander Donchenko is an incredibly solid player, but realistically, Ali Reza knows that in this tournament, you don't have a lot of chances of truly playing for a win with black. He tried to do it against Vidit. That didn't go too well. Ding. Uh, then I think we might see another successful result from the talented French youngster. There's another handshake. I believe that is Gukesh. And the headless body. There we go. Now uh, the head is attached as well. Good to know Vidit didn't lose his head yesterday. <laughs> yeah, Vidit. Uh, big fan favorite Vidit these days. <laughs> <laughs> Vidit, he did it. And uh, he's now meditating. Typical pose for him. We're used to seeing this these days. Often spending the first minute or two of his games not even moving, Daniel, just uh, in meditative mood. And now his clock isn't even running, so you know he can save time while he's doing it. Gukesh quietly has had a very successful event, had to put away some of the early tournament jitters. But once he did, he's been showing a very high consistent level. Um, he's obviously been on a bit of a roll recently, and there is the world champion, Dingli Ren, sitting down at his chair. The board very well lit. The pieces almost look yellow in the light. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I do see some applause from the crowd behind, so not the most animated of supporters, but uh, they are <laughs> <laughs> celebrating their heroes here uh, in The Hague. And uh, what do you think about Ding? Is it going to click? He's still only one and a half points off the uh, the leaders, including Anish Giri. So a win here, he'll close the gap. It uh, feels like he's not quite hit top gear. Do you think today will be the day? This is the great irony of this tournament. You really can turn things around. It's not just a cliche because it's a doggy dog tournament. Everybody beats everybody. Oh, I agree. I think all it takes is one win uh, to give Ding the confidence that he needs to finish this tournament strong. I think his chances to win the tournament, very unrealistic. His chances to finish maybe in the top three um, would greatly increase with a victory over Anish Giri today. But Anish has been in such solid, stellar form. It seems that he always is in great form uh, in this tournament that is played on his home turf. It will not be an easy game for either world champion today. Mm -hmm. But yeah, a win in today's round and any ding is possible for the rest of the event. So uh, he really <laughs> needs uh, the world champion to get things going. And uh, here we see five of the seven boards lit up. And any moment now, I keep saying yes. it, but the handshakes. Time for the organizers to shift it into a higher gear and maybe start the clocks. <laughs> oh, I approve of that one. Anish Giri, of course, the local boy right now. He lives just outside The Hague, I'm being told. So uh, lots of home fans cheering for him. 
uh, that we see him on camera, the local lad. Have you ever played David a tournament in your home city? And if so, do you like the concept of staying at home during a tournament, or do you prefer to stay at the, the hotel and have the tournament experience? Yeah, it's tough. There's a lot of distractions at home. I don't know how you find it, Daniel, but <laughs> it's just hard to focus. Uh, <laughs> lots of chores to be done. Uh, it's always nice to get in the zone, uh, but also nice to get uh, kind of that support from home fans, right? Yes. I mean, I've had this experience many times in, in Charlotte. There's a lot of tournaments, but all of the tournaments are at the opposite end of the city. So it's a long drive and there's nothing I would rather not be doing before the start of a game than like focusing on getting to the tournament hall. You want to wake up, go down the stairs, get a coffee, go to the, go to your board. You don't want to focus on washing the dishes from, you know, yesterday's McDonald's that you had at 2 a.m. <laughs> um, and then sitting in traffic and, you know, making your way to the board. So ironically, I actually like staying at the tournament hotel, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm sure transportation was arranged uh, to The Hague for the players. They didn't have to hail an Uber from Vikonze. <laughs> I think the organizers took care of that. And there we go. I think everybody's seated. Okay, I think it's time to time to get things moving, folks. Yeah. 106, um, let's go. <laughs> chess on tour, and we're impatient for the games to begin. Um, the players, of course, after this rest day, thrown out of their comfort zone by playing in a new venue. But uh, often that does kind of that change up in routine. It does favor those players who've been struggling a bit. It's always nice to change things up, get this uh, kind of different atmosphere going. And OK, all the photographers looking elsewhere. But wow, June and June, deep in concentration already. Hmm. Prax <laughs> just <laughs> Prax was one of the, as well. Was one of the photographers wearing a jersey that said photo? Like <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not clear what this guy with the big camera is standing there doing. I think I need to <laughs> make it clear. And there we go. Anish looking over for approval. Can I start the clock? You may. Yes. Yes, Anish. We give you permission. There and we go. The games are off. It's the English opening. I approve, Ding. I greatly approve. And uh, Anish reacts instantly by pushing a pawn of his own. And finally, Daniel, after all of that, uh, that eerie atmosphere, we have liftoff. Indeed, after all of the fanfare, pomp and circumstance, light and darkness, we have a Queen's Gambit declined. Slightly anticlimactic opening, but can't really blame Anish for wanting to be solid out of the gates. And Bishop to e7, one of the more fashionable moves, of course, issuing the classical knight f6, David. But at this point, Bishop e7 is essentially just as uh, mainstream. Yeah, and uh, the idea is to not allow white willingly on White's terms to uh, kind of erect this pin with uh, a bishop on g5 hitting a knight on f6, just keeping Black's options open and saying to White, yes, you can develop your dark squared bishop, but it's only going to land as far as f4. And uh, of course, a variety of ways Ding can play this. He can bring his bishop out after maybe an exchange of pawns in the center. He can just mm -hmm. keep the tension by bringing his knight out. Um, a lot of choice for White at this early stage. They tend to take the pawn, though. Uh, that tends to be the trendy move before landing a bishop on f4. Yeah, I want to say that the only line I've ever seen here is like c takes d5, e takes d5, bishop f4. And then you sometimes see black readjusting the dark squared bishop to d6. The point of the, these types of openings is that uh, because there's not much going on in the center, black can often afford to spend multiple tempi, uh, making multiple moves with the same piece. But Ding, taking his time, I'm sure there are other moves. I mean, knight f3 is obviously also a feasible possibility. I feel like in a situation like this in the World Championship, David, <laughs> we saw like H3. <laughs> Maybe we'll see A3. You never know in 2024. H4, I'm sure, is probably like a top three suggestion by Leela. But not today. Today we see traditional chess. C takes D5 on the board. Yeah, traditional move. Queen's Gambit declined. Uh, this is pretty much the defining structure. We'll soon see the Carlsbad structure. And... Uh, I don't know about you, Daniel, but I loved it during the World Championship where it felt like Ding was freestyling. He was playing these weird, wacky, wonderful uh, lines, which may be a bit dubious, but uh, it felt like he was pushing himself out of his comfort zone just as much as his opponent. And the results were spectacular. I mean, win or loss, uh, Ding's games were so much fun to watch. And maybe he needs something like that just to kick him or just to force him out of this kind of funk he's found himself in this tournament yet to... Uh, really uh, kind of shine as we're used to see, uh, seeing him do. I agree completely. I, I mean, I think that he needs to get some sort of a strategic battle. I think he struggled in head-to-head -head tactics. We saw that 
against Ali Reza. He made a direct blunder. I think he needs to get something solid, but obviously with an edge. And this is a pretty good system um, to do that. Now, um, e3, I think, is pretty automatic. And then black has a choice of several different variations. Anish gets up once again. The light squared bishop can come out to f5. And as I said earlier, David, I also have seen the move bishop e7 to d6, trying to swap uh, the dark squared bishops, and then proceeding with uh, kingside development. Yeah, and uh, looks like Anish Giri is a confident man away from the board. He's got his opponent thinking, first of all, and I have just got confirmation that home comforts are a thing. Maybe Anish uh, on the rest day popped over, saw his kids, uh, because he lives literally around the corner, <laughs> literally a few wow. streets away. Um, so nice for him to be, uh, yeah. Maybe that's where uh, he went just yeah. now. Maybe he's stopping <laughs> by home to feed feed his kids, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Say hello to the that wife and uh, come back to, to the board. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's uh, yeah, that's something we'll find out. Uh, this will be proof uh, that home advantage does exist in chess if Anish Giri is able to win this game. Uh, but Ding, in the meantime, uh, pausing. And maybe we should then take a pause from this game. Okay, he plays the non-committal move E3. Uh, very standard stuff. And uh, let's go to the bird's eye view, Daniel, because there's some <laughs> crazy stuff happening elsewhere. Yeah, no, I think we need to look at this game, e3, what a what an innovative move. And bishop f5, as uh, we discussed by Anish, we might see g2, g4 uh, by Ding, which is a very fashionable move. But we look at the bird's eye view here, David, and a feast for the eyes. Indeed, look at Baksudlu versus Warmerdam there in the bottom middle. We have a very unconventional Italian in Abdusatorov versus Van Forest, Jordan, with an early d7, d5 push, and of course, a fried liver. Um, on the right-hand corner in Praktananto versus Ju and Jun, H2, H4. So I was right. We, we did see H4. It just wasn't in Ding's game. It was in Prague's game. <laughs> that's right. It's Silence of the Lambs over there with the fried liver attack. And uh, maybe that's the game we start with. Uh, yeah. Praktananto against Ju and Jun. We started with one world champion. Let's go to the other in the field. Let's do it. There we will go. And this move, H2, H4, I know nothing about this line. I know very little about. Um, I know that it's been kind of up and down in popularity. Hikaru uh, won a game here with white against Fabiano. But this move, H4, David, what do you know about it? Is this a surprise? Is this a novelty? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a surprise. I can guarantee that. But it's not a novelty. And it has been played a bit recently. Uh, I do remember, um, firstly, this was played against me many, many years ago. I think as far back as twenty. Oof, 2013, <laughs> a long time ago. Um, either way, um, this has become popular. I, I remember Alariza Ferrucha playing this with White against Fabiano Caruana as recently as, I believe, the Sinkfield Cup. Um, I'm probably getting that wrong now, but uh, that became a crazy game with Black playing the move H6, trying mm -hmm. to kick away this intruder, the White Knight on G5, and White's Queen coming out to H5 and uh, creating some threats. And things get crazy. Often Black sacrifices even more material having already gone down upon, uh, but white is so far behind in development, especially uh, with those queenside pieces, and there's always going to be compensation. Um, yeah, there's always going to be tricks. So we'll delve into the lines if and when they come, but Prague trying to spice things up, trying to put the pressure on Zhu and Jun really early doors. Wow, what an incredible <laughs> attempt by Prague going right into the fried liver. And I, I definitely agree we should wait for uh, Black's response to really try to get the hang of this position and to wait to really plunge in because, I mean, there's multiple moves here. Bishop e7, uh, obviously h6 is the most tempting. We also might see the knight jumping into f4. But if I may just ask a preliminary question, is Prague's idea um, after h6, and I'll put this on the board really quickly, to play queen h5? Because my bullet tactical brain which is the only brain that I essentially have left, spots one trick, but I actually don't think that this trick works. So in this position, obviously h takes g5, gives up the rook. If black plays g6, I think white wants to sack on g6. But if black plays a move like queen f6, knight takes f7 is a very tempting trick, David, but I don't think it works. The point, of course, queen takes f7, beautiful. You know, we love life. We like picking up black's queen, but unfortunately you attack the piece that's delivering the discovered check. I think black has this very unpleasant shot. Knight f4. And the only way to step away with the knight to avoid losing the queen is knight d6 check. But after king d7, white will drop either the queen 
or the knight. So I wonder what Prague's idea is after queen f6. Maybe he just wants to drop the knight back to e4 and continue normally. Yeah, darkness would fall for uh, white <laughs> in that variation. Knight takes f7 is not possible, but knight h7 is a, also a move, Daniel, oh. in that position. Oh. <laughs> I don't it's recommend it at home. to play often. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it is a theoretical move, knight h7, and black is well within the rights to sacrifice material there uh, to get that knight off the board and try to trap the bishop long term uh, with a move like g6. But this is known, I believe. I, I don't know the current evaluation. I don't know what modern theory has uh, declared, whether this is playable at all for white. But from a human point of view, it's so risky for both sides, and that's why Prague, uh, being the better prepared player, having studied it clearly with a computer this morning, uh, feels brave enough to go in for this type of thing. Yeah, Ju and Jun has to be very, very careful. Um, this is not the kind of line that you waltz into um, when you haven't reviewed your, you know, fried liver in the last couple of weeks. So I think this is why Ju and Jun is pausing. Maybe she knows that H6 is the most principled move, but she's thinking, but wait a second, I haven't brushed up on the lines. I'm, you know, I think maybe I'm going to go wrong there. So maybe it's worth playing a slightly inferior, but easier to play move like bishop e7. These are very difficult decisions, which remind me um, why I don't play much classical chess anymore. <laughs> this is very committal early on. It's only move nine, and we can expect you and June to spend a good deal of time um, making this, this big decision early in the opening against Prague. Yeah, you mentioned earlier, Daniel, your bullet brain. That's all you need, especially in these types of positions. <laughs> but unfortunately for Zhu and Jun, it is classical chess, and yeah, actually it's sad. easy to get yeah easy to get stuck inside her own mind here, just kind of worrying about uh, opponent's preparation. That's at least what I find the most difficult thing when you know your opponent's about to drop a bomb on you, drop this opening novelty or open, kind of rare idea on you. It's just kind of surviving this early stage and uh, not getting too flustered. But it's hard and uh, tough situation for her. She spent five six minutes now, um, but. About to make a move? No. I think she'll play h6, and this variation we were talking about, queen h5, queen f6, likely to appear on the board after some yep. thought. <laughs> of course, readjusting her sitting position there. But uh, this is a game to watch. It can, I mean, descend into complete chaos in the next couple of moves. And I like this from Prague. I think this is exactly the way that you should approach uh, the opening. He's playing something risky, but he's taking the game to territory where... He is just better prepared, um, and he's playing a very, very concrete line where the biggest X factor is preparation. It's not your understanding. All of that goes out the window. The position is irrational. Principles don't apply. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. All that matters is who has pressed the space bar uh, more times in their chess space and who has reviewed their file more recently, and that's fine. This is the way that you have to play, and we will probably leave Ju and June to her devices here. Seven and a half minutes in counting, David. But a good opportunity for us to look at some of the other exciting games. Yeah, she wishes she had some uh, devices right now. Uh, yes. As you mentioned, it's all about clicking that space bar. But yes, let's zoom out. And uh, actually, I spy some other exciting Italians, Daniel. You spy some other Italians, don't you? Um, I mean, I think you were very critical to Ju and Ju, and I think you should be nice to her. Be nice, <laughs> be nice to her. Okay, uh, I forget I said anything. Um, <laughs> should we go to the Abdusatorov game? Let's do just that, uh, because it's a very trendy, um, just like that line that Pragnanda is employing now with uh, Faruja having endorsed it recently, this line has become trendy. And uh, just, I mean, I believe even one, two years ago, everyone frowned down upon this line uh, from the black side. Uh, maybe we retrace our steps here, Dania. Um, I'm still because, frowning on it, looking at the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, me too. But uh, modern engines have made everything playable. Um, they say everything is roughly level, so you can get away with things as long as you know the opening and the variations better than your opponent. So if we go from uh, move one, um, we see the Italian game. So far, so good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no fried liver in this one after knight f6. Ah. Just d3 and immediately met by opening the center. And uh, yeah, it used to be thought that black was just simply not quick enough to do this. You needed to get developed first uh, as black before being... Uh, brave enough to open things up, but modern players uh, making things work. And this has been uh, yeah, seen, I believe, in the challenges section a few times already this tournament. Um, actually, shout out to the challengers who are still playing in Vikanze and 
uh, have uh, experimented with the likes of King's Gambits this this round. But this one has been seen, and the current position, it's all about the Black King, Daniel. Yes, I mean, the reason that, you know, traditional knowledge frowns upon uh, this early D75, David, as far as I understand, is because Black often cannot handle uh, the center opening up early. Black is behind a development. D4 is coming very, very quickly. And if the center opens up, Black just starts to crumble uh, at the seam. So, for example, I mean, I'm not exactly sure how Black should handle this position. <laughs> Black might be worse already. But let's say that Black just castles. You know, what's wrong with this move? Well, after d4, the situation gets extremely unpleasant. E takes d4. I mean, maybe c takes d4 and knight c3 uh, is a very decent way to treat this position, but also just knight takes d4, knight takes d4, and, and even something as primitive as just queen takes d4, c6. You could even just play bishop takes d5 and go for a slight advantage, um, or you could add pressure on the knight, play c4. Either way, when the center opens up, black starts to suffer, and this is the reason why Jordan um, has... Refrain from this line. He has played the move. Knight back to b6, but dang, this is risky. Now he can't castle kingside. He's trying to maybe play a4 and push this bishop away from this diagonal. But of course, Noterbeck wasn't born yesterday. He can push a4. I mean, he was born <laughs> not so long ago, but not yesterday. Maybe he can proceed with his plan. This is a very, very concrete position. Yeah. Uh, these kids, <laughs> they know everything. But um, yeah, Jordan, he's taking massive risks with black. Of course, that's his style. Uh, it's a bit of a trademark for him, Jordan, being provocative. But uh, yeah, this is another level of crazy. And I guess if white does prevent the bishop from being kicked off this diagonal, say your a4 move, um, black might even try to castle on the other flank within the next few turns. So bishop f5 or bishop g4, uh, followed by a quick queen to d7 and castling long and... Yeah, this one, I think it's going to be as chaotic as the settings out there in The, the Hague. Oh <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, one side is going to suffer here. I'm not sure who that's going to be. I would be terrified being black. But uh, you wouldn't. He's the local boy. He's trying to make things happen. Um, yeah, don't try it at home, but interesting for us as commentators. Don't try it at home, but maybe try it in, in The Hague. And I, I appreciate uh, Jordan's fighting attitude. He always brings innovative opening preparation uh, no matter who he's playing against but I'm, I'm totally with you david i would be terrified of playing this against noterbeck but yeah if black can get the bishop out and quickly castle queenside you know white's got some tender pawns in the center and you you do sometimes see um white losing games pretty quickly in the italian if you don't respond very accurately uh to these to these types of of sidelines and there's a good russian expression those uh, those who don't risk don't drink champagne. And um, either way, win or lose, I think Jordan Van Forest might need some champagne if he loses, and he might want to pop a, a nice toast if he wins. So it's a win-win situation. Great game unfolding here um, in the first couple of moves. Wow. I've never heard that phrase before, but I'm definitely going to steal it and <laughs> use it in future anytime I, anytime I play a tournament. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, the Italian game, it's had this reputation, especially the last few years of being a bit dry, a bit quiet, lots of maneuvering, and it only kind of comes to life later. But suddenly we've seen the fried liver attack, uh, one of the branches of the Italian. We've seen this mm -hmm. unorthodox variation. And yeah, these players these days, they're getting restless. They're trying to not just entertain us, of course, but they're trying to kind of uh, go for their opponents early, early on. And it's really refreshing. I've got to say, no longer just sitting there with the Berlin as black trying to make a draw just to <laughs> for their opponents. No, no, no. There's lots of Italians. Shall we continue to roam around? And oh, continue? wow. I was, That's I had level. that one up like seven minutes ago. <laughs> just like waiting impatiently. I apologize. No, I, uh, oh, wow. I can't compete with that GM level of pun, Daniel. Uh, <laughs> that that okay, compl it's... completes my knowledge of Italian cities. <laughs> There's exactly two of them I know. Oh, Napoli, there must be a pun on Napoli or Milan. Let's, oh no, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll cook one up for later. Either way, let's go to a, another game where there has been, I'm not sure whether it's the Italian or whether it's uh, kind of its cousin, the Bishop's opening, but uh, maybe just a brief uh, brief touch in with uh, Wei Yi and Nepomnishi. Absolutely. Wow, this round could not be more different from. Again, I want to say yesterday's round. Okay, you get what I mean. The previous round, I guess, yeah. is a good way to say it, where we had some very slow openings. 
a lot of risk management before the rest day. Today, we're seeing a lot of 1E4. We're seeing a lot of aggressive lines by both colors and a lot of innovative ideas in the opening. Yes, the last move, David, was Knight, which came from D2 back to its initial square. Okay, I didn't like it there. Let's try to see greener pastures on C3. And you were absolutely correct. This was a bishop's opening um, and a traditional bishop's opening. It didn't transpose uh, into the Italian as uh, the bishop's opening tends to do sometimes. I'll rewind a little bit just to give people some context. How did we get here? Bishop's opening, bishop c4 on move two. Knight f6, d3, c6, which is a very ambitious way uh, to meet the bishop's opening, going for full central control with d7, d5. Knight f3, d5, bishop b3. Yes, this is traditional theory. Uh, there's a known trap here, David, for newer players. Uh, if black plays d takes c4, do not, under any circumstances, take on e5 because of the fork. But instead, I think after knight g5, Black is actually in quite a bit of trouble. There's no good way to defend the f7 pawn. So Wei Yi, of course, bishop b4 check, bishop d2 trade, a5, a4, knight bd7, completing their development, rookie 1, rookie 8. Now the trade in the center, very interesting, and knight b1 on the board. And wow, they've made like six six more moves while I've been explaining this. b6 by Yan, knight comes around to c3, and all the way up to b5. Mm hmm yeah, talking of the uh, Italian game, this is the bishop's opening, but I think this is the influence, influence oh, like, of the rest day. That was very good. <laughs> oh, no, I butchered it slightly, but um, yeah, it's just the influence of the rest day. These uh, these players, um, it feels like they've done a lot of homework. So a lot of quick moves here. We're already at move fourteen after less than half an hour, and knight b five, as you say, this outpost, big threat. Knight d six, a winning idea on the board. So Jan needs to guard against this. I'm expecting. Maybe something uh, like queen to b8. Uh, it feels like you're contorting slightly, or bishop to c6. And um, yeah, still should be roughly level, but uh, he's showing the way to go, way ye here. And uh, he's the one asking the questions <laughs> early on, setting up the threats, the traps. Okay, yeah. I mean, first impression is pretty positive here for white, ignoring the clock situation, which tells us that this may very well still be um, white's preparation. Yes, you know, black on paper has superior control of the center, but a lot to deal with here along the edges, David. You mentioned, of course, the immediate threat, uh, knight, knight d6. How does black deal with it? Yeah, I was gonna mention queen b8, which I think looks very, very nice because not only do you control d6, but you add another defender to the e5 pawn. Um, and I wonder how white's gonna treat this position. Are we gonna see a slower move? Like, you know, something like queen d2, something nondescript, or are we gonna see more concrete play from Way E. Will he fall into a frenzy a frenzy and play with like I don't know, D4 fixing the center? Hard position to kind of get your head around. I actually kind of like the look of D4 here. D4 E4, drop the knight back, and maybe try to orchestrate another knight maneuver all the way up to E3. Yeah, as you say, it's difficult. Um there's a variety of plans available for both sides, of course. Um Way E doesn't need to commit anything yet, but I do like d4 as well, and it's mainly uh, kind of got, kind of uh, designed against Black's bishop. Black's bishop on b7, if it ever opens up on the diagonal, it will become a fantastic piece. But uh, right now, you can pretty much lock it down for life, for good, uh, with the move d4. But that's also very committal. You normally don't uh, kind of recommend allowing the opponent to bypass you, build a bigger pawn chain, get mm -hmm. a bit more space. Um, so it's just about whether he feels it's the right moment. He could just wait, maybe c3 or kind of build or queen d2, as you say, just kind of not commit and uh, decide a bit later. But d4 feels like it's going to come uh, within the next few moves, most likely. Um, I'm not sure what black's doing next either. Knight c5 might be a small kind of positional threat, so I would kind of uh, I would advocate for either c3 or d4, just kind of either waiting or fixing, depending on his mood. Yeah, I think I actually think d4 on this on this move is is the principled approach, and it's instructive for a lot of people because it's so easy to reject d4. You see e4, it looks scary. It's a tempo move, but you calculate one step further. I'll just put this on the board really quickly, and then we can move on to um, one of our other very exciting games. But after d4, e4, knight d2, suddenly you look at this position and you notice well the knight on d7 completely restricted by the pawns. You mentioned David the bishop on b7 has no future, and if it migrates, let's say, to a6, then black relinquishes 
the grip on the d5 pawn, and this knight f1, knight e3 maneuver becomes even more unpleasant. Later in the game, white can also push c2, c4, breaking apart the center, reactivating his own bishop. So upon closer examination, you begin to see how difficult it is to play black uh, in a position like this. My vote is the immediate d4. I think it might give white uh, a small but nagging um, and stable edge in this position. Yeah, there's no way he won't play this one, uh, d4. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I've actually had that pawn structure, pretty much this exact pawn structure myself, a couple of times as black. And um, at first I thought it looked really attractive. Black has pawns on d5, e4, it's really nice. But yeah, you start to realize white's the one with the pawn breaks, as you mentioned. And as black, it feels like you're just always trying to cover things. You're always trying to improve pieces. Whereas you do have these uh, weaknesses, especially the d5 pawn, uh, kind of long-term saddling you. Uh, saddling you there. So, okay, we're um, not going to get too excited about this one. There are more exciting games elsewhere, maybe, but where he is about to move, let's just see what he plays next, and then we will move on. It is indeed pawn to d4, locking the center. Indeed. Good decision. Gives white complete blockade uh, in the center, but definitely one to watch. I think Jan has to be, Jan has to be vigilant in the next couple of moves to avoid falling into... Uh, the situation that Noterbeck had against Jan, right? It's like a slight advantage. Ah, you think you're still safe. You make a couple of careless moves. Boom. Suddenly you're essentially lost. And Jan blitzes out e4. We will see knight d2. And uh, definitely a game to keep track of. Yeah. Both players playing very principal chess. Um, other games that feature principal chess right now, uh, actually all over the place, there's exciting yeah, stuff geez. going on. Whoa. Look at this. I think it's just being on tour. It's really giving the players a bit more freedom uh, oh to express God, themselves. Pawn on h6 on the top right by Ding. <laughs> but that might not even be the most exciting game. Wow. Where to go next? Maybe a brief touch in, uh, kind of a, a brief update on some of the games we haven't seen. And then we might go back to Ding uh, sure. against Anish Giri, against local boy Giri, who's got more time than he started with. Um, okay. Uh, you mentioned Magzulu against Varmadam, first of all, uh, once we jumped into the round. And. Um, Maybe just a brief recap there. It feels like this one is uh, the calm before the storm, but Black has given up a pawn, a bit of a gambit early on, and it's one that we know Max Varmadam is a bit of an expert in, uh, having used this opening two rounds ago against Gukesh. Yes, this is known as the Shara Gambit, I think. I'm just reading off the chess.com label. Um, I'm actually not that good with opening names, um, particularly with more obscure openings. And you might wonder how this, how this was reached. Yes, Black is down a pawn. So it started off as a queen's gambit declined, knight c3, c5. This is the Tarash, of course. And after c takes d5, for a long time, e takes d5 was automatic. Now it's almost unplayed. And if black plays this, it means he is going into this incredibly sharp gambit line. Queen takes d4, knight c6, blundering the knight. Just kidding. Uh, he can't take it because the queen is pinned. This is a very common idea in many openings. Queen drops back. There is the sacrifice. White, of course, typical Parham, always goes for the most principled response. He accepts the gambit. Queen c7. There are safer ways to play with white, but this is the way to try to punish it. And what does black get in a turn for the pawn? Well, obviously, very, very quick development, right? And you could just see it without any knowledge of this line. And I don't have any knowledge of this line, <laughs> so I'm seeing it too. Rook is coming to d8. Bishop is coming to b4. Even with an untrained eye, uh, you can see how quickly Black's pieces unravel, and you can understand that White needs to be very precise here. I think, David, the problem isn't so much that White is going to get mated. I mean, you could castle fairly quickly, but White could get subjected to a lot of pressure, particularly on the queen side, with you know a well-timed bishop before hitting the knight, maybe in some situations knight before. Um, a lot of monsters await in this position. Yeah, and uh, I must confess that a, a few years ago, I was thinking of adding this, opening this Shara Gambit to my repertoire as black. Uh, I spent some time studying it with computers. I played through some games, and it's pretty much, as you say, it looks playable. Um, computers always give a tiny advantage for white, but it's hard to understand exactly why, and the moves are very, very forcing. But uh, ultimately, as black, uh, yes, you're playing for initiative. Yes, you're playing very aggressively, but... At some point, White just gives the pawn back. It tends to be a queenside pawn, as you say. It might be the A2 pawn that you give back at some point, or the B2 pawn. And once White gets castled, it's just a game. And um, yeah, it feels like you're fighting. You're having to memorize a lot, as Max Varmadam did a couple of rounds ago. He memorized 30 moves of theory. 
but ultimately mm-hmm. he ended up in a slightly worse end game and uh, <laughs> went down to defeat. So it's it's kind of that uh, it's a matter of taste. It's not my taste to kind of suffer just to, to try and equalize after uh, yeah after all of that hard work. But uh, yeah, if you can and if you can get your opponent thinking early on, it can be a nice psychological weapon. Uh, Max on the camera looks very relaxed out there in the Hague. And it's Parham uh, doing the thinking early on, wondering whether he has time to get castled or whether there are more pressing concerns. So yeah, I'm expecting bishop e2 and castle kingside because that's the practical thing to do when you're met by a small surprise or uh, when your opponent's given up a pawn for nothing. You might as well try and uh, figure out why uh, why, and uh, try to get castled as soon as possible. But yeah, ultimately, uh, I think this one will be decided a bit later on. I agree. Yeah, I mean, the engine in these types of positions tends to give very, very inhuman suggestions, like bishop to d2. I mean, it seems like a case of wrong priorities. Like, I would, you know, I would definitely get my king side out uh, before my queen side. And the computer always uh, has no fear in these types of positions. But I agree, David. I think we will see bishop e8, bishop e2, rook d8. The queen will drop back. Max will try to find the proper spot for his dark squared bishop. It actually could be d6. Um, maybe loading up the battery against uh, the h2 pawn. So this game is going to, we're going to get a little bit more clarity here um, once the players decide how they want to arrange their pieces. But definitely this is going to be another very interesting battle, um, which we've come to expect from all of Parham's games. And this one, he really wants to try to win, uh, to right the ship in this tournament that's given him so many struggles thus far. Yeah, it's like an IMAX cinema out there with the atmosphere, Ooh. and we'll leave uh, Max Farmer down with, uh, yeah, with this position. Still up one down, but with compensation. Um, I think two of, okay, I was going to say two of the quieter positions, at least one of the quieter positions uh, is Gukesh against Vidit, the uh, Indian derby, uh, the all Indian battle there. Uh, that's come from a Petrov defense. I think maybe we just leave that one for now. Yeah, um, I mean, this just <laughs> seems like a relatively equal, typical Petrov structure, opposite colored bishops. That's uh, bottom left of your screen. It's okay, maybe white has a tiny pull there, but I agree. I think it's a simple enough position. We can let it uh, stew for a couple more moves. Yeah, and uh, there have been pawn sacrifices in a few games. Uh, Mag Zudlu against Varmadam, as we just saw. Um, there's been a pawn sacrifice from Giri against Ding, but I think he'll win that pawn back. Uh, and now just a pawn sacrifice by Donchenko against Ferruja. Um, I believe that's still a theoretical position, um, but interesting that the players have been spending so much time. Um, so up to you, Daniel. Do we briefly touch in uh, on to see how Donchenko is doing uh, and what he's doing? Uh, or do we jump straight to that marquee match, uh, Ding, against Giri? Let's jump in here yeah, let's just very briefly. Quick, quick overview of Donchenko, just because, you know, it's Ali Reza and um, he is... Uh, potentially a tournament tournament leader. So it's it's also very puzzling to me that uh, the clock times, particularly for Alexander, because I actually have played this position quite a few times with Black, um, the few occasions where I didn't play the King's Indian. And this actually did not come from a Ragozin move order. Um, this came from a Queen's Gambit decline move order. So typically, and I'm going to show how this position is normally reached, but this actually came from a Carlsbad, c takes d5, e takes d5, bishop g5, and here, rather than the kind of conventional c6 or bishop e7, we see a very sharp line from Ali Reza, bishop e4, I mean, also very well known. And after knight f3, we transpose directly into uh, a Carlsbad. Now, how is this position normally reached? Well, normally, the way that you get it is, okay, d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight f3, d5. This is the sort of traditional Ragazin move order, bishop b4. Now, one of White's main lines is CDED, bishop g5. I've had this position a million times with black, h6, bishop h4, g5, um, bishop g3, now knight e4. And is this the same position? No, we have the inclusion of... I'm trying to figure out exactly... We have e3 and knight d7 added. e3 and knight d7 added. Very interesting. So yeah, this is actually a very well-known position. But if we go back to the game... After bishop g5, bishop b4, yeah, knight f3, knight bd7, e3, h6, and we get something very similar. But I still think that this is a pretty well-known position that could arise out of a Rogozin. If I remember correctly, David, knight takes g3, h takes g3, and c6 is kind of a standard treatment. Sometimes this black bishop gets back around to g7. But Ali Reza, of course, could also accept the pawn sacrifice. In my outdated knowledge, this is 
very, very risky, extremely risky because black A lags in development and B suffers from a lot of weaknesses in the center and on the king side. You do not want to give white a bunch of tempi to bring out his pieces and challenge some of these weaknesses. I think we're going to see knight takes g3 from Ali Reza. Yeah, ultimately that is the more popular move, the safer move. Um, I think maybe Ali Reza is being influenced here by external factors, such as the fact that uh, Donchenko spent so much time on the clock, 20 minutes pretty much to get here, even though it's still well known. Maybe he's thinking, okay, my opponent isn't fully familiar with the uh, kind of nuances. Uh, maybe I can gamble, be greedy, take a pawn and try to suffer for it. But uh, yeah, essentially you win a pawn on the queen side in that variation, Daniel, but you open lines. And if you think about the Black King, it's not really going king side anymore because uh, you've played the move g5. It doesn't uh, necessarily want to go queen side, but if you take a pawn uh, on c3 now, open up more lines, then it's definitely never going that flank. Um, so a key moment, but we are expecting uh, Farouja to spend a bit of time and then decide to be super ambitious, but uh, take a risk or to just uh, choose the more positional approach and uh, guarantee a longer game. And uh, it feels like this is the perfect moment. Uh, some really exciting uh, openings, uh, but it's time now to take our first break of the day. And when we come back, we'll be exploring Ding Loren, the world champions game against local hero Anish Giri. So uh, let's look forward to that and see you in a few minutes. Yeah, work hard. Practice hard. Keep working and work hard. And to work hard and yeah, try harder. Play a lot of tournaments. Be patient. Watch my game. Try to find something in chess you really enjoy. And then you need to do it uh, every day. And it's not easy. If they really love chess, they have to work as much as they can every day. Play against your friends, your family. Play on the internet, anywhere, and enjoy. Play very strong opponents and to always have confidence in your abilities, no matter uh, how the results might look at some point. Take it easy not to put so much pressure and just enjoy. I'll never give up. Never give up and... So enjoy the game while you play. That's also very important. Enjoy the game. It's a beautiful game, so that's the main thing. I'm here with Magnus Carlsen, world number one, and to many, greatest chess player of all time. We're gonna ask him a few questions. I'm gonna name a sport. You have to tell me the greatest of all time. Mm -hmm. Sounds good? Yeah. Basketball. LeBron James. Soccer. Messi. I agree with both. Baseball. Barry Bonds. <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> okay. <laughs> football like American football. Tom Brady, I guess. Okay, yeah, good one. Uh, tennis. Djokovic. Golf. Tiger. Fair. Poker. Doug Brunson. That's a unique one. Chess. Gary Kasparov. Are you allowed to say yourself? I don't know if I'm allowed, but I think Gary is the best of all time still. Chess boxing. <laughs> I'm on Hamilton. I agree. We're gonna play this or that. Would you rather go on a cruise or a road trip? Road trip. Comedy or thriller? Comedy. Coffee or tea? Tea, but only slightly. Preferably neither. How do you get energized? The sun. Cats or dogs? Cats, but I like dogs too. It's like a, this or that is a little bit tough with you. You like everything. Shower or bath? Oh, shower for sure. Okay. I don't have the patience to take bath. Are you a morning person or a night owl? Night owl, for sure. Would you rather get on a phone call or text message? Text, probably. I feel like the answer for you is neither. I feel like it's just... Usually, yes. <laughs> just, just go. Sunrise or sunset? Sunrise. Winter or summer? Summer. How many beers would it take for you to drink for me to beat you in a classical chess game? That's a very difficult question, because uh, I'd probably sober up during the game, so I'd probably have to keep drinking. Probably start with 20 and take it from there. 20, okay. How, what's the size of the cup? Um, pints. Wow, okay, 20. Name your price if you have to chess box. Um, $10 million. Do you prefer to play chess on a computer, over the board, or on your phone? I rarely play on my phone. I, I would say I prefer to play on the computer. 
In your entire career, have you ever had a day where you went, I think this guy might be as good as me in chess? <laughs> no. Uh, well, I mean, not, 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 you know, since, not the last 10 years, for sure. Okay. Has it ever been, this guy might be kind of close to me if I have a bad day? Yeah, uh, I would say Fabia at his best was um, very close in, in classical, for sure. My other question was going to be, who do you think is the second best chess player in the world? So, I suppose... Yeah, I think Fabiano Corona is the, is the second, second best player. Yeah. Thank you, Magnus, for sitting down with us and doing these rapid-fire questions. Now get out of here. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Athos Circus Theatre where we are currently in the midst of round nine. It's spooky season out there in The Hague and the players are thrilling us with some spectacular openings. And uh, we're back with the chess now in this beautiful playing hall. Dania, what are your thoughts so far? To me, this is uh, shaping up to be a brilliant round. Oh, absolutely. It's a confluence of factors of course the new venue you want to impress the spectators but also the fact that the players are relatively well rested yesterday was a rest day a chance to catch up on sleep and a chance to redouble their efforts in the opening and i think we see that directly reflected uh today david so many exciting openings no offense to the previous round but uh today's openings are really on a different level yeah, I think the players would admit that themselves. It's always tough uh, before a rest day to find the energy, to find the motivation to study openings. Clearly, they all spent the last 24 hours deep in uh, study mode, and we are being blessed today. We're seeing the fruits of that labor. So let's jump back into the chess. I did promise before the break that we would uh, update everyone on what was a pawn sacrifice by Anish Giri against Ding Loren, but uh, he's won his pawn back. And uh, wild things happening there potentially, uh, but this is the bird's eye view, and yeah, there's uh, action everywhere right oh now. Oh gosh. <laughs> yeah, feast for the eyes. Yeah, I mean, look at Parham, knight g5, unexpected. Prague has a pawn on b3 for whatever reason, and he didn't play that move on move one. He <laughs> played it just arbitrarily in that crazy fried liver. So lots to look at, and you know, if you're watching this, just be patient. We will cover everything, but uh, this is classical chess. We have to go one game at a time. And I think it's fair to start with Ding uh, versus Giri, as, as we planned, David, because just so many developments uh, in that game. Since we last saw it, it's like the reality has shifted <laughs> completely. Okay, so shall we rewind? Uh, we're on move that. 16 currently. Last we saw, yeah, move 6, bishop f5. And here I briefly mentioned in passing that g4 is uh, very fashionable. This is nothing unusual. This is quite common. Yeah, g4 was played. Bishop e6, h3, just sort of a little kingside expansion. 
But things that get a little bit crazier here, bishop d3, h5, immediately contesting uh, this weak pawn on g4. This is a brief, a temporary pawn sacrifice. Uh, very thematic give back of the pawn. Ding says, I can give it back, but you're going to have to ruin your kingside pawn structure. And you says, nope, g6. I will take this pawn at a later date, hopefully before it becomes a queen. Queen c2, knight h5, nice move, hitting the bishop, forcing it back. And now Anish picks up the pawn. Of course, castle's queenside. That's the only available spot for the king. Knight df6, preparing to trade the dark squared bishops with bishop d6. Uh, Ding improves his king position. King b1 makes sense. There's that bishop d6 move. And this is the current position. Uh, Ding is deciding whether to trade, whether to try to trade on his own terms with a move like bishop b5, or to ignore the trade entirely and you know continue with his with his development. What do you make of this? Yeah, I mean, you've broken down the position fantastically there, Dania. I want to mention as well the extra ingredient of the clock. Um, this is now move 15, but Anish has not spent any time at all. Um, he's pretty much blitzed it up to this point, uh, which is psychologically scary for Ding, especially having a tough tournament. The last thing you want with White is to know your opponent's still in preparation. And it's not one of those positions uh, either where you can just freestyle and just make a bunch of random moves by hand on, on uh, autopilot and be okay here with white suddenly uh, the h3 pawn is going to be severely weak long term it might just drop off in any end game uh, so black has the better pawn structure uh, black's knights they might look at uh, they might make an odd impression on the uh, edge of the board there especially on h5 but they're on outposts uh, especially that h5 knight hard to boot out and white's king being on the queen side means that you can't really attack on that flank if black's king goes long and castles queen side as well and look at ding on the camera he just feels like he's suffering I mean, he mentioned this during his World Championship uh, campaign. You know, the psychological demons there, like uh, feeling the pressure. Everyone's watching him. That's the burden uh, of the crown. And it feels like he's not enjoying his position today at all. Um, yeah, I think I would pick black here, if anyone, Daniel. Yes, and when you're having a rough event, it's very easy to fall into what I would call here-we-go-again mode, where, okay, you lost the previous game, and I had this in one of my worst tournaments ever of the 2016 U.S. Championship, where I was just losing game after game, and it was exactly like this, right? A round robin, you lose to Faruja. What's your reward? Oh, you get to play Anish Giri. And then the opening doesn't go your way, and you start the negative self-talk. Like, oh, of course, I didn't get lucky again. I'm worse again. And that can really interfere with uh, your ability to find moves at a high level. Uh, and this plagues players at, at all levels. So this is a big decision, I agree, for, for Ding. I don't think White is worse here. But I think White needs to make um, a very well-reasoned decision about whether to trade the bishops. And I honestly don't know. I think the simplest approach, David, is probably to trade on d6 and just play knight f3 and try to establish an outpost on e5. One additional factor is that black actually does not have to castle queenside. Black also can do this thing where you go like king f8, king g7, and kind of do the half castle. That actually looks like a more appealing side of the board to me because with the semi-open c file, when you castle queenside in these types of positions, you often run into tactics like knight c3 to b5 or knight a4 to c5. So black's king can actually even stay in the center. That's not such a big problem. But bishop b5 here also tempts me a little bit. Even f2, f4 is probably not such a dumb idea trying to establish a stronghold on e5. Okay, pretty dumb um, because I suggested it, but maybe not too dumb. Maybe it's on the radar for Ding. Uh, I like it. F4, try to blow things open with F5, or just uh, cement this E5 square. Um, ultimately, I think you're right. White hasn't done anything drastically wrong, so you shouldn't be objectively worse, but it's just the psychological factors. It's the fact he was looking away so much there, and he's more than half an hour down on the clock. Um, I actually quite like your classical approach there, just trade off the bishops, keep it simple, plant the white knight in the center, and it can't go that badly wrong. Even if you lose H3 kind of in the middle game, you'll get active play to compensate um so yeah i mean it feels like it's in the balance but of the two players it feels like anish um who's clearly popped down the road to see his kids uh, <laughs> while the ding is thinking yeah it feels like anish he's the happier of the two campers right now um i mean how couldn't you be happy if you've just landed 15 moves of opening prep uh, against the world champion yeah there's really no reason to complain if you're anish and i think we have full um we really can expect something like bishop takes d6 and knight f3. Very important not to over, um, not to exaggerate the extent of your problems if you're ding. 
uh, the more I look at it, the less I like a move like f4 because it creates more of these light square weaknesses in the center. Um, so I don't know exactly if we can make a prediction in such an open-ended position, but I'm going to put some moves on the board, maybe something like takes, takes. Okay, knight f3. What would Anish do in this situation? Would he play king f8, king g7? What, what catches your eye in this position? Yeah. Knight g7? I don't know. Yeah, personally, I quite like knight g7 just to keep options open. It feels like the black king doesn't need to commit yet. I mean, I, I agree. Castling queenside looks a bit uh, fraught with danger right now, but uh, if the white queen ever moves, then I might consider castling that flank. Uh, so knight g7, maybe. I really yeah, want to trade off. Probably something. will establish a knight on e5. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, actually, I think it's slightly unpleasant for black because it's kind of not clear where to put your king, and white has very easy ways of improving in the center. So I, I really hope that Anish studied you know, these types of middle game structures, because otherwise it can get a little bit scary if you're black. Mm -hmm. And we should point out black isn't quite in time to go uh, trigger happy pawn grabbing right now. And, yeah. Uh, taking on h3. Don't try this. That's for mm -hmm. sure. There's bishop takes g6, but even the simple rook h1 reasons. should do it. Yeah, bishop f5. And it's amazing. The knights, it looks like you can block, but you actually can't. You just <laughs> lose the rook on a8. It's really as simple uh, as, as that. Of course, okay, maybe queen e6, but no, this is not uh, the way to play against a world champion. So, yeah, it's, it's hard to make a conclusion like who has this favored. If the time situation was even, I would say um, probably this favors white, given the time situation as Ding plays the immediate knight f3, so very similar, but he is trying to prevent black's queen from coming out. I think Anish must be happy with his 30-minute 30 30 time advantage. Yeah. So uh, position-wise, still everything to play for, but... Uh, black up on the clock, and uh, Anish, if he continues to keep up the speed, will certainly make uh, Ding pause uh, <laughs> even longer. Ding, yeah, Ding. I think psychologically needed a while to come to terms with this kind of new, um, this new landscape. But Knight F3, good move, and coming in. Um, okay, this one, yeah, still no clear tactics uh, well, apart from the one we showed with uh, Black blundering yeah. <laughs> by grabbing a pawn. But uh, yeah, this one's still simmering. Let's. Go to some games where there's real action. Um, I mean, that Pragnananda game you referenced with the pawn on b3. Black is building a center. We went from world champion to world champion last time. Let's go back to Juwen Jun this time. And uh, I really love what she's doing. Not afraid to fight with the black pieces, to sacrifice, and to go at the opponent. Uh, Prag's been provocative, but I'm not sure it's paying off yet. Yeah, this is a great game in the making. Um, this is one of those games where you know, every single move can present another twist and turn. I think we saw something similar in spirit in the game of Dusatora versus Maxudlu uh, earlier in the tournament that featured a very innovative opening approach by both players and resulted in a game where the evaluation flipped almost on every move. Um, and this is what you have in these irrational positions where there's nothing to hold on to. You're just kind of lost at sea and you have no idea which pawn to push or which piece to develop, whether to, whether to castle. But, okay, how did we get here? We saw uh, the move h4 by Prague a couple moves earlier. Juwen Jun responded with kind of a safer option. Queen out to c7, just trying to secure, I think, all of her possessions on the king side and in the center. Very reasonable move. This was followed <laughs> by b3 by Prague. Okay, he's trying to develop his bishop. I mean, you can't really criticize him for that. h6, knight e4, very provocative, allowing f5. Um, okay, I would ignore the computer assessments here because the evaluation is not shifting too much. Knight e c3 and knight back to f6. Is this even a chess position or is this out of some Fisher random game? Yeah, it looks like someone's just uh, gone to the hay, <laughs> put all the pieces in the back. <laughs> yeah. <them>. Maybe Geary's <laughs> son <laughs> was led into the tournament hall. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> Shout out to Daniel and the others. Uh, yeah, but I mean, knight f6, all of the players, uh, I mean, both players here, just making really unorthodox decisions you mentioned it's super irrational this position i think that's the the perfect word for it and i mean black's knight for example could have jumped to more active squares it retreats instead um white's cluster of uh, clogged up queenside pieces here they don't make a great impression but then again the white king might be safe on that flank if you get two three tempi to somehow scoot over to the queenside uh, in the meantime i guess the pressing issue is what to do with the white king um, e4 might be coming with force. Black has bishop c5. Black's going to get castled. It's uh, definitely 
onus on white, burden on white here to uh, be energetic enough, but accurate enough to survive the next few moves. Honestly, it's one of those situations where you can easily take 15, 20 minutes per move, just yeah. trying to decide how to contain Lex initiative. It reminds me of a story um, in one of the Anand Carlson uh, World Championship games. Uh, they had a crazy position where white actually had two, or I think black had two queens. Um, and Vichy ended up losing that game. So he wasn't in a very good mood in the press conference. But I love Vichy. And it was exactly a position like this, totally irrational. And one of the journalists in the press room asks Vichy, so Vichy, when you had this crazy position, you spent like 30 minutes, were you really calculating all the variations? Were you really trying to get to the bottom of the position? And Vichy's like, no, I was thinking what to eat tonight. <laughs> so, so I think it's safe to say the players are fully immersed in what's going on as we see. I think the most logical move by Prosby should be two. Will we see an early E4 by Ju and Jun, or will she prioritize her her own development? And if so, where is she going to put her bishops? A lot of questions, very few answers. Yeah, a uh, lot of questions right now. Uh, bishop B2. Yeah, I mean the fact that the most natural move in the position is given a question mark shows how difficult yes. it is. I mean, what could be healthier? Bishop B2. White next plays like Knight A3, Queen E2 castles long maybe and hmm. white's actually set up this beautiful haven for the white king surrounded by all of its pieces um actually something happened uh, something similar happened in that game i earlier mentioned uh, between Ferruja and caruana uh, a few months back in 2023 um white's king got to the queen side looked safe until it wasn't <laughs> but uh yeah should be two question mark wow i'm expecting uh Xu and june to find an active square i don't know which one that is c5 d6 for a bishop just get castled and come up with a plan of action because it looks like uh, you pretty much have to insert kind of castling into your plan somewhere. Might as well get it done soon. But uh, yeah, Daniel, this is just nice to see the players throwing off the shackles and uh, going for it. Um, Absolutely. I'm going to predict that this. I'm going to predict this won't be a draw. I don't know who's going to win, but <laughs> it won't be a draw. I think this is a pretty pretty safe prediction. I just want to add one thing, which is that the more I look at this position, I have a suspicion that e4 while extremely tempting, might be a little bit inaccurate. Why? Because after bishop to e2, you might have bitten off more than you can chew uh, in the center. And white has this very unpleasant prospect of d3, which will open up the center and give the knight some more development prospects. Like if you go e4 and then bishop d6, I'm not totally totally sure. I mean, obviously there's maybe a check on h5, but I feel like, okay, no, I guess d3 is wrong. But can you really blame me for wanting to... Okay, even the computer doesn't know if this is wrong or right. Um, but I have a suspicion that e4, yeah, I mean, the engine actually gives bishop h5 check first, force the king to an awkward square, and now play d3 to open up the center. And so this is the reason why, um, in the current position, it might be a good idea to delay the move e4, save it for a rainy day, and as you indicated, David, prioritize your development. I'm expecting bishop d6 by Ju and Jun here. Yeah, we don't know if it's wrong or right. We don't know if we'd rather pick black yeah. or white, but <laughs> either way, it's... Yeah, just a crazy position. Just bishop d6 castles, I think. Uh, if she doesn't find anything better, like maybe she'll investigate e4 for a while, but if she finds nothing better, then she'll uh, kind of pre-move <laughs> uh, after bishop d6 just castles and then start to think. And she'll get chances no matter what later on. Black has the center. Black has plenty of open lines and uh, definitely one to check in on. Um, I'd like to also bring us to one of the other crazy Italians. Uh, mm -hmm. The game between Abdus Satorov against Van Forest. Uh, so let's zoom out of this one, at least temporarily. We'll be back very soon, for sure. And um, yeah, the other game, Bishop to E3, just been played, given a question mark by the computer, but White still has the advantage, so it's definitely not a bad move. Uh, maybe just uh, the fact that that was better. Um, just during the break there, I, I saw from our producer that White could have tried something a bit more flashy, uh, a bit different. There could have been a potential queen sacrifice line if White had played the move Bishop to H6. In this wow. position. In this position. And it's taken me a while to get to the queen sack. <laughs> but let's say black plays a very natural move. Bishop d7 tries to castle queenside. Yes, because bishop b6 runs into d5. Very unpleasant detail for black, so you have to work around it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And white captures on e5 to try and make use of the e-file. Mm -hmm. Say knight takes e5. Looks okay. like a blunder. But after f4, some craziness could occur. Oh bishop gosh. check. Bishop c5. King h1 and just knight g4, giving up the black queen. What could be more natural? <laughs> what could be more natural? Trying to get to f2. 
<laughs> yeah, rook takes e7, king takes. And I mean, who knows what's happening from here? Say queen e2 check, um, king d8, and black's still threatening knight f2 ideas. Not quite smothered mate, but uh, yeah, for example, h3 giving the white king some breathing space, and the white bishop on h6 would fall. And uh, we're left with. Oh, that's right. hanging too. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I think that's I the idea. That was <laughs> it took me a while too. <laughs> yeah, I know, like, I have two squares. Like, you know, it's like I see donuts. I, I don't see anything else. But yeah, knight takes h6. Okay, that explains why the evaluation is not like plus seven. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it feels like white is out of the woods here, and maybe after something like knight d2, mm -hmm. um, white stabilized. Okay, black clearly does not have enough for the queen. Maybe materially, black has almost enough, but the black king is going to encounter massive difficulties, especially because the rook on a8 is, is locked out, and you cannot afford that because, well, you're kind of down a queen. It's a small yeah. issue in this position. Yeah. If you could teleport that rook from a8 to e8 now in one move, maybe you can fight. <laughs> yeah, reverse castle. <laughs> <laughs> Reverse castle. King <laughs> it's Fisher random. E8. <laughs> Fisher random, you could castle, but um, yeah, ultimately. <laughs> it's like a Fisher illegal. random where I, I just like, I'm not sure exactly how castling works, so I just take my king and just drop it on random squares in the hopes that it will just automatically castle me. And sometimes I am positively surprised. <laughs> um, yeah. But wow, what a line. Bishop h6, bishop d7. And by the way, d takes e5, just a quick question. What, what was wrong with f takes e5? Is it just like knight f3 and black is paralyzed? I think the idea is knight f3 and yeah, if black castles queenside, they're Hello. always going to get hit by bishop g5. Oh. Wow, according to the engine, this was almost like winning for white to put the bishop on h6. What an uh, idea. Not not easy, not obvious, we're going to say. Uh, bishop h6 is very logical in itself mm -hmm. <laughs> because, uh, I mean, now you're kind of doubly preventing black from castling kingside. Both bishops, both bishops. Uh, <laughs> just, I'm uh, stopping it. No, I'm stopping it. <laughs> uh, yeah, like the Spider-Man meme. Like, uh, but yeah, like I guess Bishop H6 in itself is natural, but the follow-up is uh, far from easy for any human to calculate. So interesting option, but Nodebeck plays Bishop E3 and still a good position, you've got to say, because Black still has this dilemma. How to get castled on the queen side. D5 ah. actually might just be a really disruptive, uh, disruptive move. And what's interesting, I really like, com I think comparing two moves often yields a better insight into why one move is better than the other. And I think the big question here is, well, what happens if black plays bishop d7, which is very likely uh, to feature on the board? And here, if white plays d takes e5, I still think knight takes e5 can be very effectively met by f4. But after f takes e5, knight f3, I think maybe the difference with the bishop placement is that with the bishop on h6, Black is essentially paralyzed. Here, Black actually can play this very small move, h6, covering the g5 square and preparing to castle queenside. And if Black castles queenside, is Black doing amazing? Absolutely not. I mean, White has control of the e4 square. Probably White can get away with a... And not just get away, but maybe White should play a move like knight b to d2 and get the knight around to e4 and White is better. But Black is surviving. You know, you're living. Bishop f5, the game goes on. With the bishop on h6, in this exact position, Black essentially can't breathe and black can never um solve this problem of the bishop coming back to g5 so maybe this is the reason why bishop h6 was a little bit more accurate how could noterbeck miss this very simple detail like six moves into the line honestly yeah. he should be kicked out of the hague back to vikon <laughs> he goes he should join the master section the challenger section <laughs> Unforgivable. <laughs> but uh, no, really interesting, as you mentioned. I mean, this is what the top players do at home. They sit there when analyzing uh, openings, especially. They sit there with computers, kind of trial and error with certain moves. They try their first instinct, the most natural move. The computer says, no, not quite. And then uh, they figure out there is a key difference further down the line. And it's often something a bit subtle, a bit hidden, uh, just like you pointed out there, Daniel. And uh, just the placement of White's Bishop um, actually potentially changes everything. Um, of course, White's still doing well here. This is a human game after all, but... Um, not the 100% most accurate move, which uh, this time will let him off the hook just this once. But bishop e3, and is the idea after bishop d7, um, I was going to say to just continue waiting, for example, knight to d2. Um, I mean, that mm -hmm. line you mentioned is really attractive anyway, but I wanted to show a position where the black knight gets oh. kicked. Oh, I don't know, actually. Knight d2, castle queen side, d5. And the black knight just lacks squares. Um and they have a beautiful outpost on b8. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Lovely. not sure what next, but at least I kicked you back. 
step one. Yeah, knight e4, c4, I mean, also looks very appealing. I would also point out that after bishop e3, I mean, the move e4 briefly appealed to me until I realized that maybe here, okay, d5 may be premature, yeah, because g5 is not a threat here uh, because of queen h5 check and knight g6. This is very important, which is why I'm not sure exactly how white should proceed here. Is it just simple knight d2? Is it c4? Yeah, it's c4. C4 is very, very powerful because it just threatens to steamroll black uh, in the center, and it opens up a beautiful developing square uh, for white's knight on c3. And the move f5 is all pawns and no hope. You can, I mean, maybe d5 is a more concrete treatment, but even the simple g3 stabilizing the knight, and c5 is coming with a bang on, on the next move. Yeah, this is very unpleasant for black nonetheless, David. Uh, Jordan's vaunted opening preparation aside, he's down on the clock. He's in trouble on the board, and Noderbeck's just the wrong guy to, you know, to, to go experimenting against in the opening. Yeah, you don't want to dance with Noderbeck in a uh, crazy position like this, and we don't even need the board, Daniel. We can tell on the body language, Jordan is not happy with this position. He's down nearly half an hour on the clock, and um, yeah, sometimes you need to switch gears. It hasn't quite happened for him this tournament, but yeah, unfortunately, with Black <laughs> against one of the most ambitious players out there, it feels like not the right time to take these types of risks. And we mentioned it in the Italian game. He's tried this rare idea, this modern idea, keeping the Black King in the center, but things are opening, things are speeding yeah. up. The pace of the game is uh, accelerating. And yeah, unfortunately, it feels like Black's just not in time to, um, to keep everything covered to get the King to safety. Um, big, big trouble ahead for Van Forest right now. Yeah, his opening preparation was blacking today. And uh, <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> that's, I think that's enough with this game. Yeah. We can push forward. We have other action on almost all the boards. What a round. I mean, this is just, you can sense the, the energy uh, today. The previous round, also very interesting, of course, high level. But today, we really have just explosiveness on virtually all the boards. So, shall we go back to our bird's eye view? Yeah, um, let's do that. And uh, talking of explosiveness, my eye is drawn towards a bishop landing on c4. Uh, wow. Max Barmadal against Max Zulu. Very ambitious play and uh, provocative play by both sides, I've got to say. But Max Zulu is sitting there in the dark. That white king is feeling a bit in the dark as well. Um, I actually <laughs> think he's being too ambitious uh, with the white pieces. He's got to pull the break before it's too late. Yes, this has plagued Parham throughout the tournament. Sometimes he's uh, gone kind of all in. And, ooh, he's just made a move that is heavily censored by the computer. So let's jump in. How did we get here? We were expecting White's King to be castled by now. But, no, it's not completely uncastled. It is still in its initial position. And the reason for this, David, is that in this position, instead of Bishop E2, we saw this crazed move, Knight G5 which was met by an equivalent strike on the other side, knight b4, of course. Knight takes d3, comes with a check. So white cannot snap this bishop off. That would have uh, ended the game, essentially, if it was possible. And bishop c4, trying to carve out the d3 square. If a knight lands on d3, there will be major problems for white. And knight g to e4 by Parham. Is this a case of Parham panic? Yeah, knight on d3 will end painfully. And uh, I mean, you can set it up. First move that came to my mind, because black is ahead in development, you need to keep accelerating the play, keep playing temp uh, kind of tempo by tempo, castle queenside. Uh, it kind of helps that we've seen a couple of uh, weird castling queenside incidents already this tournament, but there's a monster threat, right, Daniel? Knight d3 check is a winning threat right now. Oh, traps the queen. That is That is filthy. I'm just going to show very quickly. Okay, F3, check. I mean, look at this. Bishop takes D3 and the queen, the queen is trapped on B1 on move 15. Oh my gosh, Castle's queenside is brilliant. And can white stop a knight from landing to D3? I think all that you can do is basically brace for impact because if you play knight takes F6, does black maybe not immediately, maybe G takes F6 first. Okay, white has a check on F5 that does exactly nothing. What does white do here? Yeah, I just want to mention actually, knight d3 check nearly wins if it wasn't for a counter strike, I guess. Bishop takes d3, and one of the white knights jumps back in the way Oof. and counter attack. Oh. Otherwise, you would just be winning. Oof. If the pawn was on a7, maybe, and Max is castled queenside without any delay, 
He's castled queenside. Parham is in huge trouble here. Yeah. I mean, this could be a miniature. It's only moved 13, but White's already on the brink. Look at the White's development. He's broken all the opening rules, and rightly so in chess, you get punished if you uh, break them too often. Uh, Did he well, miss this move? Did he forget? I mean, sometimes this is not uncommon. You kind of just forget about castling. It's a yeah. legal move in chess sometimes. Took him, a, took him a while to write it down. <laughs> I think the shock on his face was uh, visible there, Parham. And uh, knight d3 winning threat. I think he has to play that move you mentioned, Daniel. Knight takes f6. Uh, but black just recaptures. And um, oof, big, big moment in this game. Max Marmadam, in terms of opening preparation, he's been arguably one of the most impressive in the whole tournament. Yes, and he's very well known at this point as an opening Specialist, I forget, he was Jordan Van Forest second, I think, mm -hmm. um, which is no mean feat. Jordan himself is known for his prep, and Max is one of the big reasons why. Um, I still remember, I mean, even as an international master, Max is already considered very dangerous in the opening. He made 2,600. I think he's very deserving entrant into uh, the master section and, and showing exactly why. He had um, chances against Prague. Uh, he had Prague in a very difficult position uh, in the previous round. And now, arguably, almost winning out of the opening against Max Sudlu. I'm struggling to even find any way uh, to try to survive. I have one idea I wanted to run by you. Mm -hmm. um, if we could maybe bring back the analysis board um, just to soak all of this in. After knight takes f6, uh, g takes f6, can I try the move bishop to e2? Just trying to mm -hmm. castle at all costs, essentially. Okay, and uh, I've got um, lots of tempting moves here. Bishop takes e2, bishop d3 is tempting, knight d3 is tempting. Let's take it. Let's go the most forcing way. Let's. Uh... Ah, maybe I can throw in queen f5 check here. Uh huh. Before I bury your queen. Not that this is good. I mean, queen c4 check, I have to go king f3. But this is somehow the king actually feels safer here than on e1, weirdly. Mm hmm. Yeah, hiding in plain sight. Um, <laughs> exactly. I mean, <laughs> come get me. This is, this is definitely not part of his plan, <laughs> Parham. If he plays this, yeah. it's uh, out of necessity rather than uh, inspiration. But um, Bishop e2, let's try to find a killer here. Bishop d3 looks very tempting as well. Oh my gosh, this looks so nice because after takes, takes, I mean, king e2, queen c4 looks like disaster. Here I have to go king f1, queen c4, king g1. Mm. Okay, but come on, this is just. Even just rook g8 and g8, <laughs> kind of gang yeah. up against g2. Knight e1 is a threat now, yeah, oh, among nice. other things. Oh, knight e1, knight f3 mate. How about that? Yeah. Look well, at this tactic. <laughs> oh, no, no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You can't go into because the rook actually defends h1. Oh, wait. <laughs> Maybe still yeah, winning. How do you win here? <laughs> King b8 to set up knight e1. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, there's going to be something. It's going to be kaput soon. Um, total collapse for white. I like your king b8, just <laughs> sadistic, but queen g4 as well, going for checkmate. Oh my gosh, this is, I mean, this is fun, but it's mm -hmm. not fun for Parham, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, this looks like a simultaneous game almost uh, at some point where one side. Morphe loses. NN. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Greco against. <laughs> yeah, Greco and 1600. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, Greg, yeah, correct. <laughs> <laughs> knight takes f6. I mean, there's even bishop takes f1 there. We should mention white will not be able to castle the rest of the game. And even that is ugly. He needs a miracle to survive. I'm going to say it now with white. And it's only move 13. Yeah, he needs to play perfectly. I mean, the eval is not plus five. There is clearly some way that white can minimize the losses. Um, I can reveal what it is just really briefly before we move on. Um, I think it's good for people to know exactly what the correct path is, and it's almost impossible. The computer line, and just to emphasize why it is still lost, is to play... Well, there's actually several moves. Okay, bishop d2, but I think the most, the lesser evil is to, to take and play queen e4, which is, I mean, come on, allowing a fork on c2, sacrificing a full rook, and the idea is actually crazy. Knight c2 is actually inaccurate, because after king e2, knight takes a1, bishop d2, wins back the knight. Knight back to c2, I have rook c1. And if white is able to win the knight in this version, 
white is actually okay because you have a pawn for the exchange and black has a really bad pawn structure. Unfortunately for Parham, black always has this pawn push f5 and it's not clear where to put this knight. So even here, white is like borderline lost, but this just tells us, uh, just shows us the extent of the desperation. If even the engine cannot find anything better than this. Yeah, I mean, queen to e4 in that variation, allowing a knight fork. Uh, I mean, that's like, I mean, that's the epitome of uh, an engine move, uh, essentially. Yeah. Like, the first thing you're taught as a human, as a child, don't walk into knight forks, and then to willingly encourage one uh, as the only way to survive. That's counterintuitive, to say the least. And yeah, I mean, it feels like Parham, he'll need to try something with a king walk or being a bit brave here with his king and hoping Max doesn't find any killer blows. But um, ultimately, it just looks like a tough tournament by Parham. It's uh, yeah, spiraling. Uh, he was impatient. He sees this white against one of the lower rated opponents. This is the time he finally gets that first win of the tournament. But no one's weak in this event. And yeah, it looks like it's going to backfire. And uh, that happens for anyone. We've all been there. Uh, I've been there too many times when you're in bad form and you try and force the issue. You try and force mm -hmm. yourself uh, a bit too hard. And uh, unfortunately, when you're out of shape, out of sorts, it doesn't pay off. So um, big, big developments here. I'm, I'm going to say, yeah, not a blunder, but uh, a, a kind of a series of small mistakes from Parham, and he's about to get punished. Yeah, this is insane. But I, as you said, we can sympathize. And anybody who can't sympathize just hasn't played uh, enough over the board chess, um, especially in a tournament like this. It's You feel for Parham, it's super painful, but you have to push all of that aside and focus on surviving one move at a time, which he undoubtedly will. And we will focus on continuing our coverage of all these super exciting games because the other games do not stop uh, for mm -hmm. the blunders on this board. Shall we go back to our bird's eye view? Yeah, and uh, we've just jumped out of one ugly position for white. Uh, it might be time to jump into an ugly pawn structure, but a healthier position for white. Uh, let's check out maybe that Wei Yi game against Nepomnishi, or at least update briefly what's happening there. Absolutely. It's a very kind of strange, I would say, position. Hard to get a handle on. It's a little bit less crazy than, you know, Prague's position and Parham's position, but still kind of odd. Um, we saw this d4 pawn push by Wei Yi. Uh, he followed it up with a quick c4, breaking apart uh, Black's pawn chain in the center. And the last move was c4 captures on d5. Okay, so first question, of course, is can Black recapture on d5? Um, feels like the answer is no. It's like one of those leading questions that the teacher asks, like, oh, can you do this? Maybe it's because of g4. Yeah, I was about to say, just throwing Black's coordination off. g4 is like the ugliest move ever, <laughs> uh, talking yes. of pawn structures, but it might just win a piece, and <laughs> ultimately a, pin, uh, a winning piece is uh, more important than aesthetics. Maybe we show this on the board, Daniel, because it's counterintuitive. g4, I mean, remove the defender. It's, you know... This tactic has existed since time immemorial, and okay, uh, we might be paying a memorial to the knight on d5, because queen g5, knight takes e4, very clean. Black has to give up an exchange. No bueno. And queen e6, only move, I think, but this is a disaster. I mean, rook takes e4. Or, I mean, probably knight takes e4 is more accurate, but it doesn't matter. I mean, even this is plenty, plenty good enough. Queen f3, everything is coming in. Uh, black is collapsing. So, well spotted, and if black cannot recapture on d5, what does that tell us? Maybe queen h3 is a possibility? Mm -hmm. I don't know. How does Nepo handle this position? Knight yeah, g4 it's... is also possible, but all of this seems very superficial, very dubious. Yeah, it's not an easy position. I quite like your queen h3, at least in blitz. I mean, we play it, and then we think, and then we probably checkmate our opponents by luck. More than <laughs> skill. <laughs> Caveman chess. But um, I guess when in doubt, these top players, they play h5 as well a lot these days. H5 would stop G4, <laughs> <laughs> threaten to take on D5, but um, I don't know. Queen H3, maybe we investigate uh, going root one, going direct for the opponent's king. Yes, Queen H3. Okay, so big question. Is Knight G4 a serious threat? Of course, it can be met with Knight F1. So my immediate question is, can I get away with a move like D6, just opening up the bishop? Mm-hmm. I like it. Uh, I'll try knight g4 because what else? Knight yeah. f1. <laughs> I must. And yeah, now. As, as much as I like getting checkmated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
it's hard to imagine black improving the pieces that much. I mean, the black rock on A8, I mean, I could swing it to D8, for example, but it feels so slow. Um, <laughs> I don't really see what I'm doing next with black. It looks nice and pretty, but like DF6 maybe first. Yeah, no, DF6 looks, looks right. Yeah, yeah rook C1, rook C6 also looks painfully slow, but I mean, maybe there's less going on than it seems. Like, this is some sort of a weird status quo mm -hmm. on the king side. Maybe I can start going after your pawns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what a way. No, I was, I was going to say, what a waste, but what a waste. What a waste <laughs> time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, white here. Yeah, He's not the one wasting things. He's won a pawn. He's up uh, on position. Um, I really like what way he's done. Actually, it's. I find this one of the most difficult things down here. Just a few moves ago, um, the fact that he even went C4 and then took on D5, it just looks so anti-positional. Um, mm -hmm. White's kind of two sets of double pawns now. Um, ultimately, they might just be weak, but it's also dynamically working move by move. The tactics work in his favor. And that's one thing I struggle with is to kind of break the uh, habit of a lifetime of kind of playing ugly positional moves, even if they work um, dynamically. And okay, we have a move, rook a to d8 by Nepomnishi. And still no threat of knight takes d5, I believe, but at least he's improving his pieces. So what does white do in the meantime? That's the well, I question. think the defaults, the default move is rook c1, trying to like eventually get the rook uh, into c6. I would just point out like a huge problem in black's position is this knight on d7. It's everything is well coordinated other than this dumb knight, which is restricted so nicely by the pawn on, on d4. And if Flack can find a good spot for this knight, you know, if Flack had two moves in a row, right? Knight takes d5 and knight f6, everything would be copacetic. But because of this g4 tactic, and you pointed this out, it's very hard to play chess like this when everything is dependent on concrete calculation. So very impressive so far by Wei Yi. But this is the nature of 2700 chess. Like you do all of this, you play brilliantly the first 20 moves, and you're only like a little bit better. And you need to play another 20 moves of brilliant chess uh, before you make a dent. So maybe rook c1, maybe something else, maybe something more concrete. I don't know, knight c4 has to be calculated, but that opens up the possibility of these unpleasant ideas like knight g4 and queen h3. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe the white knight can circle around to e3. I'm not totally sure. Yeah, lots of options. And as you mentioned, like you need a lot of energy, a lot of precision to play these positions with white. And uh, he's shown that up to this point. But one wrong move, one slip up, allowing black to take back the pawn and establish a bind. And suddenly we'll see things roll the other direction. Um, so yeah, Nepomnishi's not done that much wrong either. Uh, he's solid with black, despite being a kind of, I'm going to call it half a pawn down uh, because of white's double D pawns. But um yeah, this is one maybe to check back in on a bit later. Wei Yi, I think this is a critical moment, so he will be spending uh, a bunch of his time, already at move 20 as well, uh, in this middle game. Um, okay, wow, we're really spoiled for choice. Abdu Satorov against Van Forest. I just want to mention, hats off to you, Daniel. You predicted the whole line, and uh, if White's Bishop was on h6 in that one, it would pretty much be game over. But, uh, maybe. I mean, maybe while he's York is in the bathroom, Noderbeck can... <laughs> Just slide that that bishop a couple squares up. I mean, that doesn't really change anything, does it? <laughs> so what else do we have? Okay, Prague's game kind of moving along. Ju and Jun, bottom right of your screen. Ju and Jun has managed to castle. Yeah, they're kind of following the path that you laid out. The knight is on a3. The white bishop has slid up to a6. Um, not a blunder. There is a queen on e2 that is supporting it. Uh, there's also the Vidit, the Gukesh Vidit game. And it feels like that game has just been the most lifeless of the ones that we've had this round. Of course, we could check into it quickly just mm -hmm. to see if white has managed to manufacture any kind of advantage at all. Yeah, let's. I think let's do that. Uh, it feels like this is a, a good moment just before uh, things really get uh, heated again on other boards mm -hmm. uh, to go to Gokesh and bid it just to uh, maybe show the opening or uh, kind of just um, talk about what both players should be aiming for right now. It's Gokesh who's got a lot more time on the clock, bid it. I very rarely see him employ the Petrov. Uh, maybe I've missed some of his games, but um, <laughs> I've seen him from time to time, but uh, clearly a mark of respect to his young opponent that he's happy to try and equalize. And Dania, it looks roughly level, opposite color bishops, as you mentioned, but White maybe has a few more targets with his bishop. Yeah, in a blitz game, I feel like White, White's position would be very exciting, but it, something tells me that it has very accurately calculated all of the shenanigans uh, and properly understood that none of them actually lead anywhere. I mean, the most tempting move for 
99% of people is knight to g5. You know, it, it's go time, let's attack f7. But all of this is easy to disarm in, in a classical game, I think. So, for example, if white plays that, I mean, maybe knight g5 is the correct move, but it seems to me that black could always interpose with a knight on d5. Maybe you take on e1 first. I really don't want to yield the file. Yeah, knight d5 maybe is inaccurate, according to the computer. But I'm not totally sure. Yeah, how should black mean knight g5? Yeah, I, I do wonder just move by move sometimes whether you trade rooks and play bishop f4, for example. I'm always scared of these tactics on f7. And yeah, as you're pointing out there, don't play h6 ever. <laughs> Queen takes g6, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. But, <laughs> um, but bishop f4, or it feels wrong to give up the e-file first. This could this is either fine for black <laughs> or it's very bad for black. <laughs> um, yeah, rookie seven, knight d five. I was hoping for, but a bit hairy, a bit scary. Perfect yeah, this Halloween is not what you want to get out of a out of a Petrov, I guess. Um, so okay, but I feel like Vidit has found something against knight g five. Otherwise, he wouldn't have spent this much time um, on g six. But it's not so easy. I mean, takes takes. You really want to go h6. You want to chase away the knight. King, king g7. g7 then. Yeah, king g7. Just get out of the pin. Mm -hmm. Get out of the pin. Uh, ultimately, yeah, it looks really beautiful for white, but no threat. Uh, you defend f7. At least now knight takes f7 and end it in an awkward pin. And yeah, like you say, h6 or push back 4 on the cards. Eventually, you get time to trade rooks with rook e8 once the knight has uh, been forced back. And It's kind of slow, but step by step, it feels like you should get closer to equality. Um, Gukesh there, yeah, just again, looks like he's meditating now in the dark, just wondering how to uh, pose problems to his opponent. Um, what are your predictions here, Daniel? Uh, this one going to fizzle out eventually with good defense by Vidit? Yes, I think I just try, you trust Vidit to, to fly through the turbulence and make it, make it to the ground safely. It just feels like the nature of White's threats is very um, ephemeral. Like White can pose a couple of one-move threats, but if Black solves them, um, structurally, black is completely fine. So the problems are purely tactical. We're helped along by the eval bar. If it showed like plus three, I would be um, saying, singing a slightly different tune here. But I think as long as white has a response to knight g5, um, everything is fine for Bidded. It's a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah, you know, there's some unpleasant threats, but I think this one ends in a draw um, mm -hmm. and fizzles out in, in the next couple of moves. That's my prediction. Yeah, so one of the karma games so far today, but still with a lot of life left. And uh, Kukash perhaps on the slightly better side of an equal position. And uh, yeah, with so much happening across the board on all seven uh, games right now, I think this is the perfect time before things heat up yet again to go on a break. But we will be back and we will update you, of course, on all of the developments here in The Hague. So uh, we'll see you very, sh uh, very shortly. Get a tea. We'll see you in three. <laughs> Maybe the first one was that I played against my mom and I lost. I was losing and then she would turn the board around and I would be still losing and so it would go on. I'm playing in a chess club uh, with other kids. To play against a robot. Watching the Anand Kalsen World Championship match. And, and going to primary school and we had chess lessons there. And I also remember being like a rook up or something and then losing that game. I won the province championship, so that was cool. Actually, when I was uh, a small kid, I used to play with chess pieces, uh, which was like a very picturesque chess set, but uh, I had no idea there are some rules. I remember winning my first under eight tournament in 2006, close to where I live. Mate is in four moves from the position in front of you. Don't move until you figure it out in your head. Don't look at me for a hint. I can't do it without moving the pieces. Yes, you can. Clear the lines of men in your head, one at a time, and the king will be left standing alone, like a guy on a street corner. I'll make it easier for you. Oh. 
What was that about? I thought it would help. How does that help? You know, visualization and stuff. I'm not picking up the pieces. Sometimes you don't need to do anything crazy to get better. You just need to reassess your chess. I'm Grandmaster Maurice Ashley, and I'm presenting Jeremy Silman's How to Reassess Your Chess, now on Chessable. So go to chessable.com slash your chess and start reassessing your chess today. Can you beat Magnus Carlsen? Okay, yeah, probably not. But what if we give him a few distractions? Can you beat Magnus while he's cooking? What if he's playing football? How about Magnus skiing? Surely you can beat him sleeping. Now there's a Magnus for everyone. This month on Chess.com. Welcome back to round nine of the TARDIS Steel Chess Festival, where it's spooky out there in the Athos Circus Theatre, both on and off the board. And uh, we've been treated so far to some really exciting openings. We're now in the middle game phase, the clocks are ticking, and some players are panicking. And uh, welcome back after that break. I am David Howell, and I'm joined by Daniel Naroditsky. Daniel, what has struck you so far about today's round? Yeah, I mean, we expected a lot of action, a new environment, um, as well as 
time to rest for the players. And uh, that usually creates some very exciting games. That's exactly what we've gotten. I mean, we're not even two, round, two hours into the round, and we already have some uh, breaking news, some amazing action. Parham already with a lost position. Um, such exciting openings today. And the best part is that plenty of action to follow in the next couple of hours, David. Yeah, it feels like they woke up and some of the players chose violence. So uh, let's jump back to the chess. Um, that's where the action is. And uh, okay, the bird's eye view, where to begin? Uh, it feels like uh, action, yeah, the games are progressing quite quickly. Um, I was expecting, due to the nature of the positions, how chaotic some of them are, that we would see some of the players tank, some of the players get into time trouble early on. But um, actually around move 20 on several boards already. Shall we start with uh, Ding Loren against Giri? Just a couple of updates there, just uh, a brief touch in uh, before we move on to the more complicated, more uh, dynamic battles. Absolutely. I think um, nothing earth shattering on this board, but definitely a couple of interesting moves. And the game is taking on a, a very particular character going into uh, the later stages of the middle game. Okay, so uh, after knight f3, just a couple of moves ago, Anish swapped bishops on h2. Now he brought his knight back to g7, just as we kind of had anticipated. Uh, uh, Ding centralizing his knight on e5. For some reason, the computer did not like this move. Um, it begs the question, maybe black can take on h3 now, but I still think the answer is a very emphatic no. But Anish played the very natural bishop f5, going for the light square bishop trade. And this current position, Ding, is down to 53 minutes. And there is plenty to think about. I mean, of course, you have to calculate the strike with e4. Very, very tempting in a faster time control game. Um, you can take on f5. It's one of those positions where there's like a million candidate moves and you don't even kind of know where to start. You're just sort of swimming in the complications. Yeah, and uh, that isn't great when the clock is ticking, uh, when you have four or five different candidate moves. And of course, the opponent has four or five different replies on every turn. Um, I'm wondering about this question mark. Maybe it's not due to the fact it's a bad move, Daniel. We see the evaluation bar still roughly in the center, but missed opportunities. You mentioned rook takes h3 or something taking on h3 which felt super risky. Could Black have played knight g4 on the previous move? I'm just trying to find concrete ways to uh, justify the fact that the bar reacted. Wow. I just think to remove that is white's best piece. Exactly right. That's a brilliant spot using the undefended rook on h2 uh, to engineer the knight trade. And if I take knight takes g4, bishop takes g4, and Black is really happy here. I mean, again, not because Black is winning the pawn. Um, after rook g1, you're definitely not taking it, I think, but not to put any words in your mouth, of course, you're, you're welcome to... <laughs> I'm not brave enough to take it. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe just bishop... I don't know exactly, bishop f5. Yeah, I think this is working out just fine. And once the knight on e5 is gone, white is left with the long-term weakness on h3, and black is, is quite a bit better. This might have been a missed opportunity. Great spot. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I got here just mainly because uh, in all of these variations, I wanted to play knight d7 as black, but it felt a bit passive, a bit slow. Uh, mm -hmm. But knight g4, just uh, again, I would never find this, I think, over the board uh, if, if I didn't see the evaluation bar. But um, knight g4 is basically the same way of exchanging your opponent's best piece uh, with gain of tempo. So uh, yeah, that's tough to see. Uh, Anish plays a very logical move. Uh, long term, he wants his bishops off. That was black's worst minor piece by a mile. And uh, white's light square bishop quite important. But yeah, maybe there was better. So now it's up to Ding. He would love to get f3, e4 in. I don't know whether he tries that now. Um, just before black gets fully organized, before the black king somehow finds safety. Yeah, I was trying to get the hang of the immediate e4, but I've kind of soured on it. Um, because mm -hmm. after e4, I think the issue is that it looks very, very nice. It looks like you're playing according to principle. But even... If black centralizes the knight on d5, okay, this is a very messy position. I have no idea what the evaluation is. Of course, it's very scary for black, but the king can also just hide away uh, potentially on g8. But even black can just like trade on e4 and play king f8. So this doesn't quite, um, isn't quite as impressive as it looks. I, I like your suggestion of pushing f3 and preparing e4 because now e4 uh, comes with quite a bit more pizzazz. And even if black trades on d3, I don't know how you were planning to recapture. Probably, Probably the queen. queen. Queen takes. Yeah, and e4 is coming. And again, it 
kind of hurts black that you can't castle queenside. And if you play a move like king f8, yeah, e4, and I would take white here. I think white has a more pleasant position at this point. Yeah, black long term, again, doing very, very well, but just feel, feels a bit loose for now, uh, especially if white's able to hit with gain of time while the black king, queen, rook on a8 aren't quite mobilized. Yeah, queen mm -hmm. e3 being one highlight uh, of how loose black's position is. It just feels like things are coming with gain of time, gain of tempo, and normally a bad sign. I do wonder whether black does try to castle queenside at least. For example, in this variation, instead of king to f8, Oof, hesitate to suggest, but queen to e7 maybe instead of king f8 and e4 castle long and hope that uh, you're surviving on that flank. But um, again, it does feel like something's <laughs> a bit wrong, some tactics potentially uh, in white's favor. I don't see them yet, but um, yeah, I mean, this one, it might just hang on one or two moves uh, on a small window of opportunity for Dave. Yeah, maybe something like rook c2 and I don't know, get this knight around to a4, but this is a position that will depend very heavily on calculation, and it'll be very important to have a lot of time on, on the clock. So Anisha's clock management might come in handy, um, but it's very hard to predict what direction uh, this game is going to take, literally and figuratively, <laughs> and what direction Black's King is going to take. Um, yeah. Will he go west? Will he go east? Um, hard Hopefully to say. <laughs> Hopefully not south. Yeah, I mean, or Black's position might start going south. But I like F3. I think F3 is a good move because it's not too risky. And it's a nice, healthy idea in the center. But I think Ding needs to he needs to get cracking here. You don't want to, yeah. you know, spend another 15 minutes and suddenly you start getting uncomfortable. I think I used to, as a commentator, slightly exaggerate the role of time pressure. You know, player would drop below an hour and I'm like, okay, that's time for the time scramble. They're basically <laughs> playing a bullet. But I think Ding is already feeling a little bit uncomfortable. He's feeling the pressure. Yeah, it's all relative, right? I mean, for Ferruja, it's not time pressure until he's below five minutes on the clock. But for some others, I would include Ding. <laughs> it feels like time pressure maybe when you're around the half hour mark, still with a bunch of moves to play, especially in type of position as well. Um, especially if it's a bit more open, a bit more wild, then uh, you need a lot of time on the clock. And it might get that way. So yeah, I mean, I suggested F3 because I was too lazy to calculate E4, but he's doing the right <laughs> thing. He's calculating <laughs> E4, the most forcing move first. If it doesn't appeal, then he'll go and look for options, and F3 is a safer way of doing the same thing. So, um, again, want to check in on. There's actually crazy updates elsewhere um, as Ding ponders his next move. Still a healthy position for him, but uh, wow. Mag Zulu found Queen to E for Dania. What we thought was almost uh, a superhuman uh, saving, well, not saving idea, but a way to uh, salvage something from the wreckage of White's position. So I think this is the next game to go to. Absolutely. And by the way, F3 by Ding. Uh, let's give ourselves a small pat on the back. Um, <laughs> give you a pat on the back. You pointed out F3. Geary just like blitzing out his moves. He really wants to go home and, and see his kids sooner, <laughs> sooner rather than later. Bishop takes C3. Okay, we'll keep an eye on that one. Off we go to... Um, I was going to make a pun. I'm going to save it. Let's go to Maxudlu Warmerdam where queen e4 is on the board. And like you said, this is step one. This is not like the final step, the saving resources is the first step to make sure you don't lose in 15 moves. Mm -hmm. Queen e4, yeah. I mean, I think uh, I would have spent a lot more time than Mag Zulu did there. And uh, maybe if I realized everything else was lost, then this kind of is the only resort. This is the last way. But uh, yeah, walking into a fork willingly, um, Max now has a really pleasant decision. Um, I guess he's going to trade queens and jump in with that knight check, but I just wanted to go back into the variation we mentioned earlier, Daniel, and revisit that f5 move uh, mm -hmm. to show how important it could be and uh, to show what Max should be doing here to maximize his advantage. Oh, no, I did it. I didn't even mean to. Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, you have to. Use, I don't think there's a different <laughs> word to use um, in that situation. Yes, what you're saying is that after knight takes e4, uh, we should remind the viewers that if you just go immediately for the rook, white will play bishop d2. And this is like the worst version for black. But there is this button that you can press, and you can press it at various moments. You can press it right now. You can play f5. What is the point of this move? Well, the point of this move is that suddenly white's knight is in an uncomfortable spot. You can't really come back to c3 because then the black knight will be able to evacuate. My instinct here is to go knight g5. But this feels like it should lose somehow like how, how does black combine is it now time for knight c2 
Does Black or Rook G8 here? What do you think is the most effective way uh, to yeah. maximize Black's advantage? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's tough. Um, I mean, Rook G8 would be the first instinct because Knight C2, I don't think it's running away yet. And often it's nice to keep the options open, but I don't see exactly what to do after Knight takes F7 yet. I'm hoping a flash of inspiration. The Knight is pretty much trapped there, but how to close the door. Um, yeah, this is hard. Knight d3 and rook d7, but yeah, then it feels then like white can counterattack the knight. Yeah, rook d1. d1. Okay, mm. we need to be creative here. Um, how about a knight check on c2? And then, oh, oh the bar's moving. Oh dear, I was going to say just <laughs> something like rook d8 or rook d5 to close the cage and try to trap. Um, yeah, I was about. Uh, I was going to propose something like maybe even in this position, rook d8 or rook d5. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is fun easy. for us, but it would be infuriating for for Wormerdam. Mm -hmm. Wow, the move is rook d7. Knight to e5. Okay, this is like the typical like, rook e7. Uh, <laughs> Why okay. is this so good? Like, uh, oh, it's, oh, oh, at the oh, end you have rook c7 to break okay, a pin. This is just this is typical. Like when you play the moves out, you're like, well, obviously this is so easy. So here's the point, everybody. The knight drops back to f3, and this is exactly the opposite of what I thought we were supposed to do. I thought we were supposed to trap the knight, but no. Now you go for the fork. White plays bishop d2, and after knight c2. Rook c1. This is just like the Abdusator up game where there is some tiny detail at the end. Now you have rook e7 to c7 defending the knight, and black emerges up an entire rook. So instead of trying to trap the knight, you use the knight as bait in order to get this rook to a superior square. Incredible. And Max is taken on e4, and that's the easy part. Will he be able to find all of these moves? And by the way, after f5, of course, white can also play knight g3 which is probably the lesser evil uh, for this very simple reason. Mm -hmm. But then you're potentially walking into a nasty move like f4. Um, not sure if this is the time for black to uh, go for the fork. Ah, you can actually maybe try to... Um, no, never mind. But not totally sure what's going yeah. to happen here. Yeah, it's really not easy, actually. Um, credit to Magzulu for finding this narrow path to survival and actually giving Max an even narrower path to a big advantage. Um, if he finds this Max f5 first and this whole idea with rook d7, then that's another level of genius. And um, yeah, I think that would be one of the finds of the tournament so far. But um, yeah, I mean, that idea, wow, so deep, so sophisticated in a position where it looks like you can, I mean, you can pretty much go for it and uh, win on the spot. But uh, yeah, it's far less easy than first appearances here. Uh, F5, yes. that variation, wow. That's an incredible variation, and I'll just complete the circle here. After knight g3, I think the point is knight c2 check, king e2, knight takes a1, bishop d2, and in this position, as a byproduct of the move f5, you have this beautiful long diagonal for the bishop. Uh, so you can just give away the knight, you can play bishop g7, rook takes a1, centralize your rook on d5, um, this is a findable move, of course, restricting the knight. And here, black clearly has a technically winning position. You have a beautiful bishop. You have the prospect of h5, h4. But understanding all of this is just so much harder than when you have the eval bar, you have the engine at your disposal. First step for Max is to find uh, the move f5, to realize that you want to flick this move in, which I think he might be able to do intuitively. But then there's the concrete component of finding all the follow-up moves. I mean, defensive skill, David, has exponentially risen. Imagine someone like Steinitz or, you know, Alekhine. In the 1800s, White would have just gotten mated as a matter of honor. You were just not supposed to trade queens. But nowadays, it's gotten so hard uh, to beat these top guys, even on the worst, uh, on their worst of days. Yeah, they're so stubborn, these top players. They never go down without a fight. Even just... I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, Daniel, I used to play Grandmasters. They make one slip and they kind of fall apart. Now, all of these Grandmasters, like you say, they're fighting, they're throwing things back at you. They're kind of giving you a narrow path. Uh, it's partly the rise of engines, showing that there's always resources and positions. But I think just generally, the uh, the level of chess uh, has risen and uh, more awareness of 
kind of the psychological side of things needing to be strong, needing to be tenacious, needing to be uh, kind of, uh, yeah, just, uh, yeah, <laughs> a great defender in uh, all types of positions. So the fact that he's paused here, I'm going to say Max is very, um, well, very positive. <laughs> the fact that he's realized that F5 is an option because I think 99% of us, probably myself included, would play Knight C2, uh, yeah. take the rook in the court and then start to think. But uh, F5, that threat is not going anywhere. So um, yeah, sometimes to keep better to keep these things up your sleeve, up your pocket for later. Amazing. This is honestly just lovely complications. We have the luxury of enjoying them. Max has to suffer through them, but yeah, just amazing. I mean, this is modern chess, like knight c2 check is, is the wrong move. Amazing. Uh, ooh, but Parham letter to rock, let's go. <laughs> but no, I mean, of course, like when you play super GMs regularly, you just know that uh, stuff like this is too good to be true. And mm -hmm. um, if you think that uh, you see something as simple as this, you need to pause, reevaluate, and go deeper um, under the many layers of this position. This is one to keep an eye on, but we should probably give Max a chance to work through the complications. Yeah, that will take a while, and uh, he's wisely investing his time. But instructive <laughs> stuff. And um, I mean, I normally hate that uh, that old chess idiom. It's like when you see a good move, look for a better one. But this is literally that case it's mm -hmm. like there's a great move knight c2 check pick up material but there's a much stronger move right now um so yeah listen to those uh <laughs> those idioms when you're a chess player um okay where else to go actually even the less interesting or what we thought initially were the less interesting of the boards have livened up um i'm seeing a rook on h5 from donchenko um prag i mean his game is just as crazy as we predicted um, I recommend one of those two, Dania. I'll let you pick though. Let's go to the Donchenko game, maybe briefly, just because it's been a while uh, since we've had an update, and then definitely to the to the Prague game, uh, we will go afterwards. So this game uh, moved along kind of the lines that we had outlined, uh, where Ferruja did not accept that pawn sacrifice on c3. He took on g3 and brought his bishop back from b4 to d6. Donchenko had just slammed a rook on h5, which is actually a very sensible positional move. You're trying to separate uh, black's kingside pawns. And I guess his follow-up is to castle queenside and maybe double rooks on the h file, just target the h6 pawn. In some ways, this is a little bit similar structurally to the Geary, uh, to the Ding Geary game, where white has these ideas of opening up the center. We have just seen knight d7 by Ali Reza Fruja. Gee, I wonder where this knight is going. Maybe e5, c5... I don't know. No, it's going to have six, chasing away the rook. Good move. Yeah, not b8, that's for sure. Uh, no, really <laughs> instructive. Um, actually, until I just saw this move land on the board, uh, one that I hadn't foreseen, I want to say this looks beautiful strategically for white. Um, but now you're not quite in time to establish this bind. Both rooks on the h file, for example, knight f6, as you say, just locks things down. And a lot of similarities uh, with that ding game uh, that you mentioned especially the Black King, it's like, will it go long? Will it go to the queen side? Will it sit on G7 long term? Um, I find these really hard to evaluate, uh, I must say. It feels like both sides have chances, but it comes down to when white breaks with E4. Eventually, you get itchy fingers and you push, and for better or worse, <laughs> the position gets a bit wilder. So, um, yeah, Alareza, uh, he's, uh, I was going to say a man in form. He's had an up and down tournament. But uh, up and down year as well. Uh, I've got to say 2023, it's ended on a high. It uh, feels like uh, he's just peaking at the right time. And it's just a case of whether he does that in this game as well, uh, in this tournament. And uh, in the meantime, talking of his uh, 2023, he did become a candidate at the end of this, uh, this year. But in the meantime, what's more important? It's chess.com performance. And uh, he's played a bunch, Dania, on chess.com in 2023. 1,400 games. That's a lot. <laughs> Not as many as you, I must uh, clarify. <laughs> yes, I don't even want to say the number. Um, I checked before the show. It's um, it's quite a big number. It's like 17,000. Um, so you know how wisely I spend my time. But in all seriousness, this is a great new feature. Year in review gives you a snapshot of um, how much time you spend doing the best activity on Earth, playing online and spending time on chess.com. Ali Reza. Um, he didn't play quite as much in 2023 um, as he did maybe even during the candidates tournament of 2022. 
uh, but that shall go unmentioned. But of course, for Ali Reza, online chess, big, big part of his development, big reason why he is such a well-known name, uh, such a revered young player with incredible promise, despite all the naysayers. He's in the candidates. He's got as good of a chance as anybody. Yeah, still in love with chess, as we saw by the amount of games he played on chesscode.com. Still hungry, still passionate, still uh, thirsting for that chance at the World Championship title. And uh, I must mention, his uh, on the previous graphic, his best win against Magnus Carlsen. That's not too bad either. And uh, <laughs> as, as we watch Alareza wait for his opponent's move, remember, everyone at home, you can go and check out your stats as well on go.chess.com forward slash YIC. So, um, yeah, that was his year in chess. Um, his year 2024 could start very well if he's able to win this game, but black against such a solid competitor, not going to be an easy task. Yeah, not at all. And this is a very undefined position. Um, it's kind of a slow burn, this game, especially compared to what we have. So perhaps we should switch over to a completely different landscape, uh, the Prague Jew and June game. Um, we can perhaps go straight there. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can flip that game on. Wow, I mean, this just this game just continues to get crazier and crazier, more and more undefined. The lines continue to blur, but Ju and June's clock continues to tick down, and that might be one among several disturbing trends. Also, um, controversial point: she is still a pawn down. Yeah, uh, counting is important <laughs> always in chess. We sometimes yes. forget to do it, but. Essentially, that's the first thing we should always uh, kind of mention in a position. It tells us uh, who has to act more urgently in the middle game. In this case, it's definitely Zhu Wenjun as she retreats her knight. Uh, a bit of a threat, the knight coming around to attack white, light square bishop. Uh, so she's a pawn down, the pressure's on her. Prague is just about consolidating and trying to um, kind of eke out an advantage in the end game with his extra material. But uh, yeah, it's a crazy position here, Daniel. It looks like, I mean, you mentioned Fisher random chess earlier. It looks like white's kind of unraveled, but very unorthodox squares for those pieces as, uh, yeah, a bit of a threat on the board. Yes, Juinjin trying to get her knight around to c5, um, but Prague will definitely nip that in the bud. And I'm starting to sour a little bit on Black's prospects here. I was very excited by how Ju handled the opening, but now that Prague has managed to unravel uh, his queen side and get his king to, okay, relative safety, of course, this is not um, this is not a villa in Mexico, but it's it'll do. You know, it's got running water and, and a shower, and um, it's hard to attack the queen side here. And my immediate question, David, is can white play this very primitively? Can you play simple chess? Bishop takes b7, queen takes b7, and now disarm the c4 pawn, either with f3. But my instinct is to play d3 here. Maybe not the most accurate move, uh, but just as a representation of the fact that black's position is a little bit uncomfortable, uh, even, even here, if white plays this very primitively. Yeah. Um, actually, when I was watching that uh, aforementioned game, uh, Ferruja against Caruana last year in this exact opening, White Castle Queenside, and I thought, okay, White's king is safe now. White's just going to win. Extra pawn, extra material. But suddenly things turned. Um, unfortunately for Zhu and Jun, it feels like that's this isn't one of those cases. And I really like your bishop takes b7. Normally, I'm a bit uh, reluctant, a bit loath to part with the bishop pair. But here, like you say, white's just so speedy. F3, D3. Black is still four or five moves away from conjuring up some attack, and the white bishop on B2 is actually going to be beautiful both as a defender and an attacker. So, yeah, F3. I'm struggling to see it, the compensation. It feels like maybe a few too many kind of slower moves by Zhu and Jun. Maybe E4 a bit prematurely as well. Um, knight A5 back to B7 loses time. She's had to move her queen a couple of times. Yeah, I, I think I'd pick white as well. Um, yeah, the extra time as well. Just a bonus for Prague right now. Um, we have to look at it though. Bishop takes b7. That's the way to go. How does black even conjure up any compensation for the sacrificed material? Yeah, I'm not sure. Like, okay, let me just move, play this again. Queen takes b7. Sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm giving our producer a nightmare <laughs> going back and forth. But I'm just trying to figure out, like, after d3, the eval bar is not, you know, enthralled with this option. Why is... Why is black okay here? I mean, relatively okay here. What does black do? And bishop takes c4. I thought maybe just d takes c4. Mm -hmm. And then I can continue chipping away at the center with f3. What, what would you do here with, with, with black? 
uh, apart from panic or uh, apart from, yeah after the panic has subsided yeah. maybe knight d5 i don't know yeah i was gonna say forcing moves bishop takes c4 isn't appealing because you'll never break the white king side uh i say king side but queen side structure uh where the white king is going to be super safe knight yes. d5 looks like pretty much the only move that kind of calls out uh but knight a4 maybe if just white white dodges how are you going to break through these two white knights um, both on outposts, both protecting their king. White, white is undermining the center as well. Um, Zhu Wenjun, she's the queen as we see, uh, the chess queen as we see on that uh, graphic right there. But big questions to answer, big problems potentially in her position. Yeah, I mean, this is the kind of position where you make one more inaccuracy and you're essentially lost. Okay, maybe black can play something like rook eight e8 and just try to brace for impact in the center, but. This reeks of desperation. Mm -hmm. um, white doesn't even have to rush d takes c4. You could sandwich a bishop on e5. You could already consider fighting on the flank. Um, white would be spoiled for choice uh, in a situation like this. Maybe the move a3 uh, can be flicked in, posing a very difficult dilemma for this bishop. Can't go back to a5 because, yeah, this is the key. a3 is actually super nasty. If the bishop drops back, now you take on e4, and black's position starts to collapse. Um, and with 38 minutes on the clock for over half uh, the moves to make until time control, I'm starting to really worry for Juin Jun's prospects. She needs a big mistake from Prague, I think, uh, for this game to, to turn around. Yeah, it definitely feels that way. Uh, he was just the better prepared player. Like he, This is such a wild line that you need to have uh, kind of studied it just before the game to keep things fresh in the mind. And yeah, Bishop takes b7. I don't see anything else for white. Maybe knight a4 first, but it feels a bit uh, convoluted to kind of plant all your pieces so uh, awkwardly on the queen side. Yeah, Bishop takes knight. Maybe yeah, maybe after d3 in that variation, uh, black takes on c4 and just pretends they're not a pawn down, plays on. But mm -hmm. you've got to assume that white's better there, and it's not the type of uh, advantage that will slip any time in the near future. So Prague... Um, we talked about it being crazy, but he's the one kind of working things in his favor. He's the one who's uh, maybe just got a better kind of feel for this uh, exact position. Ju and June, she's been really solid this event, but she's yet to be tested until now in uh, this kind of uh, irrational position. Looks good for white. Yeah, well said, and definitely also knight a4 in this position. Um, looks quite appealing. Uh, just taking the sting out of knight c5, preserving the possibility of bishop takes b7. When you look at Prague now, you feel like he's been 27, 40, 27, 50 for ages. You know, you get the sense of a very seasoned super GM. And it's it's so hard to imagine that just last year he was, you know, below 2,700. It's it's crazy. Uh, just the way he plays with such uh, such precision. He's so well-rounded, so well-prepared. Uh, he's super GM for, for a reason. And I mean, he's continuing to climb. He hasn't lost a game it, literally in, in ages since he was like three years old. <laughs> it was like yeah. 41 game streak, I think. 41, that's right. I mean, I've thought of him as a 2,700 player since he beat me when he was 12 years old, when I was 2,700. <laughs> so <laughs> that's pretty the last, like since then, we've got on very different uh, trajectories. <laughs> and um, yeah, I've been lucky enough, like last year he came to Norway uh, where I'm now residing and he, he was uh, at a training camp with Magnus, with some other really top players. And just his level of calculation is another level. Um, of course, understanding is really good, his general feel for where the pieces belong, but his calculation really sets him apart. So that's where his coach Ramesh has really kind of uh, kind of helped his students shine. And that's the thing here. He's kind of done a bit of the hard work already. He's won a pawn. And if it comes down to that phase of the game where it's just pure calculation till the end, I think, um, yeah, he's, uh, he's just going to wrap this up and bodes well for his candidate's chances. Imagine not losing in 41 games when you're playing 2,700 opposition half the time. Um, he's really, really, I mean, we're watching a superstar mature in front of our Absolutely. Our and, and just to spotlight Ramesh, um, I had the great honor of uh, doing a little bit of training with Ramesh in Prague and uh, Morali, another uh, talented Indian GM, um, a year and a half or so ago. And yeah, Ramesh is just a lot more than, you know, just a, a chess coach. Uh, he's you know, a great human being, uh, but also just a mentor, father figure for uh, this new generation of Indian talent. He is class act he's so good at selecting material and uh providing just the right kind of advice so big shout out to uh to Ramesh for all of his incredibly dedicated hard work it must feel so good 
uh, to see it paying off in real in real time. Mm -hmm. Fully agreed. And um, yeah, on that note, uh, let's leave Prague to mull over how to try to push an advantage or how to um, at least stabilize his position with the extra pawn. Um, the other game stemming from the Italian opening that we kind of keep pairing them up, uh, this game, of course, the flight yes. liver attack, uh, the other unorthodox Italian, Abdu Satorov against Van Forest. I'd like to take us there because I see an evaluation bar that's getting extremely overexcited right now, or maybe just excited. <laughs> I don't know how big white's advantage is, but either way, black is castled long, black is castled on the queen side. Is Van Forest in as much trouble as uh, the computer seems to declare? Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. <laughs> Next. <laughs> yeah, okay. Should we now go back to the Perugia game? Okay, what's the evaluation there? By the way, uh, Max Warmerdam found f5. Um, God, everybody's playing so well today. Um, mm -hmm. What's in the air in The Hague? Um, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> that international criminal court, fresh air, <laughs> has really been impacting the players positively. But okay, in all seriousness, David, why am I so pessimistic? about Jordan's position. While he was able to prevent bishop g5 and castle queenside, he's gone from the frying pan uh, into the fire. And look at this last move, queen d1 to e2. Small move, but a small move with big consequences. The queen is heading for b5. White is monopolizing all of the big squares in the center. There's the very nasty prospect of bishop takes c6. And there's 24 minutes on Jordan's clock. This position is pretty disastrous i'm not seeing any like tactical ways for black to trade off a bunch of pieces do you share my um pessimism for black's position yes simple as that <laughs> unfortunately um, yes exactly. yeah, I mean, for jordan it's just been an opening disaster it happens quite rarely he's such a big opening expert that's why uh, he was kind of a second for magnus carlson of course in world championship matches and having worked with uh, many great players but Feels like he's been a bit too creative and that's just been punished here. Um, I mean, maybe if we put a few moves on the board just to uh, mm -hmm. show what a deep dark forest he's found himself in, uh, <laughs> unable to get himself out of. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to find natural moves for black. Let's say a non-committal move. Um, if I can even find one, king to b8, for example. It's horrible. It's uh, Maybe there's something more accurate active to do. But as you said, white's just going to, at the very minimum, trade off everything. Bishop takes c6. Bishop takes c5 to follow. Um, even if it oh becomes God. two knights versus two two knights. I mean, the knights are the ones thriving. Bishop takes c5 isn't even the most accurate. I'm sure there's plenty of other things to do. But um, yeah, queen c4. Oof. Yeah, maybe. Ah, knight c5. Okay, this is computer chess. A knight c5 and knight c4. Look at this idea. Yeah. And walking into bishop d3. <laughs> But there is what knight takes a five. Mm -hmm. Wow! Ugh, my gosh! I mean, Black's position is just literal house of cards. Yeah. Um, even Forrest Gump would not get lucky in this situation. It's definitely yeah. not a box of chocolates. Jordan might need a box of chocolates um, after this game. But this is a great representation, David. And I don't know if I see anything better than King B eight. If you try to trade your way out of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, knight takes a4, knight takes c4, bishop takes c4. I was considering something like this. But the problem is also g6 is hanging. And again, white is more than happy to trade pieces mm -hmm. because there is a little check on a6 that will trigger immediate resignation. Yeah, I mean, it's ugly pawn structure for black with uh, all of the isolated pawns about to fall. Weak king with black. Yeah, I mean, you might be facing the bishop pair in this variation at the very minimum and... Um... If you compare kings, black's king on the queen side, which it uh, it has been successful for Max Varmadam in his game. But um, yeah, if you compare it to the white king, which is safer than any, I mean, it's the safest king I've ever seen. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's a simple comparison, essentially. And knight, not king to b8, knight to b8, preventing us from wrecking the black pawn structure. Um, mm. Okay, is there a knockout blow or does Nodibek continue to build up? Mm. Yeah, queen moves, queen c4 looks tempting, queen b5. Before ideas look tempting in the near future. Um, wow. Oof. He'll have played that reluctantly. He's down to 22 minutes with still 20 moves to go uh, till the time control. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's going to enjoy this position for the next 10 minutes, just mulling over what to do next. 
Yes, exactly. This is exactly the kind of position you don't want to rush with white. You don't just want to throw in queen b5 because you might get unlucky with the tactics. You want to really maximize your advantage here. I really like your suggestion of b4. Um, there's probably multiple ways to maintain a uh, decisive advantage. And honestly, this is what makes this young generation, David, so good is how good they are at technique. It's insane. Like, yes, of course, uh, they can make inaccuracies, but, but by and large, they're incredibly patient and they're so surgically accurate when they get that big vice-like grip, especially out of the opening. Um, they just don't give any chances. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I remember just 10 years ago when I was in my, like, uh, I was in my mid twenties and I was like, oh, anytime you play a kid, just trade off the pieces. They don't know how to do end games. And now this modern breed, Abdu Satoru is like one of the best end game players out there. It's, uh, it's just unfair, these, uh, these youngsters. But uh, in the meantime, this is far from the end game. I'm not sure Jordan is going to get that far. But uh, yeah, queen c4, actually, the more I look at it, comes uh, becomes more attractive just to force the issue, just to clarify the tension. But yeah, b4 as well, trying to open lines or, I don't know, maybe improve one of the white rooks. This advantage is long term. You yeah. can totally sit on the... There's no rush here. I mean, this is... And I just want to point out one tactical detail, uh, if I may. Let's take a, a random improving move like f3, which, by the way, is not unlikely to, to feature on the board. Um, if black tries to kick the bishop away, I think there is this beautiful tactic. Knight takes d6, queen takes d6, and look at this. Knight c4 and knight b6 check. Just dark square to light square to dark square, and the queen is lost. So black would have to drop the queen back to e7, but I mean, you could even throw in a check on a8 just for, just for, just to <laughs> illustrate the extent of your dominance. This is really, really bad. The game is not over, but Jordan needs some sort of an oversight, some tactical error by Noterbeck to get back into this game. Yeah, there's pretty much two ways he gets back in this game. Like you say, tactical oversight, where Abdus Satorov tries to cash in too soon and it doesn't quite work. Uh, or he needs uh, Abdus Satorov just to play way too slowly, way too positionally, and it kind of lets slip this potential attack against the Black King. But unfortunately, both of those look like long shots right now. Um, yeah, big advantage white. And also, I just want to point out visually, centralization. We talk about the center with white. White has controlled all of the central squares and all of the pieces just... Yeah, perfectly poised. So uh, tactics likely to work in White's favor. Um, okay, in the meantime, maybe we leave Abdu Satorov to try and figure out what he thinks is the clearest path, uh, the most efficient way uh, to push the advantage without an allowing any counters, any counterplay. Um, games are developing really quickly elsewhere. Um, I'm wondering which are the most dramatic right now. Um, let's go to the bird's eye view. Ding against Giri has pretty much gone on the path that we were expecting. Um, White has built a center there. Uh, Wei Yi gets Yan Nepomnishi. That one's clarified slightly. White's still a pull up. But... Yes, Ooh, I think we need an update that on, on that game because, he, yeah, uh, every time we think we have a handle on the structure, it changes again. Uh, it <laughs> keeps, keeps eluding us. And okay, so after Rook AD8, which was this very measured response by Nepo. Wei Yi broke up the center with f3. Very logical move. Obviously not afraid of e3 um, because of knight c4. Nepo obliged. He traded and immediately blitzed out the move queen g5, which is disapproved of by the computer. I mean, you can totally understand why Nepo did not want to go into this endgame. Uh, not just because he's a pawn down, but because that knight uh, would have really sunk its teeth into some of these weak squares in black's territory. Jan, he wants to keep some winning chances alive. Um, but he might not be alive much longer if Wei Yi continues to demonstrate this level of precision. So my immediate question is, can white get away? Can white make knight c4 work? Because if the answer is yes, then potentially black is in serious trouble. Or is the correct idea to just drop back to f1 and kind of sit on your position? What do you think? Yeah, um, both tempting. Uh, I like knight c4 just uh, at first glance as well. And if you can make knight c4 work, then it's going to be very, very strong. Um, it's the type of situation where the players, where he, he knows he's a pawn up, consolidating knight f1, that's like last resort. Knight c4 uh, is going to be the first thing he's calculating, and he'll come to a conclusion, he'll evaluate, and then he'll either go for it or reject it and go back to knight f1. Uh, so knight c4 threats galore, like knight d6 is coming in. I guess the reason you ask whether it works, Dania, is because black could, I say it hesitantly, try to capture on d5 at some point. I'm not sure exactly how or when. Um, with which piece? <laughs> yeah, or do you take any one first? <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay. taking any one first, I think, is uh, logical. 
Yes, because if you take on d5 first, I think that white, again, I might get the move order wrong here, but I'm just trying to, okay, at the very minimum, mm -hmm. I think you can do this, this, you have knight takes a5, yes, but I think knight d6 is stronger, rook e6, and now let's see if we can find the most Minimum you take an f7, right? At a minimum, yeah, and at a maximum, probably also in take f7, <laughs> and white is winning. Um, because it, the problem is that the black loses the knight. Black is just like a sound pawn down. The rook is coming in. This is complete disaster. Okay, so that's uh, that line is checked off the list. Um, if black starts with rook takes e1, now we understand why this is a better version for black. But it's still a terrible version uh, mm -hmm. for black. Because here I actually am... Um, knight takes a5 looks very, very appealing. Okay, maybe knight d6. But, but even this, David, just looks like a miserable... End game for black, you're a pawn down, and the knight is coming to c6. So both versions of queen takes d5 have been ruled out. What about knight takes d5 in this position? Nope. Oof. Bad. Something on f7. Something's collapsing. Goodbye. There's yeah, like 60 threats that this move opens up. <laughs> yeah, and... And number yeah. four, if you take and take, well, this makes maybe a little bit more sense than... The immediate knight takes d5, but something like this also looks terrible for black. Mm -hmm. So we considered all the combinations and iterations of taking on d5. I think knight c4 works. Yeah, I was going to say h4 in that final position as well. I was wondering how black Ooh. even clings on, but maybe there's a way. <laughs> uh, no, you're absolutely right. Beautiful. There was g4 earlier, now there's h4. So this yeah. theme of chasing the black queen away, um, so prevalent in this game. This might be exactly the path that way he follows you. Mm -hmm. Knight c4 is a pretty easy move to calculate. It's actually very pleasant uh, to calculate lines like this. I like it when there's a clear, clearly defined threats. There aren't too many candidate moves. Everything's forced. And you know you kind of feel like Prague when you calculate these lines. Then <laughs> you wake up and realize my rating's a little bit lower. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But uh, yeah, he's doing the right thing. He spent four minutes now, Wei Yi, on this one move. He still has an yeah, an abundance of time, and um, yeah, he's literally saying, "Okay, knight c4, I'm jumping in. If you do this, I do this. I'm better. If you play that, I, I do this. I'm better. I'm winning a pawn." And um, <clears throat> he's just double checking his variations. Really instructive how the top players uh, pause at the critical moments. And knight c4, what do you think Black should be doing to cling on and to minimize the damage? Uh, because he's a pawn down and. Where is the compensation? Where is uh, the solace there? No, it's definitely not in The Hague. Maybe Jan left it behind in, in Weikanze. Um But uh, I know, I, I think after knight c4, black is in huge trouble. I think black is in, I think Jan maybe played queen g5 impulsively, frustrated by the way that this game is going. Mm -hmm. And I really played him up in the previous round, but now I'm starting to kind of sour on that prediction because this would be a serious blow uh, to Jan's tournament chances if he if he goes down. Of course, plenty of fight. We know how resilient Jan is. We remember the game against Donchenko, for example, where he pulled just an incredible miracle comeback in a position he was mated seven ways to Sunday. But uh, with full due respect to Donchenko, Wei Yi is a different level, and he might not let Jan uh, go if he finds knight c4. Big moment here, David. Yeah, huge moment. Wei Yi is just as skilled as Prague in the calculation phase. And um, yeah, he's ruthless with the white pieces, Wei Yi. I've just seen some incredible games where he just picks up the momentum. He kind of grabs a pawn or he gets some attack and he just never takes his foot off the pedal. Um, so Knight C4, if and when uh, it comes, could be a real shock to Yen upon Nishi. And um, yeah, just as in some of the other games we're predicting, uh, the white has an advantage. Still not decisive, but um yeah he's done everything right so far with the white pieces um i think time to maybe move uh, to one of Wei Yi's compatriots um i quite like the look of the dingler ren game against anish giri suddenly it feels like it's just sparked into life um, perfect so timing i think um just mm -hmm. so we join uh, just when the action starts to unfold loudly walking into the movie theater <laughs> after like an hour uh, has gone by. Okay, so what is happening here? I'm just still getting my bearings. Um, we saw e4. This was kind of according to plan. King f8, very logical move. And now Ding went over to the queen side. I wasn't expecting this 
particular idea. Queen B3, okay. Uh, Giri says, I defend. And Ding grabs the pawn on D5. Okay, obviously, knight f4, there is this little trick with d6, but David, this smells a little bit, and it doesn't smell like, you know, lilac air freshener. Let's put it that way. It smells a little bit worse than that. What do you think? Knight takes d4 is also a move. Yeah, it feels odd somehow. I, I agree. It looks loose, like white's queen on b3, so disconnected from the hanging rook on h2, king on b1, a bit, a bit airy there. Um... Okay, yeah, no lavender on this board. It doesn't smell great, but how do we act as Giri? You mentioned knight takes d4. That's the first move my eyes were drawn to, but white does have an intermezzo, knight takes g6. Uh, the white knight wow. on e5 will die anyway, so you can kind of throw it away for a pawn, and you can kind of come back and guard any checks against the white king. Um, what if you just take back on d5? Again, I have no idea which way, <laughs> either with cd or knight takes d5. Yes. I mean, maybe this is what Ganesh is deciding. Um, mm -hmm. Let's say C takes D5. First of all, for particularly for newer players, it's very important. Knight takes D5, Knight takes D5, Queen takes D5. And this is what we're talking about. White's pieces are just very, very loose, and they're constantly vulnerable to these random tactics. Uh, Knight F4 would fork uh, the Queen and the Rook. But of course, White is under no obligation to, uh, to take on D5. But what does White do here? I understand the eval bar is giving equality. Maybe Knight G4... Trying just to bail out? I don't know. Yeah, and uh, I don't really want to take that knight and connect your pawns, but uh, does black have anything else? If black just moves, rook h5. Oh, but then sudden, or rook somewhere, then at least white can I like this east move. on a couple of pawns. Yeah, here again, if I take and take, this just feels very, very wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. Because probably, okay, queen f5 is not the move. <laughs> What is the move here? Why is it plus a million? Uh, okay, we can do this. We can work this out. We can do this. We can absolutely do and this. Rook takes d5. Queen takes d5. No, it didn't quite work. Knight f4, there's a check on c5. Um, ah, queen g5. And there's a 4 oof. g1. Oof. Loose pieces oh. drop off. Oh my gosh. Don't Too soon. Too soon, man. Don't tell that to, to Dingley Ren after oof. a blunder. In. But what a move. Queen g5. And again, rook on h2. King on b1, one fork leads to another, and this would lead to defeat. But this is exactly the kind of thing that's very easy to blunder when uh, you flirt with disaster on the clock. Yeah. And so... And okay, Giri took with the knight. Okay, we see a couple of moves. And uh, okay, a3 from Ding. That's a classy one. Not walking into that knight fork you mentioned, but just preparing uh, a bit of luft, a bit of air for the white king. And uh, okay, quick judgment call um, here, Dania. Do you prefer white? Uh, sorry, do you prefer black still after thinking that white's position is still a bit loose? Yes, I think Ding is on, on the back foot here. I think he's trying to equalize. I think Giri essentially can bail out whenever he wants to. So probably even Knight takes d4 here uh, would lead to some sort of trades. But I don't think Anish will play for a draw. I think he's playing for a win. I think he, we might see him go rook d8 and try to consolidate, improve his king position. And you know, in the long run, yes, there are no immediate earth-shattering tactics, but, you know, these pawns uh, are really weak and they're not going anywhere. And if Anish can make a couple of improving moves, I think Ding will have to demonstrate a lot of precision here to, to maintain the balance. I like where this is going for Anish, yes, and I like where his king is going. This is a good position for black. Mm -hmm. And uh, Anish Giri in his element, Ding, suffering on both board and clock. Look at that, 26 minutes left. We're only at move 25, but we're going to leave them to it and we're going to go on a another short break. But it is Tuesday. Happy Tuesday to all of you out there. And of course, we have Title Tuesdays, but Title players are not the only ones who get to have fun today. So don't forget to log on for Untitled Tuesday. Enter the Blitz Arena, the Swiss Arena, and put your Blitz skills to the test against the Chess.com community. Plus, now is your chance to showcase your game on the big screen, as the Chess.com community streams will be covering all the action. Everyone is eligible to play in weekly Untitled Tuesday tournaments, so use exclamation point Untitled in chat to learn how to play. And we'll see you right after this break.
Your subscription makes shows like this possible, which is why our Twitch subscribers will never see ads on chess.com. Connect your chess.com account and Twitch account at go.chess.com slash connect accounts and bang, boom, voila, you're done. 100% ad-free bliss forevermore. Whether you're following our events on site or on stream, type the command connect in the chat and thank you for helping bring these shows to life. International Master Danny Wrench, Chief Chess Officer, back again with more chess terms here for you today. We're going to talk about the past pawn. The past pawn must be pushed. You hear it said often, and that's because just about every endgame you see that isn't a blowout often comes down to maybe someone's up one pawn, or maybe even just the first person to create a past pawn is the person who goes on to win that game. We're going to talk about what the past pawn is and define it for you in today's video. Let's do it. What is a passed pawn? A passed pawn is a pawn that has no enemy pawns stopping it from moving forward. That means pawns either on the file in which it resides or on the adjacent files that would therefore capture the pawn should it advance. So if a pawn has none of those things stopping its way, then it's time to push them, baby, as our boy Yasser would say, and as you hear mentioned on many broadcasts uh, that you would watch on Chess TV. And on that note, as we look at our game examples we like to do, this is taken from Thomas Shevsky versus Rajava. Here, White plays the move B5 exclam, which highlights, again, it's not how many pawns you have, but who's going to be threatening to get a queen first. After Black takes it, White pushes forward with Gusto, and because the Rook can't blockade the pawn due to the light square bishop, this game is already over. Black is going to have to sacrifice the bishop for the pawn on B6, and White would simply be up a minor piece. Note that after the first move, B5, should A takes B5 have been played, White would have pushed this pawn, and then trap the rook on a7, showing the power of the pass pawn, as with it protecting the bishop, this rook is completely out of the game, and white would easily go on to win, picking up pawns and just flexing the rook's muscles over the bishop for the rest of the game. So here we see a pass pawn being used as a weapon to just cramp down and trap all of your enemy pieces. So this has been another Chess Terms video. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you're enjoying all of them. And with that, I will sign off, hoping that you learned something about what a pass pawn is and we'll see you around on chess.com.
Hello everyone and welcome back to round 9 of the Tata Steel Masters where the players are on tour out in The Hague and we're currently two and a half hours into the games. Things are of course heating up and before the tournament we did ask the players about their pre-tournament pre-game rituals so if you're curious check, the, check out this video. Maybe the first one was that I played against my mom and I lost. I was losing and then she would turn the board around and I would be still losing and so it would go on. Uh, playing in a chess club uh, with other kids. Coffee, I guess. <laughs> Play sports and take a shower or take a shower. I think maybe take uh, some more rest. Or... Uh, preparing couple of hours, not more. Just try to focus on the chess, uh, but I do try to keep the schedule the same each day. I, I will not reveal what I do, but it's some kind of a meditation. Yeah, I brush my teeth uh, before the game. It's by working on opening. It's actually important not to do anything special. Wake up, breakfast, prepare, play chess, dinner. Sleep and generally relax uh, maybe one or two hours before the game. Um, normally I just prepare with computer. <laughs> Sleep well, eat well and then uh, if I'm lucky to play well as well. Wow, brushing their teeth, having showers, preparing on a computer, a bunch of different routines there, Danya. And uh, which player do you think uh, has had the most successful rituals before today's game? I mean, they all have such exciting routines. I, I really don't know what I'd go for, you know, brushing your teeth or taking a shower, or setting openings, I mean, just riveting stuff, eating. <laughs> what do these players not do before the game? <laughs> and uh, who do you think it's been most successful for? Because clearly some players struggling a bit more than others today. Um, maybe the pre-game rituals just didn't go right for uh, some of those. Well, I mean, I forget what Ali Reza's ritual was, but I'm quite partial to whatever it is. I forget if it includes, you know, I think it includes waking up, but don't quote <laughs> me on that. Um, not totally sure what else. And uh, I'm Max Warmerdam as well. He's um, equating himself really, really well in in a, a difficult field, um, doing well against Parham as we look at the bird's eye view. Um, Max continues to try to convert that extra exchange. He's found all of the critical moves. He's doing pretty well. Man, action on all of the boards. Way he found knight c4, David. And he's got mm -hmm. a pawn on d6, I think. I mean... Yes. Unless that's a zebra, I think that's a pawn. <laughs> and much to Jan's chagrin. Yeah, um, very few boring, dull games today. It feels like being out on the tour uh, has allowed the players to uh, offer a bit more. And uh, yeah, I see a sky-high evaluation bar, Abdus Satorov, against Van Forest. Um, yeah, of course, we'll check in everywhere if possible. Uh, maybe we jump in there first because we could soon see our first result of the day. Looks like Abdus Satorov's advantage it just continues to grow, move by move. And Van Forest down to under 15 minutes now on the clock. He looks in pain on the camera, not enjoying today's round in The Hague at all. Yeah, I feel like this game is kind of going along the lines that we predicted. It's just getting worse and worse um, for Jordan. How did Noderbeck proceed with the advantage? Yeah, he played Rook AD1 a couple of moves ago. Kind of a very classy, patient, improving move. Um, not trying to do anything immediately, but just accumulating all of his pieces. As you said, David, central play. Really a great illustration of its tremendous power. Knight B, A6. That's never a good sign when you have to play Knight B8 to A6 in any position. Um, especially not in this one. Uh, Noterbeck gets the bishop pair. Look at all these big weaknesses on the queen side. Knight C4, Queen C7. And now another very classy move, Queen D2. I think he's preparing b4, just covering all of the squares, sitting on the position. And if knight b3, mm -hmm. oh, he's got knight b6 check, using tactics beautifully uh, to yeah. undergird his play. Yeah, maybe we just show that variation because it's very nice mm -hmm. and quite important. Uh, white emerges with a bit of extra material at the end. Um, there's not much else black can do. That's the problem uh, for Jordan. Knight b3 check, there's now a hit on that knight on b3, so the queen trade has to happen. And uh, after knight takes queen, I mean, bishop takes <laughs> rook. I mean, you don't even need to take. <laughs> yeah. I, I know, I know a few <laughs> sadists who would take on d two, but uh, I'm not among them. I would definitely not resist. Rook, bishop takes d eight, rook mm -hmm. takes d eight, rook takes d two. I mean, this is this mm -hmm. is essentially resignable. 
And if this is the best that Black can do, um, that's, I mean, go figure. Yeah. White would emerge with the extra exchange, Rook 4, Knight, and yeah, I mean, if the option is, as you say, allowing B4, then how do you even keep the game alive? I'll try, well, I was going to say Bishop E6, but that loses at least a pawn on D6, most likely. Maybe even uh, loses the game after B4 anyway. Uh, or actually, yeah, I mean, <laughs> the more I look at it, the more wins <laughs> I start to see with white. Uh, yeah, this is a very bad thing. I mean, the worst is that white can play this ultra simply, just like get the knight around to D5, and that's winning. Mm -hmm. um, B4 is coming. It's just a function of how good Noterbeck's technique is, that how easy he's making this look. But I can tell you, it's I've never played Jordan, but something tells me it's not that easy to convert a uh, winning yeah. position against him. In the old days, I think you know Black might resign here, but um, I think Jordan will keep trying. He'll make some moves, but there's virtually no hope. Noterbeck is an hour on the clock, too. That's perhaps the most debilitating uh, detail, is that you don't even have a chance to complicate the game. Yeah, Jordan, I mean, I've played him a bunch of times. I've, uh, yeah, I know him pretty well, and I've never seen him use this much time by move 24. Normally, he's the one, he lands an opening idea on the board, he sacrifices a pawn, gets on the front foot, he's got an hour and a half left after 20 moves. After 24 moves here, he's got 10 minutes left, 11 minutes left, and a wreck of a position, unfortunately. Um, the Black Knight's just not coordinating, not stable. Black King, su just super weak, especially compared to his counterpart. And the beautiful bishop pair for white, this is just, it's too many things. Um, yeah, this is painful, unfortunately, for black. So maybe we just move on. Um, I think, yeah, a matter of technique, but sooner or later, white will win material or get a killer attack. Yes, this is essentially decided. Um, amazing bounce back win by Noterbeck. And the opening experiment goes very much astray uh, for Jordan. Another position that has gone... A little bit south for uh, the white player is Donchenko versus Feruja. Feels like uh, Ali Reza's play has just been a lot more consecutive. Uh, his pieces are more harmonious, and he's starting to build up a really nasty advantage uh, going out of the opening and into the middle game. We can check into that game. Mm -hmm. um, not sure there's too much going on in the Gukesh Vidit game. That one's still in the general realm of equality. Mm -hmm. um, so shall we take a closer look and see how um, how uh, yeah. badly Alexander Donchenko's position has deteriorated. Let's do and that. Quite, quite badly. <laughs> quite quite a bit. <laughs> That's right. Although there is a small question mark attached to Farouche's last move, so maybe there was something even better, even stronger. Um, he's one of our leaders, our co-leaders after all, Farouche, so we need to see what's happening in his game. Maybe we just backtrack uh, three or four moves here, Daniel, just to see how the center opened up. Uh, maybe this was self-inflicted. Maybe White shouldn't have kind of been too uh, tempted here to open things. Maybe just castle queenside, put the white king on b1 and the game goes on. But um, ultimately, he forced the issue with white, Donchenko. Yeah, and I feel like sometimes this is a function of perhaps he missed knight d7 and felt like he had to justify his previous move. This happens sometimes. And so you kind of recklessly go forward, even though deep inside you know it's not the right time uh, to open the center. Knight f6 with tempo. He takes d5 flashy, but Farouche just recaptures back to h1 and king f8. Again, we've talked about it in several games. The king has a beautiful home on g7. Okay, queen e3. Farouche says, thank you very much. I was going there anyway, uh, but you just encouraged it. A quick uh, note, rook takes h6 for the tactical junkies who've been up early doing puzzle rush. Nope. This is not the time or place. Rook g6 and black wins. So that doesn't work. Uh, Alexander with knight b5. Wow, evaluation almost plus two here with the best move. But Rook C8, very sensible response by Feruja. He doesn't mind the trade. Uh, one of the problems here, David, that's harder to perceive is that if White Castle's kingside, um, it feels like not all of the problems are solved. Maybe White solves the problem of his king position. So, for example, let's say White takes on D6 and Castle's... Oh, wait, White's moved his king already. Oh. Oh, no, no, White's moved his king. Rook. Rook. It's the Rook. Oh, it's the... <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like the position is pretty equal after I was doing the classic commentator thing where I'm going to make the moves first and then assess the, evaluate the eval bar and then, you know, say something based on it and then realize White's already moved the rook. So that's the actual problem. 
Yeah, this is you why they paid us, us GMs the big bucks. <laughs> you and me both, Daniel. I mean, uh, yeah, I was ready to castle Kingside as well and ask, you know, okay, it might be bad, the White Queen lacking squares, there might be an attack against the White King, but what, uh, you know, why is it plus two for Black? Um, and then you realize, Black, yeah, the White King is stuck for eternity. So actually, Rook C8, yes, it was given a question mark by the uh, all seeing overlords, <laughs> the computers, but now White's King cannot castle either flank and. Wow, easy to forget <laughs> those types of details. Yeah, wow. No, White's position is... This is such a misleading assessment, point three. I actually think, given that White cannot castle, uh, this is extremely bad from a human perspective. Also, you know, under 30 minutes. How would I play this with White? I mean, I would probably go Knight takes D6 and maybe King F1 is mm -hmm. the lesser evil, at least, you know, it's not a, it's not a palace on F1, but at least it's a, it's a decent hiding spot. But also the queen side, David, is very weak. The queen could trampoline over to b6, start harassing the beat pawn. There's weaknesses all over the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Donchenko needs to be ultra, ultra accurate here if he wants to avoid a, a quick knockout. Totally agree. And uh, maybe we should also point out, uh, as Donchenko looks away, why taking on a7 uh, <laughs> would backfire. I'm assuming it backfires. Not totally <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, for some reason. I was just kind of like trying to dodge the topic, you know. <laughs> rook d7. I go back. Rook, C, rook e7 now. Yeah. Uh-oh. Oh, this is hilarious. King f1. Oh, I escaped the pin. Nope. Hello. <laughs> Queen is trapped. Yeah, so instructive variation. Um, not the most difficult once you see it, but uh, a nice trick from Ferruja. So... Um, despite Rook C8 not being maybe the top engine move, I really love the kind of layers behind it, um, this hidden idea of trapping the White Queen and uh, trying to kind of sneak your way in. The Black Rook on H8 is temporarily uh, acting as a bodyguard. The Rook on H8 is temporarily stuck uh, defending H6, so he's trying to get a Rook to the E-file. Or he's trying to <laughs> uh, find the Tempe, uh, trick his opponent into allowing that. So rook c8, and yeah, I think we both want to eliminate this uh, dark square bishop for black because if the black bishop gets one more move to retreat back to b8, then bishop pair as well as all of the other advantages. Ultimately, it's just the white king. Uh, no safe uh, haven, no refuge for it. And yeah, I'm inclined to agree. Momentum-wise, black's favor, extra nearly 10 minutes on the clock, and uh, objectively, maybe a small advantage as well. Uh, in the meantime, we do, I believe, have a result. Abdu Satorov did... Wow, Van Forest just resigned. You called it, Daniel. Yes, I just did. in that position. I had a feeling he was going to resign, and that's why I hedged my bets, and I said in the old days people would resign. But that's because the position is resignable. It's You have to understand, like, some plus three positions you wouldn't even think of resigning. This position, it's so hopeless on the board and on the clock, there is just nothing to play for. And it's it's not a case of premature resignation. It's actually totally reasonable. But what a win. What a miniature by, by Noterbeck. Incredible. Yeah, we talked about spooky season out there in The Hague. Unfortunately, it was a bit of a horror show uh, for Jordan straight from the opening. That, uh, yeah, Abdul Zatorov, though, great opening preparation, great technique. And yeah, this is a rarity. So everyone go home, study this position or screenshot it because uh, one side, elite grandmaster resigning with equal material on the board. Equal material, yeah. Nearly exactly. that happens. Um, but it is that bad, unfortunately, for Black. And uh, okay, Abdul Zatorov bouncing back from a defeat just before the rest day and uh, he's again going to be one to reckon with in the closing rounds as he aims to win the tournament after coming so close last year and that leaves us with six remaining games where to go next yeah i think uh, we yeah. should end the show there's no, nothing really else to look at you know <laughs> uh, notre big one okay we can go home now i mean we're already home back to sleep <laughs> i guess uh just kidding of course um nepo's position continues to get worse we can Check in. I think our second result might be Vidit, Gukesh versus Vidit. I, you can't pay me to look at that position more carefully. I don't think you can pay the players to look at that position, which is why they're trading all the pieces. And I think a draw is 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 imminent. Mm -hmm. um, and this position is like terminally equal um, once Vidit solved the problem of, of the diagonal. So shall we go over to your call? I'm suffering okay. from more <laughs> indecision than I do when trying to choose a restaurant or a show. <laughs> I'm going to uh, pick Magzulu against Max Varmadam because uh, there was a lot of drama there early on. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll leave the two candidates, Kukesh and Vidit, uh, in their battle. Um, yeah, we should mention the candidates is coming. They've got bigger fish to fry. And uh, no surprise with the mutual respect there that uh, that game is a bit more peaceful. 
Um, they'll fight uh, over the board in Toronto in a few months instead. Uh, but this one, uh, okay, let's do a quick count. Black is up the exchange, rook for knight. Four a pawn, white has four versus two on the king side, but black has a majority on the other flank, so that could be decisive if Dania one set of rooks disappears. If white's rook gets traded off for one of the black rooks, it's just game over. It's resigns. So um, Max Varmadam is black. Do you think he's done a good job consolidating, first of all? And secondly, do you still think he has big winning chances? Yes, I would estimate this at about 60-40. 60% winning chances, 40% uh, drawing chances, just because he's got some time issues. And um, I think Parham has, first of all, done a phenomenal job of even getting this far and giving himself serious saving chances. The issue for white is that your pawn majority is very is crippled. I mean, you have a four on two technically, but you would take the two on one any day of the week, um, particularly on Tuesday. And black not only wants to trade rooks, but black has a very simple plan of improvement. Um, you want to go at b5. And of course, ultimately, you want to target the a pawn. And you can do that by maneuvering, maneuvering a rook to a4. But it's easier said than done. White can defend from the second rank, so maybe Parham should just try to find the proper defensive setup. Go king f3, keep the rook on the second rank, and then slowly, gradually start pushing your kingside pawns and really challenge black to find the knockout blow here. So I, I think it's far from easy. Warmerdam has maybe not played perfectly here looking at the eval bar, um, but hard to say, David. Do you think 60-40 is an exaggeration? Do you think Parham is going to pull this one out? Um, yeah, I would say 60-40 is about par for this position. <laughs> uh, oh. um, uh, G4 is going to say... Going ham on the R2. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> going to hammer, par hammer the point home here. But, uh, yeah, G4, I was going to say at least creating some counterplay. It's not going to be super straightforward. And yeah, I had missed that the clock situation has kind of turned from uh, when we last left this game. Max has been investing a bunch of time Parham may be hustling on the clock already. Once he realized he was, um, I'm not going to say losing, but when he was uh, significantly worse, he's really sped up. And G4 is the type of move psychologically you start to worry. A pawn might reach G5, another pawn might reach H5, and yes, they're not going anywhere, <laughs> but um, you certainly have to kind of uh, be a bit distracted here on the other flank. I still yes. think Max is, yeah, Max is a big favorite. Once a, yeah, play B5, rook D5 to A5 looks very tempting as well, just even to slow down White's uh, kingside play. Actually, both the rooks, <laughs> as you're highlighting yes. here, Daniel, can uh, slide across rook lift. Yeah. yeah, get those boys over. But it's one of those end games where it's not entire. Black is not entirely out of danger here. Black is not. Black does not have a blank check here, mm -hmm. uh, because I've seen these types of cases where you know you get over invested in, let's say, uh, winning the a pawn, and before you know it, I mean, White's pawns are up your grill. You lose f7. This could get very tactical toward move 40. And let's not forget, white has a knight on f5. Knights have a way of delivering forks. Uh, knights are very tricky defensive pieces. So um, I don't think Max is sitting there thinking, this is in the bag. I'm, this is awesome. I actually think he might be a little bit worried here. And um, Parham's exactly the kind of guy uh, that I would trust to find the most resilient, the punchiest defensive resources here with white. Definitely. He's done a good job so far. Um, yeah, and I think this is one we'll definitely kind of follow as it hits uh, or as it reaches uh, move 40 in a bit, assuming Max will face a bit of time trouble. But my eyes have been drawn towards the Wei Yi game where yes. he's dropped a rook in the heart of his opponent's position. I think we have to take a step out of this game and uh, jump over. Um, yeah, Wei Yi. Bang! Rook E7. That is a bug house move, but it's also very strong in chess. What a move, and he is just blowing through white black's resistance here. And I just want to point out um, games where a uh, single bad piece just kind of epitomizes the extent of your misery. This knight still on d7, still with no prospects, still completely ruining black's coordination. This is um, the sort of uh, cause, one of the causes of black's. Uh, misery in this position. Rook e7 is crushing, David, because if, and obviously I will show this after rook takes e7, d takes e7, king takes e7, I don't think it's anything cataclysmic. I was even briefly, my eye was caught by bishop a2 and queen a3, but <laughs> I think there's a simpler way to do it. Uh, is it just rook e1 and knight d6? Yeah, it looks that way. It looks like there's going to be collapse on the f7 square. 
I do wonder about queen d2 counterplay in this position, so I don't know if you can finesse the uh, idea slightly, maybe queen e2 check and then knight d6, um, with the idea of firstly knight takes f7, but also just rook e1 and mm -hmm. come in, checkmate. It looks Excellent. like black is just frozen. Black is zugzwang, stalemated, I don't know what the right analogy is here, but... <laughs> Queen g4, queen maybe g4. I can try to trade queens, but if I probably dodge, white queen, is... Queen uh -huh. e3. Oh, yeah, I have no moves. Again, I can't go back to g5. <laughs> Repetition. <laughs> queen g5, queen e2. Um, Literally yeah, no resigns. moves, right? Just tricky one. Bishop f7, knight f7. This game yeah. is over Red Rover. This is a picture of domination. I mean, you mentioned the knight on d7, the knight on f6 just can't move either. Um, no. Yeah power of the bishop on b3 just too strong wow rookie wow, seven jan is getting destroyed this game yeah i mean he literally just played king f8 to stop this idea mm -hmm. and imagine how gut-wrenching it is to see your opponent play it anyway uh, that's always tough in chess you think you've stopped you think you've covered a square so many times that uh prevents your opponent oh from they... david i i just have to show Oof. this is what i do if black plays queen takes b5 this is time for the mate hunters to come out. Oh, nice. Among among many other wins, rook f7 and knight e5. And, oh, you can't get away with queen takes f6 first. That <laughs> plays g takes three. But knight g6 mate is uh, good enough. And one of many uh, beautiful mates in this position. I actually think queen takes h5. Yeah, probably. I was. <laughs> no, I was queen takes b3. No. This is hilarious. Oh. Black actually defends. This is why you shouldn't troll. I mean, serious note for players if you see a mate, Go for the mate. Um, my coach would always tell me, you're not writing a tactics book, you're trying to win the game. Um, and it's very, very important to avoid falling too in love with your position and always go for the most objective win. Um, when you play a little bit too much for beauty, you run the risk of missing some fluke, some random move, and you know then you regret the day you were born. So does black have any way to prolong the game? Maybe you can avoid taking on e7. I mean, I, mean, I think, hate even I think raising the prospect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rook takes f7 is just a, a, a threat in all these types of positions. I mean, h4 might be a threat. Kick the queen away and then Rook takes f7, those mating mm -hmm. patterns he showed. And he has gone for it. He has bitten the bullet and taken um, on that square. Yeah, queen e2. Lovely finesse, preventing perhaps the last source of counterplay that Jan is relying on. Of course, Rook e1 was also quite good, as we saw, but. There's a big difference. I think queen e2 is actually super important uh, to prevent. Um, perhaps black can still resist, but um, queen e2 maintains a firmly decisive advantage. Yeah, so picturesque, that position. Full dominance of the whole board, queen e2 check. It's all really forcing as well. So this linear calculation we talked about earlier uh, coming into play, Wei Yi. I mean, firstly, to force yourself to look at rookie 7 as a move, uh, from there it oh. kind of... Ooh, slight, ooh, I wouldn't say slip, but um, not what we expected. Any any hope for Jan now? Maybe we investigate knight d6 check. Yes, uh, let's D6 take a look. D2. I mean, I also walked into this because it's your hand is reaching for the rook. You want to activate the rook, but you also always want to you know put on your, your Soviet schoolboy hat and uh, make sure that you're preventing counterplay. And yeah, queen d2 will be blitzed out by Jan. And maybe we saw this and has some intended response uh, what could it be rook d1 has to defend his rook on the d4 pawn i guess oh but the evaluation yes. Oof. but ah maybe it's take no queen b4 not... maybe queen b4 knight f7 and then think <laughs> um, yeah, now rook e8 yeah. rook e1 is that any counterplay knight h8 yeah i'm scared of your all your checkmates. No, but it's actually, it, this move makes a lot of noise, but it's not that good. I mean, Black had even played g5 mm -hmm. with some luft on g7. Yeah, and, and even rookie one check is no longer mate anymore on the back rank. I have e8. It's getting messy, right? This is exactly what you want to avoid if you're way You want to avoid this messy position where it's easy to blunder. Um, okay, so this is not convincing. Rook d1 is out. What else is there? I really didn't want to go like queen f2. Wow. I just got a helping hand from our producer. So I'm not going to spoil it for you, Daniel, but there is a strong move to maintain the advantage. And it's not rook d1. It's not queen f2. Okay, let's give me just a second to think. Okay. 
I mean, I saw Queen C3 also, but... I don't think I would find this... Uh, at least maybe now, in this position. Rookie but 4? But... Just King F1. Just King don't <laughs> Wow. Oh, yeah, it makes sense, of course. Yeah, King F1, of course, obviously. <laughs> I mean, I'm not yeah, even cause... sure why this is strong, but <laughs> apparently it's the best move. I guess because it, it curbs the counterplay as much as possible. But wait, let me ask, what if Queen takes D4? Okay, of course, I understand the evaluation bar is just laughing in my face. Ah, look at this. Knight F7, rook E8, and I actually think black and white can just take on E8. Okay, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Mate, wow. Oh, my God, this is gorgeous. Mate with three pieces. And if black takes with a knight, then there's obviously like a million discovered checks and even yeah. the primitive. Knight five. Yeah, knight E5, knight G5, everything is winning. Yeah, looks like mate. And um, wow. Okay, so maybe this has been spotted by Wei Yi. He has indeed played knight d6, but it feels so, I'm not going to say bizarre, so odd to have seen king f1 in this whole variation when you could have prevented all of this calculation with queen e2. And like, you, I mean, maybe it's just the lazy side of me is thinking, okay, queen e2, no threats, no counterplay, big advantage maintained. Uh, compared to this, which literally relies move on move on seeing uh, King F1, which is uh, not obvious draw. at all. And in the meantime, we have a result, a draw, uh, draw peace treaty between Ding and Giri. Well, that is The Hague. This is the place for peace treaties. <laughs> <laughs> that was criminal, uh, agreeing a draw on this position. <laughs> Very good. Wow, okay, and we will recap the final position there because it looks like, um, Okay, was it Ding who offered the draw? Was that a repetition? Um, I will try to repetition. get that up. Okay, draw by repetition. Yes. B6. Okay, looks like Anish might have been slightly better. Ah, Queen E7, tricky move. Knight C6. I guess there's Queen E8. Queen is hanging, so... This looks like a classic like computer repetition. Mm hmm Yes, understandable, I think, from Anish, because he has the black pieces, and you're playing the world champion. Maybe he could have pressed in the final position, but with a knight on e5, I totally get it from a practical standpoint. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, all the side. Yeah, big relief for Ding. I mean, look at the clock. He was down to 19 minutes uh, before these kind of repetitions started happening. He still had a bunch of moves to make before the time control. Loose pawns for white, weak pawns everywhere, all the islands, uh, d4, f4, h3. But uh, ultimately, yeah, no big blunders, no big mistakes. And Daniel gives us opportunity to focus on the other battles uh, still in yes. play. So we can't complain too much. Um, good result for both players. Absolutely not. We have plenty of action um, to last us the rest of the round. Okay, queen d2 has been found by Jan. Now the big moment. Will Wei Yi pull out this king f1 move, and even then it's not over, but clearly he's allowed quite a bit of counterplay. I see things continuing to heat up in uh, the Prague game. Uh, we can definitely revisit that board. Alexander Donchenko maybe stabilizing his position a little bit against Ferruja, walking on hot coals there. Where do we go from here? It's been a while since we've checked out the Prague game. Yeah, I think it's time. Uh, that from the start, from move four, as soon as the fried liver attack landed on the board, uh, yeah, it feels like uh, this one has been one to watch. And, okay, a question mark attached to Zhu Wenjun's last move. I think it was a difficult position anyway, very easy to go wrong. Um, irrational was the word of the game so far. But why is this a mistake? Which way does Prague recapture? Still a pawn up for white. Does he take with a queen? Try to simplify down to a pure endgame or queenless middle game, or whatever you choose to call it. Or does he take back with a pawn and uh, maybe open up the g-file, go for the black king? Um, I don't know. It's actually not an easy decision at all. Mm -hmm. um, queen takes f3 is very comfortable. It's a very tempting move. Um, uh, my vote would probably be queen takes f3, just intuitively. Um, yeah. But something tells me that probably means pawn takes f3 is the best move. <laughs> There's a simple formula for determining like what the best move is. It's just What is your intuition? Okay, it's the other move. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me attempt it. Hmm? Okay. Okay. Maybe this queen takes f3. Yeah. Doesn't <laughs> react. So getting the queens off, and yeah, if the queens disappear, queen takes f3. Now we'd probably take with the pawn, and white has everything covered. Extra material. Actually, six in the air. 
Black's position a bit loose, no outposts for the bishops, really. Yeah, this one looks... Uh, okay, the lazy commentator phrase, a matter of technique. <laughs> and, yes, um, exactly. The rest requires little to no commentary. <laughs> yeah, and then you add were list, like 60 moves. <laughs> yeah, if this was a book, we annotate the first 20 moves of the game and then we <laughs> leave the rest for the reader. Um, exactly. The, 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 the rest will be left as an exercise, improving your understanding. We suggest that you commentate the rest in your own notebook. <laughs> okay, but Prague has played GF, and okay. it turns out that both moves are completely acceptable. Yeah. Given Black's horrendous, calamitous time situation, I think GF is uh, very practical. Queen could come to G2, pressure down the G file, and our daily, hourly reminder that White is still up a pawn. Yeah, and it's actually hard to find any natural moves here for Black. You want to profit from the pin on the e-file potentially, but the white queen just moves. <laughs> like bishop f7, she just shifts, queen g2. And actually, there's just nothing to grip onto uh, for black at all. Not h5 is an outpost, I guess. You could try and kind of plug the king side by defending g7 like this, but put a pawn on f4, put a knight on g3, but mm -hmm. doesn't feel like it's uh, playing on the right side of the board. You're just hitting thin air, if anything. I mean, you're playing on the right side of the board, but yeah. literally, but not not figuratively. <laughs> yeah, you um, wish you could play on the left side here, but <laughs> yes, but I'm not, not sure that's the right side. side. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe c4. I was uh, inspired to try this move, but I actually think at a minimum I can play knight takes c4. Mm -hmm. um, and the, this is just depressing. There's, like you said, nothing to latch on to. Um, it's not one of those sharp, you know, double-edged positions where you're objectively worse, but you can fight. It just feels like once white consolidated, the situation went downhill for black. You know, looking at the previous few moves, we won't uh, delve into the particulars. Maybe Jun and Jun had chances to turn the game around, but practically it's it's so, so difficult. You're down a pawn. Um, your opponent has fully consolidated. Uh, you've got no time. I think this one is, I don't want to say decided, but... I mean, barring barring a big, big blunder by Prague, looks like Black is going down in this one. Yeah, it's hard to disagree with that. And you can see on the camera body language, Xu and Xu, and she knows, unfortunately. I mean, she's not done much wrong. I just have to pinpoint the opening, Prague's superior preparation. And um, yeah, it feels like she's bemused as well about this. I'm wondering who's watching this game, the dark, headless shadow of... And Ishigiri, potentially. <laughs> but yes. uh, anyway, that was, <laughs> he's gone. And uh, in this starry, starry night, unfortunately, Xu Wenjun is not going to save this game. Yes. Well yeah. said. Big advantage for Pragnananda. Okay. Yeah, he's just so impressive. And if I, I mean, not just 41 game on beaten streak, maybe about to become 42. If I remember correctly, he's one of only two undefeated players in the field alongside. Uh, his good friend Vidit. So both just bring their A game before the candidates. Um, shaping up nicely for that uh, that highlight of the year, Daniel. I mean, listen, I the way Prague is playing right now, the supreme confidence, the preparation, he's got, I, I, like I said, as good of a chance as any in the candidates. I think a lot of people who ask for candidates' predictions, they don't really understand the nature of the candidates. It's a lottery. It's a complete toss-up. It's one tournament. Anybody can win it. Um, so it's it's really impossible to give any meaningful uh, predictions. But, I mean, in so far as you set yourself up for success, uh, people, everybody's afraid of Prague. He's just improving before our very eyes. And uh, if he brings the same level to Toronto, um, I think he's got a serious shot. Very, very exciting uh, to watch Prague, Prague develop um, just yeah. day by day, literally. Yeah, and uh, I mean, the candidates, I agree, like when I make predictions, it's uh, it's impossible. Uh, there's eight phenomenally strong players. But then you do think back and you uh, kind of realize, oh, Nepomnishi won two in a row. Anand won uh, after being deposed as world champion. Like there's a few others. It's like experience counts. And uh, it does feel like experience is key. But this might be finally the year where the breakthrough from the younger uh, generation happens. Uh, suddenly, they've all started qualifying Prague, Gokesh, and uh, et al. And 
Yes. Yeah, he's hard to, he's hard to rule against. Either the yes, experience yes, of Nepal tall. Or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> tall. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, he's I mean, going into twenty twenty four, it looks like he's just red hot form. And Xu Wenjun's still in thought, still tough, tough position, unfortunately. No obvious moves. Yeah, I think yeah, uh, no we leave her to it. Big advantage for White. Okay. Um, well, mm -hmm. we have almost a draw in Gukesh versus Vidit. I think that one is moments away from finishing. Um, we have some developments in Danchenko versus Feruja. And we see that Wei Yi actually did not find the most precise move, King F1. Instead, he played Queen C3, which I thought was actually very, very natural. Um, but maybe gives Jan more more saving chances. So maybe we, uh, we spoke a little bit too soon on that game. Looks like Wei Yi might have let the tiger out of the cage a little bit. Yeah, he's uh, gone from totally winning to a advantage, and it looks like an endgame advantage. Uh, the queens are off. Jan shakes his head down on the camera, um, so he knows he's still in for a bunch of suffering, but it looks like White's about to win a pawn. Um, so Wei Yi will check back in on a bit later. Um, okay, Zhu Wenjun has eventually moved. She did play knight h5, as we expected. Oh. Um Okay, Mag Sudlu still fighting hard. Wow, okay, we're closing in on the time control. Um, the player's now all around the half hour mark or less. <laughs> so where to go? What do you think is going to hit the most drama as we build up to move 40, Daniel? Yeah, actually, Mag Sudlu's game, it, it may appear like a slow burn, but it's heating up pretty quickly. So let's take a quick look at this one. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard to predict. Also, Donchenko in serious time pressure. Uh, so it seems we're always in this situation. It's hard to say which direction the games are going to pivot. Okay, I'm trying to get a grasp on this crazy position, which is about to get a whole lot crazier, because Parham has just said, go take my pawn. Amazingly, he sacrificed day two. And this is exactly what I meant. Prague, or, or Parham, I mean, Prague would probably find this too. But Parham always finds you know, the most unpleasant resource, the most annoying move. What happens if Black takes on A2? I think he wants knight f6, takes h7, and that crippled pawn majority I talked about, I mean, it starts, it's a clunker, but you know, these pawns start moving forward. It's scary. I mean, Black could lose this. Yeah. For the first time in this game, Max has a bit of doubt in his mind. Wow. I mean, what a race that would be. Black's two kind of unrivaled pawns running down the queen side, and White's four versus one majority just marching up the other flank. I mean, like you say, that just becomes pure random uh, randomness. That becomes a bit of a guessing game. <laughs> the accuracy levels will like <laughs> plummet if that happens. Um, I wonder if there's any other way to keep control. Often you want to control knights with bishops, so bishop e7 comes to mind just to stop knight f6 ideas. A bit slow. Uh, definitely not the most ambitious move, probably not the best one, but would it keep some semblance of control in the build-up to move 40? Yes, I think he must be very tempting for Max. I mean, bishop e7 is the sit by the fireplace, you know, the glass of wine kind of move. The problem just visually, if I, I'll put this on the board. I mean, Max is still thinking, um, and he shows no signs of moving pretty disturbingly. Um, I think here Parham will, in fact, defend the pawn rook b2. And in a nutshell, the issue is that Black struggles to gain traction with his pieces. It's hard to find a spot for the other rook. I mean, okay, you could play something like rook d8, but white, again, has a very clear plan. It's a slow plan. It's not a visually appealing plan, but it is a plan um, to start just pushing these pawns, f5, g5. Okay, you have to determine the right order. Maybe you start with g5. I don't know. Um, but eventually, once you get the pawns to f5 and h5, you will be ready to create a passer. Um, maybe black can use some tactics, try to get the rook around to a4. But, I mean, even if white sacks uh, the a pawn, in some situations, you could already get away with that. Um, and imagine calculating that with almost no time, David. This is this is scary for black. This is getting This is getting dicey. Yeah, and in these positions, it's actually better not to have been completely winning earlier, as Max knows he yeah. has been, because it's it's momentum. It's it's like you're winning, you're winning, you're coasting, and then suddenly, oh gosh, there's counterplay. Um, so yeah, it's just the panic. And as you say, seven minutes now is still. I mean, that's not much at all. Yes, we're deep in the end game, but still plenty of time before the time control, and it's. Uh, I mean, it's not a just basic end game where you can play on feel and instinct. It's pure calculation. Um, yeah, I think I would, I'd play bishop b7, just the coward in me, but rook takes yeah. a2. It feels like the principled move, and at some point you just have to stop calculating and just trust that 
you're going to be ahead in the race. Um, after all, black still up in material should be able to bail out later on. Um, give up some material for white's uh, pawn mass. I mean, but... yeah, rook takes e4 also a cannon move by the way, and rook takes a2. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's just about risk reward there. Like you get rid of the knight, but you keep your pawns. Yeah, maybe rook takes e4. Um, in a blitz game, I think that's the way you keep control and just kind of make your moves easy, natural. But of course. A bit of a drag to have to give back your material uh just yeah. like that yeah it's this doesn't actually stop white's plan i mean you don't really need the knights um you're absolutely right i think jonathan rosen a scottish gm talks about this concept of the trend of the game now, the evaluation can be very misleading um, when taken in a vacuum but as you said when you factor in uh the fact that black was seemingly completely winning out of the opening and that putting away that excitement that maybe i'm going to win a miniature maybe you know, I'm going to win that 15 move game with black and suddenly you're for the first time facing the prospect of maybe losing the game um, is is terrifying. And that often accelerates the the path to panic and potentially a blunder. And as we're talking, he's down to six minutes. So hard to make a decision here. It's impossible. It's This position is just opaque. You have to trust your intuition. Yeah, rook takes a2, obviously the principled move. Knight f6 instantly blitzed out. Now in this position, the exchange sack is quite a bit more appealing. Rook takes e3 check, but still not confident that this is the way to go uh, for, for black. F takes e3, and uh, the black rook can be chased out of the h file. Wow. Yeah, not easy at all. Maybe rook takes c3 would uh, yeah, minimize the risk, but also lower your winning chances. Um, yeah, it's just frustrating. The white rook will hold up the black queenside pawns, and there's not much holding up white's uh, pawns on the other side of the board. So. Um, yeah, I don't envy Max at all. Big, big decision, six minutes and counting. And yeah, for Parham, it's not just the momentum, it's just his moves are automatic. He's got nothing else to do. He has to go all in with his pawns. Um, so yeah, I'm expecting the rook to move. I think Max is still going to try and uh, be uh, maximalist about this position and uh, <laughs> keep his extra material. But yeah, all, all bets are off in this one. It's gone from a winning endgame to... Yeah, a bit of a guessing game right now for Black. This is what these top players do. And another game that's um, wilding is Donchenko Ferruja, another potential time scramble. I don't know if uh, we have to take a small break or can we do we jump in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, you're right. That's the game we'll go to next. Uh, actually, we want to touch on all of them as uh, the clocks are ticking down, but it is time for our last break. As we reach the last break before move 40, I should say, as we reach the Some commentators need to use the bathroom. Excellent. <laughs> That's right. So go uh, do your thing, everyone at home. Go get some snacks, some popcorn. We'll be back very shortly Buckle for up. the rest of the action. So d4, d5, c4. This is the Queen's Gambit and this is the starting position for this course. My name is Kamil Plichta, I am a Fide Master from Poland. This course is going to be suitable for people of all levels, especially since I'm going to teach you attacking play, aggression in chess, gambits, compensation, all kinds of dynamism imbalances, and in general we have one target this guy here on e8. You might be like, yeah, this has to be some marketing stuff, it's impossible, come on, you just can't attack with d4. Think about it. Aliehin, Kasparov, Botvinnik, Mamediarov. They played d4, it was their main opening, so I suggest queen e2. This is a better way of playing. We are hitting the knight, the knight goes to f6, and now we are not slowing down. We sacrifice the second guy with d5. D is a big threat, so takes, and rook d1. And just see this, for the cost of two pawns, we already have huge pressure on black's position, and after bishop e7, knight c3, black really has to walk a tightrope to survive this. There are 9 games featuring this position, a white score is 7 out of 9.
Welcome back everyone to round nine of the Tata Steel Masters where we do have another update. It was a peaceful result, a draw and a handshake between Gukesh and Vidip, but we're still left with plenty of excitement and potentially some important results. And uh, Danya, not at all surprised by that draw, uh, the two Indian candidates. Yes, it was in the category of professional draw. Just uh, not too many twists in terms. Good preparation by Vidit. Uh, he is undefeated uh, along with Prague, and there's nothing wrong with playing a solid event. Um, he's on plus one. He's showing good form. And uh, for Gukesh, not maybe the result that he was hoping for. Uh, maybe he was hoping to put a little bit more pressure on his compatriot. But yeah, just a classic super grandmaster draw. No, no surprises there. But as you said, as we look at our bird's eye view, um, still more than half of the game's going. Um, and a lot of them uh, with still the most exciting phase uh, likely yet to come. Yeah, and uh, this is chess on tour, and we are left with four uh, four remaining games. <laughs> Good news for Indian fans, Pragnananda on the brink victory against Xu Wenjun, Wei Yi pushing an advantage in the end game against Nepomnishi. Will he be able to convert that? And potentially a turnaround, Donchenko against Feruja. Yes. Feruja losing control. Feruja very much seems to be losing control. Its position is almost uh, unrecognizable uh, compared to what it was a couple of moves ago. Somehow, White's King has slid over to G1, even though Castle is illegal. Um, King made its way to its destination. Donchenko suddenly has a very appealing position. Be I mean, Bishop is on E2, and it doesn't seem to be there by choice. And this is insane. I mean, it looks like move by move, Ali Reza overpressed a little bit and now it's white uh who's very much in the driver's seat what's going on here yeah it feels like he's messed around a bit too much with his uh bishop the bishop you're mentioning there uh daniel and also the black queen a bit offside the action in the action looks like it's about to start happening on the king side maybe he needed to put his bishop on e2 to protect the g4 pawn but um yeah just a bit too slow a bit too tentative and uh donchenko now if you can somehow activate the white rook mm. on b1 the white knight on d2 if those ever join the action the other white pieces are poised um so you just bring pieces into the attack and i can feel your tactical uh, eye has been uh, <laughs> has been woken up here yeah, yeah, tactical... it feels like <laughs> yes. i i'm really uh partial to this idea maybe it doesn't work but i'm just going to show this rookie one and of course the critical move is queen takes b2 and i think Man, I cannot catch a break with the eval bar today, but my idea was rook takes e2, um, rook takes e2, and rook takes g4 check. Um, and king f8 runs into queen d6, but actually I think the reason it's drawn is because, insanely enough, king f6, queen takes e2, king takes f5, and white has no discovered check. g4, the king dodges to g6. At queen e5 check, the king also moves to g6. Um, and somehow it's a bit of a dead end. But Donchenko has gone a different route, literally. Uh, he's gone the C-file route and said, Rook to C1, I totally get it. He is trying to avoid the traffic, uh, the congestion on the E-file. He wants that Rook on C7. And he's starting to surround. I mean, that Rook takes H6 idea that we were laughing at earlier uh, starts to become a slightly more serious threat uh, with uh, Rook G6 unavailable. Potentially, this is really disturbing for Ali Reza. Wow, I, I mean, brilliant move there from Donchenko. Will he get his first win of the event? Um, I mean, I think we need to show that uh, Daniel is such a big threat. If Black gets again greedy, uh, if yes. Black gets uh, happy about munching pawns, takes on B two, then is this just unstoppable? Rook takes H six. Not many ways to defend against it. So you're saying it just works in this position? Wow, Rook takes an amazingly Queen A one check. You think, ah, king h2, I capture with check, but no, I can just shut you down with knight b1. Amazing. And just to show everybody, earlier on, there was always this resource rook g6, but not here. Queen takes g6 is just mate uh, in, in a few moves. So, my goodness, it's not the kind of plus one position where, okay, you can survive, you can get into an endgame and sip your coffee. It's Donchenko who, who sips his coffee. He is the danger in this position. Rook e7, David, is... Okay, appealing is the wrong word. Maybe necessary in order to prevent rook c7, but it 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 feels like black is falling apart here. It feels loose, and rook e7, I'm already looking at rook c8 deflection. Uh, Ooh. I mean, 
There's oh. all, all sorts of stuff in the air. Vroom, vroom, vroom. <laughs> this is scary for Ferruja, who's not just had an up and down game here, maybe having the advantage and then letting it slip, but he's had an up and down tournament. And uh, I just wanted to highlight Ferruja, uh, who goes into today's round as one of the joint leaders, but um, winning, losing, it feels like he's come into this event to fight. And unfortunately for him in this position, maybe uh, just uh, backfiring slightly because this, are, uh, this is his percentage probability before each round of winning the event. He started with 12.9%. Uh, things went up. Things went down after defeats in round five and seven. And suddenly, uh, back as one of the favorites to win the event, 22% prediction rate. But it all depends on him holding this game, surviving this game against one of the lower seeds and it does not look that way currently. Uh, yeah, he's in fighting mood, Dania, but fortunately in this one, uh, big, big trouble now ahead. Amazing how, how quickly games can turn um, and how quickly these dynamic advantages can turn. When your advantage depends on something that's changeable, like king position, the moment the, the opponent manages to solve that problem, uh, the situation flips because positionally, black has so many weaknesses on the king side. And now that finally starts to make its presence felt, wow, Donchenko's pieces suddenly look so beautiful, whereas five moves ago, uh, it looked like his coordination was destroyed. Pretty amazing, uh, the roller coaster ride of this game, which epitomizes uh, Ali Reza's tournament very nicely. Yeah, the Black King is soon under fire, fire Rosa. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Black King's in big trouble. And um, yeah, unfortunately, I think body language again. We saw a brief shake of the head. Uh, from Alareza here, he's starting to realize maybe he hadn't envisaged this threat. It's like two, three move threat, rook c7, followed by rook takes h6. And uh, it's dawning on him now. You can see on the camera 10 minutes to fight off this attack with uh, a bunch of moves still to go. We're at move 29. We see top left corner of your screens how much time he spent on this move. Big investment, four minutes when you've only got nine left. And uh, still a long, long way to go to reach the safety of move 40. I have a feeling. I mean, this is so hard for a human that we might see a mistake, and understandably so, in the next few moves. Uh, because how do you even defend this? How do you dream about defending this as black? Um, well, lesser men have achieved greater feats. But, I mean, this is the funny thing. Sometimes when I'm in a lost position, I tell myself, okay, Magnus saved position X against a stronger player. I can do this. But when you're like this lost, you start wondering, no, I, I think this Mag even Magnus probably wouldn't be able to save this position. Um, maybe bishop back to d3. Uh, you need some way to uh, to throw a spanner in the works to to prevent this this horrible torture mechanism, rook c7, and rook takes h6. And if you can't prevent the rook from coming to c7, maybe you can try to get this bishop off the board. But bishop d3 runs into rook c5. You have to slide back to a6. This is all very tenuous and potentially all very terrible. Yeah, very minimum there. White could just whip off a pawn on g4, bishop takes g4, and Why not? Uh, say material up and with an attack. That's, uh, again, very minimum. Uh, so Ferruja, he's trying to pull the brake now. He's trying to go into reverse gear and try to uh, cling on these next few moves, but it might be too late. He might have already committed the decisive errors. Uh, brilliant play from Donchenko. This is why, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Dania, earlier, no underdogs here. You can't underestimate anyone. They're ready to pounce. Anyone can beat anyone in this field. Yes, and Donchenko has shown it with uh, his near win against uh, Nepo, where Nepo escaped just with some absolutely otherworldly uh, defense. But Donchenko is just one of those 2650s that nobody wants to face. He's a very classy player. He's maybe lacking a little bit in opening preparation, uh, maybe in some concrete moments, he performs worse than his super GM counterparts, David. But when, when he wakes up on the right side of the bed, um, he is very much capable of uh, fighting toe-to-toe -to -toe, uh, with these guys. This is huge moment here. Can Ali Reza pull off a miracle save here? With every ticking second, it is seeming less likely. This Rook E7, Rook C8 detail, also very, very important. Um, such a devastating feeling for Ali Reza. Yeah, and look at that nervous glance towards the clock. Yeah, it's not getting... Time is not adding. Time has a way of ticking down. Yeah, he's literally spent half of his remaining time on this one move, and understandably so, but uh, that's also potentially terminal. 
Um, so we'll wait maybe a few more seconds to see if Alareza makes a move against the Don. Donchenko uh, just attacking furiously now against the Black King. But uh, yes, it's unlikely gonna, that there's any save. He's going to draper his rook all over Black's position. <laughs> um, and Perugia will be a madman if he loses this game. Oh, that's yeah, that's too layered. <laughs> <laughs> that's a uh, classy classy uh pun there i wouldn't i wouldn't betty on it though oh wow wow now you're giving me a craving to watch Mad Men. like <laughs> it's been a while good show yeah great show and yeah he's gonna be mad about his position for sure um okay donchenko you can see as well on the camera wow farouj is not hiding his emotions at all i was gonna say donchenko is gaining a confidence he's kind of realizing yeah this is a decisive advantage um, I actually think the evaluation bar is deceptive here. I mean, maybe black is worse if you find a narrow path uh, to that worst position. You might just lose a couple of pawns in the process. Uh, it might already be uh, over psychologically. He's mm -hmm. suffering. I think the next game to end probably will be Ju and June, who is mm -hmm. hopelessly lost. But we don't we don't have to go there. I mean, it's nothing has changed in that board. It's just dead lost uh, for the women's world champion. Um, should we stay here and wait for Farouja's move? I mean, he spent eight minutes. In this eight position, minutes. which is crazy, he has five minutes left. He doesn't see a move. And it's one of those things you want, you're like, move, you have to move. And he's telling himself that too. He's like, I have to make a move. But you don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I, Bishop d3 might be the only only way to keep the game going. Yeah, I agree. You just has to bite the bullet, play Bishop d3, hope to trade pieces, hope that Donchenko's technique isn't uh, too ruthless. Um, but he's frozen. Uh, he just... Yeah, he can't bring himself to make that commitment, give up a pawn. And uh, I say give up a pawn, maybe there's something even better for white there. So, mm -hmm. okay, we'll wait. If, we'll, I was going to say wait a few more seconds, but now over nine minute think. And in the meantime, as you say, Pragnananda is about to force resignation from Zhu and June. So maybe we do jump over there mm -hmm. just to explain uh, what's going to sure. happen. But we will follow the time scramble with uh, Farouja in desperate, desperate dire straits right now. Yeah, speaking of dire straits, okay, three minutes on Black's clock for like a hundred moves, but that's it. Could it might as well be seven hours. Uh, Prague is actually now only up one pawn, but the problem is that Black has no good way to defend against uh, Rook takes G seven. Um, Rook E seven runs into Bishop B four pin. Rook F seven. There's a fork. Queen F six maybe. No, but then Queen H. Oh, oh, look at this win, David. Oof. Queen F six. <laughs> Queen H two. Queen f7. Beautiful. Oh my god, this is insane. Queen takes h5, yeah. Not the only win, but definitely the flashiest. Yeah. Um, is there a mate here? Um, there must be a mate. Oh, just <laughs> somehow, yeah, some combination of rook moves. But even rook g5, rook takes h5 is the lazy man's approach. Yeah. Uh, pl plenty is sufficient. Um, or just yeah. rook g1, just build up, bring the other rook into the action. And <laughs> Very nice. Oh, this is beautiful. But, but uh, yeah, this would be game over and i mean this is just one of many right uh so many attacking ideas here it's all about the g7 square and actually we called it earlier with the dark square bishop white's dark square bishop has been the mvp the most valuable piece this whole game and um unfortunately for june june nothing <laughs> is going to save her here yes and uh she's down below two minutes just coming to terms with uh the hopelessness of the position she might try one or two moves but it's it's not going to help her. Another smooth win by Prague. And yeah, B3. You know, that Fian Kettle looked really awkward, but it's looking real good now. Um, yeah. You know, you're not always cool in the moment, but um, then afterward, everybody jumps on the bandwagon. That bishop yeah, he, beautifully coordinated. He made it work. He had to play some awkward moves. He had to contort himself uh, like a real... <laughs> A great contortionist, but yeah, somehow it worked. His pieces unraveled, and uh, Black's King is doomed. Under well, about to tip under one minute now. Zhu and June. So I think we stay here just to see either the handshake or her next move, and uh, how quickly Prague capitalizes. But ultimately, this is a white win. Uh, Prague looking up and away to a screen. He knows that he has this one in the bag. Inspired opening choice. This is really romantic chess as well. Seeing this type of fried liver attack. It's rare at the top level these days, but nice to see the players revisit these historic uh, lines and get success from them. And um, yeah, you can see realization on Zhu Wenju's face. Now down to just 30 something seconds on her clock. Oof, handshake. Do you think now is this the moment? There's just no way to fight on. 
Yes. No, Queen E7. I think she's going to play Queen E7 first. Oh, look. Great prediction by the commentator. <laughs> um, what does she want against Bishop B4? Maybe that will be the moment. Uh, yes, to resign. <laughs> yeah, the hand will be extended. I mean, yeah, there's a thousand moves. Queen H2, rookie. Uh, Prague is the kind of guy who will go like rook D1 here and really sit on the position. I think this is the way the young generation plays. They don't cash in their chips. They play for maximum. I mean, Queen H2, I'm very partial to because it's such a aesthetically pleasing move. Yeah. Um, but white has quite the menu of options here. Yeah, and uh, Prague has 16 minutes. So... Uh, yeah, all of these moves just tip over the black defense. They, uh, yeah, no way to stabilize for black at all. The king too weak. So maybe it is time to move over to the other games. This one's essentially decided as uh, Prague just chooses how to finish it off. And mm -hmm. uh, in the meantime, okay, Wei Yi doing extremely well. Um, Furuja did find bishop to d3, so fighting, uh, still with four minutes on his clock. Uh, but maybe it's time for Wei Yi against Nepomishi. How big is White's advantage over there? Uh, both players with around 11 minutes in the end game. But uh, just a brief check in at that board. Yes, let's have a closer look. Um, and of course, we're keeping an eye on the Ferruja game. We'll get back there as soon as Donchenko makes a move. Okay, King F4 on the board. Of course, Wei didn't play ultra accurately, but I think he's doing enough to maintain the decisive advantage. Black is just tied hand and foot. And again, our hourly reminder is Knight on D7. Still a terrible piece. The knights are just totally impotent here, and so is the pawn on a3. Um, and yes, there is a pawn on a3, but I'm not sure how it got there, but I don't think it's going any further. Yeah, I mean, superfluous knights, useless knights, terrible knights, they're both actually mm -hmm. going to start getting hit soon. White has ideas such as marching the g-pawn down the board. I wouldn't be surprised if Wei Yi marches his king the whole way in for glory. King g5, king h6 and uh, closes a mating net around the Black King. Uh, but yeah, essentially, it's just immobilized. Black has no active moves. And like you say, actually, it's hard to find even one. <laughs> it's actually, the more I look at it, the more it dawns on me that Black actually might be an actual Zugzwang in like the conventional definition where every move harms your position actively. Okay, maybe you can move the Rook, Rook a8. Mm -hmm. um, how would you proceed? Would you take on f7 with the Knight? Would you press forward with King g5? Oh, yeah, like, it's like asking me to choose my favorite ice cream flavor. <laughs> I just want all of them. Uh, so, yeah, unfortunately for black, yeah, once the rook moves away, knight takes f7, even bishop takes f7, everything's uh, available. Uh, probably just take with the knight. He does move his rook back. And Time just for impressive. Way to choose his favorite ice cream flavor. <laughs> exactly. Impressive self control. I just wanted to say, Daniel, from where you, that f7 pawn's been hanging for like 10 moves, but he didn't even want it. Uh, he knows it's not running away anytime soon. Um, yeah, maybe just bring the king in. Or play g4 or something. <laughs> just improve. And black is stuck. Yeah, bishop f7. Very concrete move, but also looks good. a2. I said the pawn wouldn't go further, but even if it does, it can be uh, mopped up by the rook and the bishop. Maybe. Yeah, not sure there's a way to go wrong here, but I like your move, king g5. Just to improve to the maximum. Mm -hmm. And just to show... Yeah, knight h7, king h6, game is over. King g7, I think you have rookie 7 mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, Closing in I the kill. king g5, probably the most accurate, just avoiding unnecessary complications. Yeah, knight takes f7, nothing wrong with that one either. But uh, okay, in the meantime, this is a long-term winning advantage uh, for white, for Wei Yi. Okay, Shall we go back to Ferrugia because we thought he was in big, big trouble and uh, his clock is ticking down below the four minute mark now. Uh, Magzu Logan's Farmadam, we will update you on, but maybe uh, at least uh, surprisingly, considering considering how that started, uh, that one is roughly in the balance. Okay, question mark from Donchenko, but he's won a pawn. Yes, how dare you take this free pawn on g4 with your bishop? I mean, who would ever do such a thing? <laughs> Yeah, and the Black King's still super weak. At least now, I guess, Black can park a bishop on g6. Ferruja, though, looking away in anger uh, at what he's done to his position. Pawn down and nearly nine minutes down on the clock. Oof, tough yep. times. Bishop g6, I think White can play. I was really angling for an opportunity to get the knight to e5, but unfortunately, you have to be very careful. Rook e4 could be nasty. Um, 
quick oh. note that rookie one check is not dangerous. The king always has h2, and there's just no fault. There's no way to park a second piece on the first rank. And then rook h8 to a1 would be a nice diagonal move. Okay, he gives the check. Congratulations. Um, now a big decision by Donchenko. I'm just kidding. Uh, king h2 is the only move. Yeah. And what and next? He's... Yes, I'm curious what Ali Reza's follow-up will be. It could just be bishop g6. What he could be saying is, okay, I'm going to disable your knight um, and set up the possibility of queen f1. Okay. Not bad. Ali Reza is very much in the game. I mean, he, just like uh, Nepo and all the players of the younger generation, giving up is just not in his dictionary. He will fight to the end. He does it in every time control. I've faced it so many times in Blitz. It's so debilitating. Uh, he is he is just a snake. It's crazy what he finds in lost positions. Yeah, these top players, they always slither away from it's the danger insane. zone. <laughs> yeah. I've been there too countless times, don't worry. But, uh, okay, it looks like uh, Dunchenko has played king to h2. Are you surprised, therefore, knowing how resourceful he, he is and knowing the fact that actually Black's still alive, uh, that Ferruja was kind of acting out there, just shaking his head, staring away, like clearly cursing himself under his breath? Uh, because we wouldn't expect such uh, behavior from someone who's still kicking, fighting hard. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's it's one thing to be emotionally devastated by uh, the proceedings, but Gary Kasparov was, was also like this. He wore, I mean, times 100, he wore his emotions on his sleeve. Sometimes it impacted his play, but other times it motivates you. You get angry and you say, no, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, give up. I'm going to fight until the end. I'm not going to go for this narrative. Let's see which Ali Reza shows up in these 10 time control moves. Yep. And uh, which Donchenko shows up. He's done a lot of the hard work, won a pawn, but um, some questions ahead. Um, yeah, it's, uh, he's definitely not one to underestimate. He's in control, but the clock is ticking for him too. Uh, still only a move 31. Um, okay. Just while we... Let's catch the for... results in, in Prague's game. Let's do that. Let's do that. Oh, oh amazing. <laughs> Just as Just I say time. that. Oh, beautiful. Oh, we got the, the amazing camera angle with a black. Oh, that's an arbiter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the arbiters have an uncanny knack of uh, standing in front of the cameras. Uh, this is almost as if they uh, haven't been told before. But uh, in the meantime, yeah, Xu Wenjun, tough game. She didn't do much wrong, but uh, unfortunately up against a player in top, top form in Prague. Just the opening, it felt like Dania uh, decided a lot of this game. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's fried liver. Every time it's trotted out at the high level, it seems to win. Uh, Hikaru beat Caruana with it. Then I think Fabi won a game with White. It's just the opening that tends to slip through the cracks um, of most players' preparation. And this has been one of the exciting trends um, of recent times. Everything is well trodden. Everything is explored. So one of the tricks of the trade is to revert back to the, you know, to the old school uh, lines. These these guys in the 1890s, 1900s, they kind of knew what they were doing, and they weren't as you know as as obtuse as we tend to think they are. For example, uh, Wilhelm Steinitz wrote a 250 page book on opening analysis. So the idea that uh, that there wasn't any opening analysis, you know, 100 years ago is very very wrong. And in fact, they got a lot of it right. Mm -hmm. um, even without computers. Good job by Prague. He continues his rampage. Yeah, fantastic play by Prague. Candidate for a reason. And as you say, uh, fashion in chess works in mysterious ways, but often it is simply about revising, revisiting all of these old forgotten lines and just knowing them better than your opponent. So uh, for anyone out there watching, listening, pick up those uh, old books, pick up uh, those old grandmasterly world champion games and... Uh, yeah, a lot to learn from those, both in the opening and a bit later on. In the meantime, Wei Yi against Yan Nepomnishi. Wei Yi, he's uh, on a king march. Will he be successful with this? Will the king be coronated at the end? And uh, will Nepomnishi's defenses crack? Um, you see on the camera, it's black to move Nepomnishi deep in thought, but not much is going to save him here. He's stuck, frozen, unable to find a good plan. Because there is none. Yes, yes. There was a brief glimmer of hope, I think, when Wei Yi allowed that queen on d2. But he disarmed it so expertly. Just very adroit getting the king to g5 patient. Um, and this is just a beautiful example of positional domination. 
Uh, every piece is on its proper spot. The knight is dominating. Black, again, has no moves. Rook d8 tried by Nepo. He has to try to force, ironically enough, he has to, he is now begging white to take on f7, to please give me like a square for my pieces. And I think knight takes f7, maybe he wants rook c8. Somehow he needs to muddy the waters in white's time pressure. Yeah, but Wei Yi, he's uh, shown just phenomenal self-control so far. I wouldn't be surprised if he just waits another move. There's still no threat at all. What about just rook e3, defend that c pawn, just in case the rook lands on c8, just sit and uh, keep waiting, Beautiful. keep torturing the opponent. Uh, I'm sure there's better, uh, I'm sure there's others, but uh, Wei Yi doesn't need to rush. Again, instructions <laughs> for everyone at home, just when you've done the hard work, control. Just don't give the opponent any counterplay. Just one note, don't get too excited though. Funny line, king h6 is bad because of knight g8. And if you go the full nine yards, you're going to be left without a knight. King h8, rook takes c6. Congratulations, you've won the extended king of the hill game, but you've lost the chess game. Uh, so it's it's important, again, on the topic of not falling in love with your ideas, being practical, um, probably you're right. So rook e3. Actually, rook e3 is such an excellent move. Just protect c3, set up knight takes f7. And as always, king g7, maybe here you take on f7. Or, again, rookie seven, uh, hitting where it hurts. I think Wei is just a couple accurate moves away here from breaking down Black's dogged uh, resistance, but there's only so much that Black can do. Yeah, if he reaches move 40, still with advantage intact, still with the really beautiful options of taking on uh, F7, uh, then I think he's going to win this game. We're at move 36, so he pretty much has to make four accurate moves, Wei Yi, with six minutes. And then he'll have an ocean of time to think and he'll wrap it up. No problem mm -hmm, at all. So mm -hmm. Jan needs to muddy the water somehow in the next four moves. Just looks impossible. That's why I advocate just, especially when the clock's ticking down, keep things simple, overprotect. Um, just make sure there's zero counterplay at all. Um, but he's odds on to win this one where he, uh, as long as he gets to move 40. And um, okay, is it time? Just a brief update. Max Zulu against Max Varmadam. For yes. those interested in that battle, black's still a pawn up, and it's a race, potentially. <laughs> the black pawns are marching. This is exactly the kind of game that you want to watch and not play, <laughs> um, which in, is actually most games, but especially this one. I mean, it's just a completely, as you said, random position, I think is a good way to define it. But unfortunately for Parham, it looks like he has made quite a bit less progress. Max has sacrificed the exchange back um, in order to restrict the mobility of white's pawns and he's done a great job of it that bishop on b8 is it may seem just staring at the pawn but it's actually doing a great job of preventing f5 and it begs the question how does parham get cracking in the center because black's plan is very clear and i mean even a monkey could do it just b4 b3 a4 etc mm -hmm. yeah it's it's hard i must admit parham he's been trying to hustle on the clock it feels like he's uh, really uh, been blitzing um, max especially max down to two minutes, but we're about to close in on move 40. And I think, as you say, he's made his decision so much easier, Max Varmadam. This is really good practical uh, practical play, clear-cut plan, pretty much autopilot next couple of moves and pressure on white to whip up, create something out of nothing. The white king is too passive. If it were an e4, the white pawns could start pushing. There's not enough support for them. White's rook is on the wrong side. White's knight looks nice and pretty, but going nowhere. Um, I actually think he's, despite the fact the evaluation bar is less enthused, I think he's played this really, really well and uh, still a bit of a favorite to win. Would you still say 60-40, Daniel, or have the mm, numbers changed? Maybe 60-40, but you know, now 60% draw, 40% 40 win for black. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it really depends. I'm going to a way to move 40. I mean, the next three moves are going to be very, very telling. Um, Parham may be considering a move like knight back to e3, uh, maybe knight to f6, but that might be too slow. Black could even ignore uh, potentially the threat of rook d7 check, but two minutes for Max. Parham needs to find some way to force him to calculate, make him make a decision. And uh, of course, we are aware that uh, it's been a while since we've checked into the Ali Reza game. Unfortunately, it looks like the, um, the DGT board from the playing hall um, has had a glitch. It's it's not on our end. I mean, they're making moves, but the board isn't giving us anything. Yeah, maybe we uh, check in on the board 
Donchenko, that was a really sadistic smile that briefly crossed his face Jeez. and then he realized it was his move and he had to focus. Um, yeah, this one, just looking at the pieces, uh, trying to figure things out, it looks like he's still in control, still has the extra pawn, but um, yeah, of course, we'll update you on all of the ins and outs, all of the variations and stuff um, very shortly in this one. Um, they are at move 37. Donchenko still has three moves to make before the time control. And his clock is ticking. Yes. Oh, there we go. I think we have moves. Oh, like magic. Amazing. Just when we called for it, we have it. I was going to say the transmission with plagued, or shall I say hagged with some difficulties, but it is all back. Yeah. Ali Reza made his last move with nine seconds on his clock. He is playing a hyper bullet game, David. Unreal. Wow. But White is not playing without risk either. There's mate threats with like knight g4 and rook h1. If you go hunting for breakfast with bishop takes d5 bad don't do that yeah you need to keep your pieces in position the only pieces that aren't playing for white here are the rook on c5 and the knight on mm -hmm. d2 the knight on d2 is defending defending rook c7 looks tempting i'm not sure what the threat is but um rook f7 line up Ooh, oh oh okay. it's not a threat Ooh, <laughs> knight g4 at the end Careful. <laughs> <laughs> rook c7 um, threatening to blunder <laughs> but It'll force the opponent to think. It'll <laughs> at least scare the opponent. Those types of scary moves are normally really effective in time trouble. Uh, I mean, you're the you're the blitz uh, bullet expert, Daniel. What would you be playing here to try and uh, try and hustle uh, Alireza on the clock? Yeah, rook c seven. I think obviously you should see that you're not threatening anything. He's played it, but it's a setup move. I, I think this type of move can be poorly understood by some players who might say, "Well, if you're not threatening rook takes f seven, then why are you playing the move?" But you're it, the situation is very volatile. Um, Black's queen may move away from the sixth rank, and you want to set yourself up as positively as possible for all the tactics that may come. And rook c7 threatens f7. It attacks the queen side pawns as well. There's nothing wrong with just taking a bunch of pawns here um, if, if the queen moves away. So, um, yeah, rook c7 is a great setup move. Ali Reza down under a minute there. Okay, yeah. what has he played? He's rook h7. Yeah, rook h7, and the reluctance on his face. He played that with 21 seconds left. He's, again, lining up, trying to hold everything together, trying to defend. Maybe he didn't realize that rook takes f7 wasn't a threat. But again... Wait, but what... now this this looks like it loses on the spot. One second. Is there some tactic Ooh, here? Can you take on h5? h5? Bishop takes h5. Is that a free pawn? It might be, and that actually sets up the threat of rook takes f7. Mm-hmm. Black's tied down. It's, it's like a pincer movement against the f7 square. Bishop h5 wins the game. You can sense the excitement. Don't you go, no, he's right there. He's knocking on the door. Mm -hmm. Bishop takes h5. That's the killer. Yeah, when these top players, they lean in, it's as if they've smelt something, they sense something. He knows. He knows he's winning. He just needs to find the killer blow, put the cherry on that cake. And, okay, he spotted something. He looked over at the clock. It's as if he's trying to will himself not to get overexcited. And uh, he's yeah. looking in the direction of Black's H-pawn. No counterplay. Hands on White's knees. Safe. And, uh, five. Ooh. He, yeah, he's really got great self-control here. Not rushing. Still calculating. Double checking. Bishop takes H5 wins. There might be other moves. Uh, but the Black Bishop, if it gets back, will hold things together. So this might be the only immediate knockout. Otherwise, the game goes on. Yes, and you obviously want to double check, triple check, but you don't want to overdo it. Um, he's got five minutes on his clock. You want to leave yourself with a little bit of time uh, just to react to whatever Ali Reza throws at you. He will fight till the very last move. Um, so Bishop H5, very easy to calculate. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to make any moves on the board uh, just because we're about to get a bunch of moves on the real board. But Bishop H5, obviously, Rook H5, Rook H5 at the end. White takes on F7 with a very obvious mating attack and he's done it he has done it he's found the winning move and Ferruja leans back despondent in his chair nothing to do yeah the black king is under heavy fire and he knows will he resign will he fight on is there a way to fight on um, this nope. one is over donchenko curtains. yeah the star this is curtains. what a move and this is why we line up on the seventh rank when we have white so many targets there this is why we try and use all of our pieces together and combine them in an attack 
all of White's pieces are attacking the Black King, apart from the Knight, and Ferruja looks like he might well just offer his hand. There's no way to fight on. You're getting checkmated. You're down two pawns. And he resigns. Donchenko takes the win. Incredible. What a first win for Alexander Donchenko. And Ali Rez has got to just be shocked. What just happened? I mean, he was totally in control. He was even already maybe thinking about a quick knockout. He had Donchenko's king in the center with no castling rights. And then boom, five moves pass. The landscape shifts, a couple sloppy moves, some time pressure, and a victory for the German player. And what a blow to Ali Reza, whose roller coaster ride continues with a very painful loss. Yep. Since the beginning for Ali Reza, it's been up and down. And unfortunately, today was a bit of a downer. But uh, congratulations to the German uh, prince, uh, Donchenko, for his first victory of the event. And um, yeah, he's been close before. We've mentioned it. He does take, in sparkling fashion, actually, a win after a bit of a difficult middle game, turning things around. And uh, yeah, this uh, chess on tour out there in The Hague has really brought out the best in players. Decisive games are racking up now. We saw a win from Prague earlier, now a win from Donchenko. And uh, Abdusa Torov took a win. It's been a white day. All of the players with the white pieces simply cashing in, uh, turning yes. a bit of a trend throughout this tournament. And Wei Yi, yeah, Wei Yi has also officially won his game. Wow, we are down to only one game, believe it mm -hmm. or not. Yeah, I mean, we saw a draw earlier, Ding, Liren against Giri. I thought, oh, is this a trend where we start seeing some peaceful games? But suddenly, four white wins. And uh, I don't think we'll see that case uh, in the clash, my Zulu against Max Varmadam. But let's jump over there. Let's whiz over there because uh, have they reached move 40 is the first big question. Yes, they have. They have. <laughs> okay, so time added on. <laughs> quite a bit of <laughs> quite a bit of time. Yeah. Lots and lots of time. <laughs> <laughs> we see the clock ticking down to zero. I think we'll see it reach zero, but Max Ramadan will of course get time added on. Now we're past the move forty. And Dania, I think we need to catch our breaths. It's been nonstop action, four decisive games in the last uh, segment, and yeah, everyone at home, time for you to catch your breath as well. Uh, will Max Zulu survive? You'll find out. We'll be back in five. See you after the break. Kasparov, uh, Gary Kasparov. Big fan of Gary Kasparov. Gary Kasparov. Where is Gary Kasparov? He, he really inspired me to take up chess. So, I mean, his uh, attacking games and style was just very impressive. He was the hero when I was very young. Probably both Kasparov and Carlson. I read Kasparov's books and I watched Carlson's games. And also uh, Magnus Carlsen. Magnus Carlsen? Yeah, clearly Magnus Carlsen. Yeah, for me Magnus uh, has been my inspiration. He was a world champion all the time when I started following chess. And we, we can all learn a lot from his games and nobody shows this kind of class in the history of chess. I think that almost every top chess player uh, carries something that it can be a source of inspiration. So um, I can look up to almost, almost any one of them. In this video, I'm going to show you top 5 scholar-made attempts in Champions games. Before we dive into the games, I would like to show you the pattern if you have not seen it yet. Well, this happens when white goes with 1e4, black responds with e5, and white plays queen to h5. This queen gets into the game way too fast, attacks the pawn on e5. Now black plays knight to c6, guarding the pawn, and white goes with bishop to c4. White's two pieces are attacking on f7 and would like to capture this pawn and if black is careless and plays knight to f6 then we have queen to f7 and this is a checkmate. Scholar's mate attempt 2 by Hikaru. Here we have this game between Hikaru and Philip of Anton and we have 1e4, e5, queen goes on h5 and g6 once again, Hikaru plays queen to f3. Once again, gives a try to checkmate Black's king, 
black says, mm, no, I see that, and knight to e2. We have seen already this kind of position earlier in the first game, so black plays bishop to g7 to make sure that the king is castled, and here Hikaru goes with d3. Black responds with d5, attacks right away in the center. White captures this pawn, and black goes with knight to b4. The pawn on c2 is hanging, so white has to play bishop to b3 to guard this pawn, and now we have knight to d5. And here we have this end game where white has very active pieces, both rooks are controlling the open files, and the bishop is controlling this diagonal. As you can see here, those pieces are concentrated mainly on the queen side, and they are not actually so active. And the king is all the way here on the king side, just alone. So white is using this and plays rook to e7, gives a check. If king goes on the back rank, it will be a checkmate. Uh, so black goes to king h6 now, and here we have rook to d6. The pawn is hanging and it's not just a pawn, it's gonna be a checkmate. So king goes back on g file, plays g6 to guard the pawn, and we have bishop to c4 attacking the rook. But what is actually the idea of this move is that white wants to play bishop to d3 and checkmate this king next move. There we go, this is the checkmate that happened in this game and second attempt of scholars made. In fact, worked out. This game has ended in 39 moves. It was not a checkmate in four moves, but I think white got really nice play on the king side. It's Kasparov against Tupolov. I think it was dream calculation by Kasparov, and I love it. My favorite is, uh, I would say, Gary Kasparov against um, Vesel and Topolov. Played in this Waikanze, 1999. Uh, the game Kasparov to, against uh, Topolov comes to my mind. It was just so famous, <laughs> so many remarks on it. Topalov's king came you know, from c8 all the way to, to, to b1, so that was an like, interesting part of the game. We're back, round nine of the Tata Steel Masters, and there we heard the players talking about their favorite games. Lots of name drops there for Kasparov, but uh, Daniel, I think Donchenko, after this last round, has a new favorite game. Yes, I think it might be the timeless classic, Donchenko Ferruja, uh, Tata Steel 2024. Uh, it was a lovely game and a very, very big win, one that I think you can rightfully brag about for, for years to come. Yeah, 
one of his best ever individual results, his best ever wins there, Donchenko taking down Ferruja. And uh, that means we're left with just one game. And uh, let's recap some of the results we've seen so far today. Four white wins, wins by Donchenko over Ferruja, as we mentioned, a couple of draws, but uh, lower down. Abdu Satorov taking down Jordan Van Forest in brutal style, very quick game there. Wei Yi defeating eventually Yan Naponishi in a really classy, smooth positional effort. And Pragnananda after a great opening, a fried liver attack, beating Zhu Wenjun. And a uh, dramatic day on tour out there in The Hague. Yeah, some incredible games today after our rest day as we expected. Uh, we were not disappointed. And uh, for Noterbeck, sweet revenge, of course. Uh, seem to believe, seem to remember that Jordan defeated him in the last round of, was it last year's status deal? Mm -hmm. uh, to, yeah, to prevent Noterbeck from winning the tournament. So uh, he got his chance at revenge and he cashed it in. This tournament just keeps turning around. I mean, there's impossible to make any predictions. There's no momentum to speak of. Anybody can beat everybody, and anybody has beaten everybody, um, as this round has has illustrated. Yeah, and the key remaining question is, can Mats Vamadam beat Parham Magzudlu after a brilliant start to this game with the black pieces having what was almost a winning advantage by move 13? This game has dragged on, but he's still in control, Max Vamadam. And let's jump into the position itself uh, to assess what we're left with after the time control. We've passed move 40. And this is what he's left with as black. A pawn up and two protected pass pawns on the queen side, but still a lot of hard work to be done. Yeah, this is actually a very difficult endgame to handle, obviously for both sides, but uh, black. the onus is on black to demonstrate uh, the winning technique. The basic issue is that uh, these pawns are, are not easy to, to move forward. I mean, you can push a three, but that's about as far as they'll go for now. And the second problem is that the knight is actually a surprisingly uh, able defender on, on b4. You can't go either way with the king because you run into uh, two symmetrical forks on, on a6 and, and on c6. So the winning technique might require a little bit more finesse. It might require black to uh, go after some of these uh, weak pawns, particularly the g4 pawn might be the most accessible one. Rook g3 um, comes to mind, but potentially runs into the move rook to h1. White can also uh, garner some counterplay. So it feels like it should be winning, David, uh, in summary, but probably the winning path is very tenuous and very, um, you know, there's a lot of monsters along the way. Yeah, uh, that's for sure, uh, especially when a knight exists. All the forks, you mentioned two of them, there's going to be more, uh, that's guaranteed. Um, rook g3 came to my mind as well very early on, but um, just to point out, rook b3 looks like it trades off rooks. And actually, if you could keep the integrity of your pawn structure and take rooks off the board, it's an easy win for black. But mm -hmm. uh, rook b3, unfortunately, um, yeah, in this exact position, the fact that you're going to lose the head b pawn here, um, I think there's just not enough material. The black king, I think, Daniel, the key is that the black king cannot march towards the white pawns because there are all of these forks. If you could plant it on e4, you win. Uh, if you win any of these black, uh, white kingside pawns, you win. But uh, you cannot step forward. You're simply yeah, stuck. You, you set out on a journey from San Francisco to New York, but you can't get out of your garage. <laughs> it's like King C5. Whoops, that A6 died to, uh, to buy a new car. Okay, Knight A6 ironically might not even be the best move because Black can sack the bishop. But anyways, um, mm -hmm. very important point. Can we try uh, Rook to G3? And I was trying to assess this in the bathroom, which is probably not the best place to try to calculate this end game. Um, but what is going on here after rook h1? At first I thought, okay, rook takes g4, probably bad for black. Yeah, rook takes h6. Again, this huge problem, king c5, knight a6. King a5, knight c6 is just a worst move in the history of chess. Um, and if you go back to b7, there is a very nice parking spot uh, calling Parham's name on f6. There's kind of a, yeah? Rook f6, Ooh. bishop takes e5 might be a trick. So I don't know if you have to avoid that one. Maybe. Rook f7, king b6. King. And we will leave the rest as an exercise to the reader. Yep. Um, <laughs> Black's still actually, better. But... <laughs> rook h7 is also a move. Wait, like rook f6, bishop e5. Let's look. So the point of f takes e5, rook takes b4. Mm -hmm. And time to bring out Dvoretsky's endgame manual. <laughs> hmm. Why is this still a draw? It looks like Black's just a pawn up. Um, 
Can't argue with mystery. that. <laughs> mystery. Um, maybe if you want to. Uh, okay, you can. Yes. Just Sorry. Mark. <laughs> I was going to say if you want to bank it and not risk anything, this still looks very good for black unless you're uh, holding by a miracle. Maybe in that position, instead of rook f6, maybe we just defend f4, like knight d3 or knight something, and then we go for that pawn. I don't know if knight d3. Oh. I'm a bit scared of the eight pawn marching, but I think I'm in time to go, um, uh, go over and collect. I'm also trying to hint at knight c5 check type of ideas. Knight c5 check might be uh, a bit annoying for black. But I agree. I think it feels like black has gone wrong here. Like It feels like black has relinquished serious winning chances in a situation where white has an hour. So mm -hmm. it's important, I think, okay, after rook h1, there is the immediate a3. Rook takes h6, and maybe there you can try to go forward, but uh, that will require some serious... Oh! That's clever, though. Let's tr that's show that down there. Let's try it. Takes. Giving up the bishop. Here. And look at this. Knight a6. I'm not sure where to go, but let's... Okay, crap. I put it, of course, on the wrong square. <laughs> but just to illustrate my... I guess King d4 was better. If knight takes b8, the one of the basic ideas here is a2. It looks like the pawn is stopped, but among other things, I think there is... Yeah. I mean, Maybe come on. <laughs> same idea. Let's play b4 just to try and connect the pawns, and then you can show the idea. Uh, yeah, b4. <laughs> b4, <laughs> Maybe. f5. I guess black doesn't even need rook g1. You could just probably go b3 mm -hmm. and just ram the pawns through. b2, b1 is coming, and the knight is totally uh, out of the game. It's off sides. But why was king c4 wrong? Maybe I've given you an, an unnecessary check on c6. Mm -hmm. So king d4 in that case? Maybe king d4 forces the white king back as well in some variations. I'm not sure how this helps, but... <laughs> yeah, this should you, be winning, maybe... though, a2. Yeah. Although there's some nice c6 checks, rook a6. Hmm, must be winning. But now, again, this move is never good, I guess, for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> But it's winning. Yeah, this is this is winning for black. I think it's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. um, maybe b4 in this position, your your idea or, just... Or rook g2 check first. Oh, rook g2, then... yeah. This is why we put the king on d4. I forgot. Yeah. And then and now? king c3, maybe? Threaten checkmate. Why not? Check. And then I'll try something else. Yes, back to d4. King b4. No, I think b4, actually. Ah, uh, b4. Oh, okay. and there's now no you checks and you're threatening mate. Yeah. <laughs> Easy, simple stuff. He'll find this. <laughs> <laughs> of course, easy clap. Yeah, I mean, this is what we're five, ten moves into the line. Yeah, um, not easy at all. He's actually lucky, Max Marmadam, that he hit move 40 just at this moment. So he does actually have the time, 34 minutes on the clock, to calculate this type of variation. But as you say, it's so kind of fraught with danger. Like where you put the king might different uh, differentiate <laughs> a win versus a draw. Um, of course, kind of allowing counterplay full stop is always a bit of a uh, kind of uh, a bit of a enthusiasm killer. So rook g three allowing rook h one, he might have just ruled it out without going deeper. Um, is there a way to? I mean, there's just no way to activate the black bishop or black king. I quite like your a three in light in kind of light of that variation we were showing because you're always a tempo up. Maybe next move you go rook g three. Also a nice hiding spot if the Black King can sneak around to a4, which is, yeah, no given. But um, can we try a3? Okay, so immediate a3, yeah. Very honestly, very sensible move, just keeping all of the advantages of the position. Mm -hmm. But the evaluation bar didn't approve. <laughs> so, For some uh, nebulous reason. Uh, my blitz instinct is to play king c2. I mean, move the king closer to the pawn. Mm -hmm. um, and... Now, is there a difference if I go rook g3? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, let's try. Same idea. Rook t. Oh, wait. Why is the bar evolving? Why is it uh, getting so excited? <laughs> let's take on g4. <laughs> it's like a seismograph. Oh. Oh, and I blundered. <laughs> oh, maybe king c5 now. Maybe you just voluntarily, proactively sacrifice the bishop. Uh. Rawr. No. How about the uh, the other way? other way? Let's go the other way. <laughs> King A5. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this might look like we're blundering left, right, and center, but this, I hope, is quite instructive to the audience because uh, this is what Max is doing in his head, his trial and error. Process of yeah, I mean, come on. I, I don't tolerate any, you know, 
any of that from as a newer commentator, I was very apologetic. But now, I mean, we're we're spending thirty seconds on this position. He's got he mm-hmm. spent nineteen minutes already calculating this. So I don't yeah. think we're doing a bad job of highlighting. We have no engine on. You know, we're we're mm-hmm. estimating things, and obviously, there's the conceptual uh, part of the position. Okay, sacking the bishop, and then there's the specifics. Okay, how do you do it? When do you do it? But this, I think, is winning for Black before. Yeah. And this is the basic point. Like now, the knight is totally out of the game. Knight c6, rook c3, brutal. Mm-hmm. That's a fork. Maybe I can try to go like this. But b3 um, must be winning somehow. <laughs> a2? Check. Is this just going to be checkmate? <laughs> <laughs> just in time. <laughs> <laughs> rook d1, rook, rook g1. <laughs> Mate. Oh, nice. Very flamboyant, very flashy. And um, yeah, I mean, a3 uh, th- on the first move looks very committal, but then it does open up all these uh, kind of avenues. If the Black King can start running, sprinting down the board, mm-hmm. and it's well known that knights struggle against these rook pawns. And I mean, every time I've I've been lucky, I've played uh, Magnus a lot at Blitz, and anytime he has a pass pawn, he just shoves it down the board. I'm like, Come on, mate, you're going to lose your pawn. It's too vulnerable. He's like, no, no, no. There's always tactics to justify having a pawn that far down the board. So kind of A3 would have been tempting. But he goes for a different uh, idea, also tempting. Rook H4. Uh Uh-huh. So he's trying to do the same thing like Rook G3, but also to prevent Rook G1, uh, Mm -hmm. Rook H1. But obviously this move also has drawbacks because on H4, the Rook is uh, very awkwardly placed. And this might open the door for uh, more counterplay for Parham. Um, also to note one more of these thinks and backs is right back into time pressure. So there's this illusory safety net that this additional time gives you. I've, I've had this many times where, especially with like a, only a 30 minute time addition where you take 25 minutes on move 41 and boom, it's like right back to a blitz game. Yeah. Story of my life as well, Daniel. Don't worry. You're not alone. <laughs> Literally. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I enjoy that luxury too much on move 41. I sit there, kind of take a sip of tea, you know, go out, go for a walk, stretch the legs, come yeah. back and <laughs> straight back in the <laughs> danger zone with the clock. And uh, that's where the blunders occur. But yeah, max 30 minutes. I think ultimately a good practical decision, Rook H4. Maybe there were cleaner wins. Maybe there was a more direct path, but no easy moves for Parham right now. Does he defend his pawns? Rook G1 looks horrible. Yes. Um, <laughs> what else simply for White? No easy defense, no easy moves. Yeah, you might have to. I mean, for some reason, I really want to give this knight e5 check. It's very, very tempting. But it actually might play right into Black's hands. Uh, King a5. And uh, Rook B1 to a8, maybe. That position would be nice. But no, I think you have to keep this knight on b4. So by process of elimination... Maybe Rook G1 is the only move. Yeah, a sad move. And knowing Mag Zulu, he'll be looking for tactics. He'll be looking for tricks, <laughs> anything before Rook G1. He doesn't want to go passive. But OK, how does Max proceed after uh, that defensive move? OK, let's put it on the board. Um, OK, still nobody uh, canceled the idea of A3. This is possible once again. Um, and maybe even more tempting with White's Rook forced onto an awkward spot. There's a check on H2 that can be delivered. Mm-hmm. Mm. Really tough call. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, your idea, H5, G, H, Bishop, C5. But no, that seems too speculative. Yeah. Almost. I mean, I would want to slow play at Bishop, C7 and somehow sneak the king out. But <laughs> yeah. I'd probably get punished for my... Uh, yeah, exactly that type of thing. Yeah, speaking of punishment, I have a funny, another funny Yasser story. Okay. On that topic, I think this might be the good good time for it. Definitely, in light of all us. the time in the world. Um, yeah, this was actually I had never heard this. Yeah, I've heard most Yasser stories, of course, from you know all of my time yeah. interacting with him. So, approx- of course, again, disclaimer: I not one one hundredth of the storyteller that Yasser is, but um, the story goes that Victor Korchnoi. Of course, who else? Uh, Victor Korchnoi was playing a tournament, and um, he he made a draw against a low-rated player. He offered a draw in a better position. He misevaluated it, and then the following round, he he lost the miniature. Um, and so he was approached by a journalist after he lost the game, and he was like, "Victor, you know, what are your thoughts on how the tournament has gone south for you?" And Victor was like, "Well, I'm 
you know, interpreting this pretty philosophically, you know, it's just like uh, Dostoevsky's book, Crime and Punishment, right? I mean, I offered a draw in a better position. So in the next round, I got punished. I got what I deserved. And the reporter asks, what was Dostoevsky's rating? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, that, yeah. I'm sure that, yeah, chess journalists have uh, said worse Some, answers. Yeah. Questions. <laughs> I mean, they're chess journalists. That's the, they investigate chess games. Exactly. Yeah, crime and punishment. Who will uh, the punishment land on eventually? He did commit a lot of uh, crimes in the opening here at Magzudlu, and he's had to suffer for it. But then again, you could argue he's been, you know, he deserves to be rewarded for fighting on this well and this hard, uh, not making it easy at all for Black. But um, yeah, I think this might be the, uh, a good moment, Daniel, with White about to have a long, long think, probably Rook G1, we think, defending the pawn. But uh, this might be a good moment to update everyone on the challenges section today, where we haven't had a chance to jump over. They're still out in Vikanze. Uh, they're not here in The Hague. But uh, I'm being told that there was a phenomenal game, a really entertaining game between Alina Robes and um, Liam Froelich. Froelich? 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 Liam Froelich? Uh, I don't know. I trust you. I trust you. Uh, Hey, I, you, sir. <laughs> my Dutch, I haven't brushed up on my Dutch in a while. <laughs> and uh, Liam Froluk, Froluk, I'm being told, at least. <laughs> so, um, yeah, here we see one remaining game uh, with leader and world junior champion, Mark andrea Maurizzi, uh, against Divya Deshmuk. Looks like White is just a pawn up and slowly but surely should win this one, maybe by advancing the king at the right moment. But um, yeah, I think it's that game with uh, Elena Robes and Liam Froluk, which apparently means happy, uh, that we should be happy to go to. And it ended yeah. in a black win, but credit to David, Elena we Robes. we need to get serious. We need to stop frolicking around here. And um, and you need to stop being a diva about it. I mean, <laughs> oh, wow. wow. Yeah, yeah, I can't compete. Uh, <laughs> I resign. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you've already made your mark. <laughs> Sorry. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that was like uh, that was like one of those games where it's like I've blundered, and then you just hit me with all the <laughs> winning moves, and like, I have no response. Queen takes h8. Queen takes a8. Queen takes b8. <laughs> Literally, like the windmill. We're talking of a Dutch tournament. Um, okay, let's go to that king's gambit, though, Alina Robes. We've been promising it, and. I think it lives up to expectations. Um, and okay, it was ultimately a win for Black. This is a crazy position, to say the least. <laughs> this uh, is the final maybe, position. This is the final position. Let's just go from the start and uh, enjoy. Sure. Let's play through a few moves. Okay, Aline with a very interesting tournament. She defeated two of the top seeds in a row. Um, and just such admirable. Oh, Bishop C4, also a surprise, by the way. Um, wow, you don't. You haven't, I haven't seen this since. Uh, like the 1870, I don't know, Dusseldorf Chess Congress. <laughs> like I want to say like Hampe against Stein Steinitz or something. But okay, you, Black you shoes, play. Queen H4 check. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, you clearly haven't played on the English chess circuit where this is like week in, week out. Like every uh, Englishman and his dog play this uh, this opening. I'm sure this is up, right up Jonathan Spielman's alley. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so knight c6 for natural developing moves. Um, okay, and Black is up a pawn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the end, unfortunately. <laughs> no, okay, but so. I think some, somewhere here, Arlene misplayed it a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. But then she got out of it. She's incredibly resilient. H4, very much in the spirit of the King's Gambit. A4, B4. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is happening here? Yeah, white's upon down and white's king looks a bit airy. Uh, this is how Fisher looked, like to used to set up. He used to play d6, h6, g5, but um, okay. Bishop back. Um, uh, this is not looking coming. great for white. Yeah. Wow, five pawn <laughs> attack. Just unfortunately <laughs> on the wrong side of the board. But wait, there's more. Liam misplays it. F3, g3. He thinks the game is over, but look at Aline. Rook a2, incredible defensive move. Which right. was, I think, clearly overlooked by um, Froleik. He takes the knight, another bad move. Back to f6 he goes. Now the knight is untouchable because of queen g6, but 
Aline finds another shot in the center. This is very much King's Gambit style. And suddenly the queen is very much boxed in. And Liam has to give back the knight. And the game continues. Wow, it looks like it's gone wrong for Black. Severely wrong. But how did he uh, turn this in his favor? I guess the white king living life on the edge here, literally. King H2. <laughs> very good. And, I mean, this looks fantastic. A really inspired play by Alina, but... But now it comes all crashing time. down. The King's Gambit, one sacrifice was enough, and in huge time pressure, this was the big problem. Um, quietly, Liam has 11 minutes. Alina has one. Queen G4. Just forgetting about the rook on E1. Oof. Yeah. An understandable panic, David, because Queen E2 runs into rook D2. So I don't even know what the correct move was. Probably Queen C1. Yeah. Something Probably along those lines. One. I just want to play knight d6 check because I can, but I'm not sure whether that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> a great move. Uh, just to close the file and uh, take the bishop on e6. But yeah, chaotic game, Danya. And wow. again, we love to see it, this uh, romantic 18th, 19th century chess. But unfortunately, this type of chess, high risk, but high uh, reward. And the risk factor did prevail. She, yeah, just one slip and it, that's all it takes. Yep. Fortunate. Okay, tough game for Aileen. She almost got out of it, but uh, she still uh, should hold her head up high. Two huge wins this tournament and uh, plenty of opportunities uh, to score more upsets. In the meantime, we have moves. No, a move. Mm -hmm. One, parentheses, one move by Parham. Should we go yeah. back? Are there any other games that... Yeah, let's go back. I think it's time to go back. Um, yeah, we saw the results there in the challenges. Uh, they're in Vikans A. We'll check back in on them a bit later or potentially tomorrow. Um, and a move, but an important one. Knight d5, check. Check to the king. Where to run? Do you slide to the right, to the left, to the edge, to the center? Um, I would be inclined to play king to a5 here, but I'd probably walk into some checkmate with the white we're ending <laughs> up on a8. And... <laughs> yeah, that's it. I, I, um, I think the one easy... Uh, tactic to point out king c5 looks wrong to me mm -hmm. um, because let's put this on the board because of knight c3 i think this is what parham is hoping for now obviously this is not the end of the story black could even sack one of the pawns and still be better there's like rook h2 check but that begs the question why deal with this the big difference is if you put the king on a5 which is a less um visually appealing score but now it takes away the prospect of knight c3 obviously this now runs into uh before so i'm curious what what does Parham want? Does he actually want to play rook c1 and try to get the rook to c8? Is this his idea? Knowing Parham a bit, I would say potentially yes. He always finds the most tricky, the most ambitious moves, even if they're not always objectively correct. Mm -hmm. um, rook c1, we need to refute this though. Yeah. Um, evaluation bar says, okay, blunder, but <laughs> obviously for a human, that's uh, far less clear cut. Um... Beef. I mean, it looks like a big threat, Rook C8. I could see why Max would be turned off by this one. Totally. I want to avoid it. Yeah, I mean, Rook takes G4, Rook C8. I don't see... I mean, Bishop takes C5, walks into Maiden 1. Uh, maybe you just take the materialistic approach. I mean, Rook C8, Bishop A7 is possible. Mm -hmm. With the idea mm -hmm. Rook A8, King A6. But here White has the additional resource, Rook C7. And exactly this is what White wants. You want to get it you want what you had previously, which is a mess. Um, mm -hmm. And if white is able to eliminate f7, play for mate tricks, it starts getting messy again. Yeah, and the players, uh, unfortunately for them, they don't see the evaluation bar, so Max won't realize that this mess, this randomness, is still good for black. It looks like white's made massive progress there. I like king a5, though, nonetheless. I like... I mean, it's this pattern we always point out, right? Knights are dominated by pawns or bishops when there's two squares between them, and then mm -hmm. on the third square there's a, a piece. It feels like the king on a5 at least won't walk into any forks immediately. I'm not going to say it dominates the knight. The knight's beautifully centralized, but it uh, feels like the safer square. King c6 also, knight c3. Process of elimination, actually, Daniel. Is, well, what else other than king a5? No, I think the only explanation, because already Max has taken four minutes, and this is what I talked about. I mean, he's below 30 minutes now. And in about 15 minutes, you know, he's going to start feeling the heat on the clock. I, I think it's very likely that he is um, trying to get his bearings after Rook C1. Again, it's so easy for us to 
like not take this line seriously because the IE ball bar shows plus three. But if you're in Max's shoes, I mean, you see a checkmate, you get scared. And that fear is kind of amplified when you play someone as, as terrifying as Parham. Um, so I'm not at all confident that you know, King A5 will even feature. I mean, maybe Max decides to play it safe. But I, I wouldn't be able to resist. I would just play this move and then wait for Rook C1 and then think. Mm -hmm. I was also wondering, actually, after King A5, whether White just comes back Knight B4 and <laughs> <laughs> I just to a repeat, <laughs> offer a draw. <laughs> Most likely going to get... Uh, yeah, I was going to say smacks down that draw offer, but... Uh, um, oh, I see. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> uh, getting <but> no, warmer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Damn. Um, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we'll stop now, Max. We promise. Okay. Yeah, time to, um, time to move on to Parham. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's still so many tricks, so many resources. I mean, I think Max is going to be here for the next couple of hours trying to win this. We'll be here, so we better uh, buckle up for a long, long grind. Wrap ourselves in and get the coffee brewing and, uh, you know, get the fire burning. <laughs> get the wine pouring. <laughs> get, the, get the barbecue grilling. But Max still has to decide where to put his king. Yeah. I do wonder, yeah, King C5, the bar didn't react that much, but... Just looks so wrong to allow any counterplay. Um, Knight C three related to drop any pawns. Oh, I keep I keep wanting to say maximize <laughs> maximize the uh, advantage here, but it feels like you won it all. So why not King A five? I, I guess it's just that mess that we're left with at the end of the line um, that he's trying struggling to evaluate right now. But um, this is where, Daniel, we should be blessed as commentators. We should feel grateful that it's no longer a seven-plus-hour time control. <laughs> uh, not good for Max, because now he'll be in time trouble imminently again. But, um, yeah, he does need to speed up with his decisions. Yeah, this is a, every second just reminds me why I'm in this chair and not, you know, the uh, the player chair in, in the hay. Well, it was because I wasn't invited, but um, the real reason is because I'm Pretty bad at decisions like this. But yeah, I, I totally get it. You're trying to dodge the word uh, maximize, even though it's it's a good chess word. It's like that joke. Uh, I bought the world's worst thesaurus the other day. Not only is it terrible, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, poor Max. I mean, yeah, those who know me know I like a good endgame grind, but this is not that type of uh, grind where you can just kind of play on feel and set little traps here and there. It's like you're the one actually having to walk a... Uh, a bit of a tightrope just to keep winning chances and calculate, calculate, calculate. Ugh. Where's Prague when you need him? Sub him in, and uh, he probably exactly. win this with Black. And where's Magnus when you need him? I mean, he's true. I feel like he's sun tanning somewhere, enjoying, enjoying this moment. Uh, I can um, confirm he is. <laughs> Shout out! Excellent, good man. <laughs> yeah, but oh, yeah, it's tough. Knight to d5, and yeah, while uh, while Max thinks, maybe it's time to talk a bit about uh, our years in chess. It's now 2024, but um, 2023 for Parham Magzulu was a great year. He added a bunch of rating points to his FIDE rating, and uh, on chess.com, he was also extremely active. Over a thousand games, pretty decent winning, uh, winning ratio there, and best win against Hikaru Nakamura. That's no mean feat, uh, not too shabby at all. And uh, if anyone wants to check out their own year in chess, go to the link below, go.chess.com forward slash YIC exclamation mark for uh, your review. Um, impressive stuff, Daniel. It's no 17,000, but uh, 1,000 games. That's that's some commitment. No, that's a somewhat healthier number. Um, Parham has had a, such an interesting journey to, um, to, to the chess Olympus. There was a time when I think he was like an untitled 2,500. He burst onto the scene. Um, winning a very strong tournament in Iran. And ever since then, he's just shot up. Uh, such an interesting player, very up and down. One of the streakiest players uh, at the top. We don't get players like this too much anymore, and it's, he's a treat to watch. Um, but of course, when, he, when he's in bad form, he can have some rough events, but he will bounce back. There, there's no question about it. Um, he's got the right attitude. He's got the skill set. And Max now has a king on a5. So the big moment, will we see Rook C1 by Parham, and if so, how quickly? Yeah, I think uh, Parham, I mean, you mentioned it, there are so many strong qualities, a uh, bit of a late 
newcomer to the scene. Uh, you normally we're used to seeing all oh, these uh, grandmasters by 12 years old, but once he broke in, uh, he's it's just been up and up and up his career. Uh, phenomenal player to watch. And I know he's taking it seriously. He wants to be world champion. Um, I know he's been asking top players how he can improve, how he can finally break that last barrier into the real elite. And um, yeah, he got married last year as well. So it's been a bit of a high for him the past 12 months, talking of years in chess. And uh, unfortunately, this tournament has been yeah, a struggle so far, but still fighting in this game. Hmm. Okay, king to a5 on the board. Okay. Uh, so rook c1, the tempting move, but I don't think Parham is married to that idea. Uh, night before, your uh, second proposal, it's a little less glamorous, but I actually think it's a very serious uh, candidate move because black's only way, if we can put this on the board, I mean, we might as well... Mm -hmm. uh, Plunge in, get our get our hands dirty. But after knight b4, um, bishop c7. Okay, the king b6 is a repetition. So bishop c7. And how does white... Ah, knight c6 okay. check. And this is actually yeah. interesting. King b6, there's knight d4. Yeah, I just so, want to come around. Take the pawn. Wow. So black has to go here. But now uh, you keep checking. I missed king a6, I must admit. But now king b7... Evading the checks. Bishop a5 mm -hmm. is coming. It is. Why is the eval bar being so evil? <laughs> Not declaring its intentions. It's just in its nature, I think. Um, yeah, knight d5, bishop a5, and it looks like black is kind of turning a corner here. Mm -hmm. Literally. Mm -hmm. And once the king moves... The um, king c6. Mm-hmm. Just, it just looks really good for black. Why is the <laughs> eval bar saying it's fine for white almost? No. <laughs> so frustrating. This is chess in a nutshell. Modern chess. It's modern check after a 97 check. <laughs> and uh, yeah, king c5. I mean, again, you're starting to walk the tightrope here. There's another Oops. check on c1. Oof. And another fork on c6. And you cannot escape the forks. By the way, we have a move. And it is rook c1. And we kind of called it Parham. I mean, Rook C1, it's, it's very, very tempting. So we leave this behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And this is a huge moment. Things, I think we waited patiently and we get rewarded. Now it's, it's go time for Max because there is a threat. I mean, Rook C8 is like a winning threat. Mm -hmm. And can Black go A3? Or is there a tactical win here? Do you just go Bishop A7? Whew, 22 minutes on the clock. Five hours into the round and arguably the most committal decision of the game yet to be made by Max. Definitely. And uh, there we see the game review, the uh, kind of check. explanations. Oh, check. I was going to say the explanations for all these moves, but uh, yeah, Parham just testing the opponent. Um, nothing wrong at all with Rook C1 in a human point of view. You're probably worse anyway. Might as well test the opponent. Um, okay, driving the White King up the board. Feels counterintuitive. What could the idea be here? Taking away the option of grabbing on G4 as well. Um, must be something very specific from Max. Is it A3? Push, push, push. Is push, he feeling Rook pushy C6. about his winning chances? <laughs> Bishop, <laughs> Bishop, I mean, A3, Rook C8, Bishop A7, we've considered in a different iteration. Uh, maybe what he wants is to create this like second rank force field um, to make sure that A2 is now a defended square. So after Bishop, uh, okay, A3, Rook C8, Bishop A7, I would be terrified of that position, like rook c7 still looks very messy, but maybe he's calculated that the pawn kind of squeezes through too. Mm -hmm. That might be it. I mean, do do we just go a3 here? I mean, process of elimination, that's pretty much the only way to justify his previous move. Um, it's worth mentioning b4 is a very bad idea due to mm -hmm. rook c5 check. Um, so a3, what else? He clearly doesn't want to go after white's pawns anymore. Moving the bishop now just loses a clear tempo. Bishop a7, rook c7, white gets the same idea just with an extra move. So again, process of elimination, trying to get inside Max's head right now has to be a3. Logical. And it might be winning. Um, this check on h2 might actually have been the key to the kingdom uh, for, for Max. I mean, I could put it on the board, but I think we're about to get a move. It just, I'm yeah. just feeling it for Max. He's just holding himself back that last, you know, check. No, not a physical check, but just checking the move um, because you're now walking on razor wire. I mean, you're dealing with checkmate threats. You need to be 
very vigilant. A3 on the board by Max. Walking on Ali Reza wire right now. <laughs> A3. Uh, his good friend, Parham. Uh, yeah, okay. They used to be big rivals in Iran, but great friends. Rook C8 on the board. Bishop A7 forced. And let yeah. me just show very quickly A2 with arrows. Rook takes B8. You promote to a queen, and Rook A8 is checkmate to the Black King. You need to save your bishop as a last line of defense between the Rook and the King. And it's played. Of course, Max finding the narrow path. All the right moves actually here from Max. Uh, just going straight for promotion. And Max Zudlu, he doesn't have too many options. Pinning this bishop doesn't get anywhere. You're caught on the wrong side. The Rook's actually misplaced, I guess, after the Black King retreats to protect a 7. So Rook C7 we're expecting. Blade. Actually, yeah, we're, we're doing okay here, Danya. We're doing okay with our prediction. We are. Here. But now where does the bishop go? Because mm -hmm. it, bishop b6 was my sort of gut instinct, but white can go back to c8, which is quite unpleasant. So maybe you want to get the bishop out of there. I don't know. But white's move could be rook c8 regardless. Mm -hmm. Where does the bishop go? I would play bishop b6, rook c8, bishop a7, repeat once, just gain an extra <laughs> minute on the clock, and then panic. But <laughs> um, yeah. Where, where else can it go? Bishop, if it runs, well, actually, not too many safe squares. I was going to say to g1, far, far away. f2 feels a bit odd, but it is protected f2 at least. Um, ah, but look at this idea. If you go bishop g1 and I go rook c8, maybe I can put this on the board because we're going to get a small thing from Max. Yeah. Um, bishop g1, Key rook moment. c8, if yeah, king a6 is possible. Mm, it's not a bad idea, but maybe not the best. I was going to say king a6, rook a8, king b7, mm -hmm. and very importantly, there is this skewer at the end of the line. Um, that protects the a3 pawn. But I think the critical position is this one. Can black find a precise move here? Do you go the other way? Do you go in? King a4, king b3? Ooh. <laughs> Bar says no. Computer says no. How could this be equal? It's ridiculous. <laughs> wow. What have I blundered here? Knight c3 check. King b3. It's completely winning to me. Looks from a human point of view, looks just over. Maybe, but maybe King C three. Oh wow! Rook H three check. King, King back. C two. That is nope. Devilish. Okay, I'm checking. I'm 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 done. Rook B <laughs> B eight. <laughs> Rook B eight. Ah, you're setting up the threat of Knight C three check. Wow. And we should show that because there's still some checkmates actually <laughs> in that uh, type oh of God. position. White is better now. Knight c3 check. Yeah. I mean, what do you even play here? King b4 runs into, I guess, just knight takes pawn. King a3? Yeah, king a3. I just wanted to point out king b3 loses, right? <laughs> Rook takes b5, king a3, and king c4. Ooh. Checkmate. <laughs> Wow. A1 knight? Oh, okay. I missed oh! that one, but luckily I can <laughs> skewer everything. <laughs> Amazing. And A1 queen, I'll just show A1 queen is lovely mate. And, and rook b2, there's another mate on A5. Wow. It's amazing. It's not over. It's very <laughs> blunderable, over. by the way. I mean, King A4 is such a natural. Rook b8 is ridiculous. It's like a quiet move. You know, Nero fiddles while Rome burns, but incredible. I mean, you have to walk on on hot coals. The correct move, by the way, I'll, I'll double check what the correct move is here. The most accurate winning move is probably, okay, yeah, it's rook h3, check back to h3. And if white steps back to c2, you go b4. Check here, check here. You sack a pawn. And then you go back to h2, and you have rook b2. No, but this is inhuman. Now, with 20 minutes, I don't think Max is going to find all of this. Yeah, that's so sophisticated. I mean, the reason you check, first of all, drive the white king back uh, is so that the black king can get to c4. That's mm -hmm. not easy, step one. And then you have to check the white king further back. Um, rook h3, I guess he might find that just if he wants to gain a bit of time on the clock. But wow, that's another level of difficulty. Um, I was wondering whether you could play bishop f2. Um, I think I might have spotted one difference, at least, 
in that okay. line. Um, because rook c8. Now, can I play king a4? <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, if rook, and what is the difference? If rook b8, I wanted to play bishop e1 <laughs> to cover oh, knight c3 check. Oh, that's lovely. Wow. And the bishop, OK, you don't need bishop a5, because rook a8, you can go king b3. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Yeah. But I mean, this is only findable if you've realized, like we did, that we blundered into checkmate and all these knight c3 check <laughs> <ideas>. Like, <laughs> I mean, I think your way is more human, but still, like you said, so tough for Max to find like that rook h3 and then come with a king round to c4. I mean, that looks by far the most human way, but oof. Tough, 17 tough. minutes. He's got 17 minutes. I mean, I wasn't joking when I said it's very likely that, you know, by move 45, he's right back into time pressure. I would argue, okay, still about six, seven minutes before he truly feels the heat on the clock. But mm -hmm. then the path keeps narrowing and narrowing. And, you know, if he doesn't find the win, then who knows what's going to happen? Yeah, exactly. Credit to Parham, so tenacious. Incredible. Uh, forcing him to really dig deep here, Max. Um, I mean, we almost expected resignation <laughs> about four hours ago. But, yes. uh, yeah. Max still, he's literally earning his uh, money here. He's uh, forced to really grind away for every every move, every rating point. And uh, yeah, Bishop F2, Bishop G1. I think, so we've come to the conclusion, two winning moves at least for Black, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. The, it's not this next move. It's it's deeper. It's further. And missing rook b8 in that variation is, I mean, so easy to do. Yeah, it's just not a move that is on anyone's radar. Okay, rook h3 check, which doesn't give us much information. He might be... But is he repeating? No, I don't think he's repeating. Mm -hmm. I think he's trying to open up a new vista for the bishop maybe on d4. Ah, oh, that's so smart. <laughs> That's way the smarter way than what we were trying to do. <laughs> the way he's used his rooks, like he's got so little mobility with his rook, and he's somehow mm -hmm. it, managing to use it with the checks at exactly the right moment, back and forth, to get new squares opened up. But okay, does this solve his problems? King c2, bishop d4, our old friend rook c8. And I mean, there's questions left to answer there. Yeah. I like it though, this mantra that everyone at home should be uh, repeating constantly, just checks first, just look for checks, just in case, gives more options, reduces your opponent's options, gets kind of a glimpse into their intentions. But like you say, Daniel, still plenty of hard work. How about in oh. that position, King? Ooh, mm -hmm. hit me. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say in that position, uh, King C2, I'm expecting, or what could be more natural? Bishop into D4, Rook C8, threatening D4. checkmate. Yeah, just B4 and run the king. We've seen this idea before. Actually, we've seen almost the exact same position. Just the black bishop placement is even superior. Um, mm -hmm. It would be winning even with the bishop on g1. So Max has spotted this idea to give up the b pawn genius, and the a pawn will carry the day. So probably Parham has to go forward to e4 um, to prevent bishop d4. Let me show this on the board. This is really important. Um, king back to c2, bishop d4. Um, so for people just joining, OK. King C, E4 is on the board. Never mind. Never mind. We go back to the game. Parham finding all of the most resilient moves. And now what is it? Back to Bishop G1. But now the Black King David has a path to B3. Mm -hmm. Really important difference here. The White King has been kicked away from the main battleground. Um, the White King cannot participate in the defense now. Uh, yeah, it feels like Black has to move the Bishop. F2 maybe feels, again, feels better than uh, bishop g1, and it's that type of position where feel alone is not enough. <laughs> they have to calculate uh, those players out there in the Hague. But uh, bishop f2, and you've got to be slightly concerned about white at some point taking on f7, pushing the e-pawn. It's not, it's become a race. It's not obvious at all. Yes, white is not that far away. One, two, okay, it's four tempi sounds like a ton, but when you factor in the time that it takes to... Okay, get your king to b3. Eventually, white's going to stick a rook on the 8th rank. It's not a given uh, that this will not factor in, this f5 counterplay. Now, more time off um, Max's clock, trying to figure out where to put his bishop. Yeah, down to his last 15 minutes here. 
Um, at some point it will become a lottery. If you have no time to calculate on the clock, you'll just have to guess. And uh, normally to guess in chess does not bring success, but um, yeah, he has to just choose a square for his bishop. Bishop to f2, he's got to move. Checkmate is threatened. And Parham, yeah, it's definitely noticeable. He's really sped up uh, pretty much ever since he went into this uh, difficult, difficult endgame with White straight from the opening. He's uh, been trying to hustle on the clock. He's barely left the table, barely left his chair um, because he's trying to put Max under that uh, other dimension, that uh, under the time pressure simply. Um, but yeah, I think Bishop F2, maybe we jump in and try and figure out how easy it is to find the win or the path to victory. Yes, I think that's a good use of our time um, and because it's exactly what Max is spending his time on. So, okay, Bishop F2. Let's take this as a sample, a sample move. Now, our standard defense here was always to go rook c8. Um, now, rook a8 made is threatened. And the whole point, I think, of Max's play is that you have this path uh, that has opened up for your king uh, to b3. Mm -hmm. And how does white generate counterplay? Is it with this f5, e6 breakthrough? Do you play like rook a8, king b3, and f5? Maybe even f5 immediately to keep all of your options open is a thought. Yeah, uh, f5 looks really logical, unless at some point black can block everything with bishop e1, bishop a5, and push huh. the ape on, but that feels slow. <laughs> that feels slow. Okay, let's go straight for glory. Let's push the ape on and hope. Let's say check. Yeah, but, but white is not fast enough. Yeah, very minimum you play bishop to c5 here. Actually threatening oh, bishop yeah. a3 as well. Ooh. Yeah, and congratulations, you know, e7. Great job, you know, you've gotten rid of the bishop, but the simple rook h1 seals the deal. Again, it's been kind of a theme of this endgame, that at the right moment, black sacrifices the bishop, whether it's, you know, that bishop on b8, seems like an eternity ago, or in this case, sacrificing it for white's pass pawn. But the superiority of the bishop against the knight um, in these pawn race type endgames is really on, on, on full full display here. Um, Max down to 12 and a half minutes, mm -hmm. though. Still deciding. Any, mini money, mo time. It's go time. Yeah. It's go time. He's got to just move. And uh, after all, bishop f2, bishop g1, it's so hard to figure out the difference um, if there is any at all. If there is any, um, yeah. Perhaps both moves win. Yeah. He just has to trust his instincts at this point, and he jumps in, as expected. Bishop to f2. Um, good decision. And it's just about Parham. How does he see counterplay? Do you think now, Daniel, we're going to jump into a longer think as he starts to realize it's uh, even more desperate than ever before? I don't know. I think rook c8 might be essentially the only logical move. Maybe he'll spend some time on like rook c2. But um, as we've established, as you've indicated, bishop on e1 is is really, really nicely placed. I would also point one other thing out, which is that if there arises a situation where white manages to give up his rook for both of black's pawns, while that resulting endgame may seem completely lost, there are nuances to be understood there. Because if white can quickly play at 5e6, maybe white can force black to give up the bishop. And remember, knight versus rook is a draw. So even if black can win white's rook, it's still not over. A long road ahead, I think, for Max here even if he gets the best case scenario, um, which he likely has. So far, incredible technique, but these guys never die. They, I mean, you just got to keep pounding and pounding, and one inaccuracy, boom, they escape like an eel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so slippery. These top players, these really elite grandmasters, they never go down without a fight. You have to punch them <laughs> multiple times, dozens of times, just to get that one win. Um, I do have a couple of ideas. I mean, inspired by you, actually, Daniel, saying if White could give up the rook for those pawns. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder whether White could start with rook takes f7. Is this a quicker... Maybe if we can jump in with some moves. Um, is this a quicker sure. way uh, to try and create counterplay? Okay, I'll bite. And rook f8. Mm -hmm. Wow, king a6, knight b4, lovely. That was one <laughs> my main trick. <laughs> And I go um, bishop a7, ah, rook a8, and then again this knight before. Menace. Um, can I go 
Hmm. I see. This is actually very, very Maybe smart. Yeah, Rook takes f7 on the board. Great call, David. Yeah. I mean, everything else just seemed dead lost and actually very straightforward. So even if this doesn't work, which clearly it doesn't, um, at least it asks a big question. Now, Rook a8. King a4, yeah, Rook a8, King b3, and e6. suddenly... Yeah. Still winning for black, but... <laughs> But okay, seven, and this is a much more double-edged version, even if I play this primitively. Even this is much harder to win in time pressure. The F-pawn is rumbling forward. One mistake, and now the knight can drop back to F5 at some point. So incredible practical chances found. Let's go back to the game. Bishop C5 by Max, stopping wow. Rook F8. Wow. Cold-blooded. Can the Rook come back to C7, though? And... Oh, that's clever. <laughs> and okay, if black pushes, then rook c8 still. Mm -hmm. Oh, at least then bl black is gained bishop c5. So that whole variation you were showing, Daniel, it's the same, but black just is up a tempo. On the board. Yeah. Oh my gosh! So rook c7, a2, rook c8. You just go king a4, king b3. We get this pawn race, but with accurate play, black should be able to disarm. White's connected passers. Oh my god. This party so, continues. I think rook c7 has to be tried by Parham. Mm -hmm. That was so classy from Max, I've got to say. Firstly, to foresee rook takes f7. There's no kind of, well, this is far from obvious. It's uh, a bit of a hidden, subtle idea there. But to have the confidence, uh, kind of have the, have already calculated bishop c5, stopping the opponent's idea, but also kind of advancing black's plans in all of these lines. Um, just yeah, wonderful, wonderful play. Um, I think he's going to deserve this win. He's done it the hard way, but uh, Bishop C five, really nice move. Just multi purpose, deep in the end game. Still enough time, twelve minutes, not to get nervous. And uh, that might have been the clincher. Rook C seven, as you say, Daniel. What else? He's got to be tried. But uh, yeah, should be straightforward from there. I say should because yeah. <laughs> there have been twists and turns before in this game. Uh, but uh, it feels like he's getting the job done now. Because also at the end of that line, white will be forced to give up the rook for the a-pawn, and black will still have a b-pawn. So it's not just going to be you know, bishop and rook against the world. Black will also be able to push. Okay, rook c7, a2 on the board. Yes, I think we've done a pretty decent job of you know, calling the shots here, rook c8. Now Max is not going to promote, spoiler alert. And king a4, this is a huge move. Do not play bishop a7 here. That would blunder into rook a8, and suddenly the knight drops back to before retreating knight moves can be so hard to spot. Still plenty of landmines, David, for black to avoid in this position. Exactly. Is it the only winning move? It might well be right now. Um, I mean, well, king a6, same idea. Rook a8 check, and uh, black loses the a2 pawn. Even if uh, black wins the white rook for the black bishop, that will be far from simple with a race. White's knight, white's pawns running. So he has to go forward. He has to go in with the black king. And and he does. There we go. Yeah, he's yeah top four Max Valmadam. Just the whole tournament, he's been super impressive. Uh, double exclamation mark given to that move as well, because it does sacrifice the black bishop, which of course will not be taken anyway. Uh, black will make a new queen. But uh, yeah, the only winning move. And he's on the brink now. Still not an immediate threat to promote, but uh, white's pieces just can't fight against the might of the A-pawn. Black's threat, if anything, is just to park something on A3. Bishop or Rook. Um, block, or well, King B3, yeah, block the A-file. And uh, winning. White has to give up the Rook, I think, uh, as you mentioned there, Daniel. And in the worst possible version, I think you have to play rook a8, rook takes a2, which is a very uh, painful move to make. But bishop a3 is such a huge threat um, that uh, you might have to play rook takes a2. And, you know, at that point, it's pure desperation. But no, that's not going to cut it. White's pawns are not really going anywhere. Black can sack the bishop at the right moment, as we've established, and push his own pawn through to promotion. I think he's done the hard work. The rest is a matter of double checking, keeping his composure, just uh, executing the simple moves. But I think he has it in the bag. Okay, check on A. No, E6. Farham's still fighting. Maybe not in the bag. Yeah, 
clever from Parham, actually, this uh, this last move. He's trying to initiate a race where both sides might even promote. Uh, oh. And then uh, it's all about Black trying to checkmate White. And actually, I, I fell for a little illusion. Um, I was thinking, okay, King B3, Rook A8, Bishop A3. White can push E7, A1, E8, and the Rook on A8 defends the Queen. So I thought there was a skewer on E1, David, but no, the King can actually run to F5. Oh, just when we think it's over, it's nope. A new resource is found. This is fascinating. Amazing, yeah. amazing chess. Where is the win here for Black? Just when we thought we were out, they pull us back in every single time. And uh, I think we have to jump in and make some moves because yes, it's not off. Uh, we can't write this one off yet. Parham fighting like a real lion right now. And... Uh, Okay, it must be surely something to do with king to b3. Okay, but rook a8. Or no, is there another move? Does white... E7? Wait a second. Mm, but no. bishop takes? Yeah, it can't be e7. Rook takes c5. <laughs> a1 queen, and now e7. What? And it's not so easy. Wow. It's not so easy. Queen e1, I, I can hide on f5. Max has played a different move. He's played rook to a3. And mistake. Oh wow! Maybe As the rook c five. He's gotten the a, Parham has gotten an even better version of the same position. A one queen e seven, and oh my gosh. Black might lose this. Wow! We have to jump in and show this on the board because Max oh. Varmadam has lost his advantage. Miracles! Oh my happen. gosh! Look at this e seven. Black can stop the pawn, David. That's not the problem. It's not like you can't stop the pawn. Wow, Here Rook White C8. wins! <gasps> Rook C8! Check. And if Black goes Queen H7, F5, no more checks. White promotes. Wow. The king hiding in plain sight on E4, just surprisingly strong. Knights are a king's best friend, and this white knight always not only threatens these forks, but guards its own king. And Parham, wow. He's going to play E7, and... There's no way for Black's queen and rook to coordinate. Queens in the corner are actually the worst. They control so many squares in the center, but in the corner, there's no checking distance. This really reminds me of a game that Eric Geisy won in the Grand Swiss, where Black ended up promoting on A1, assuming everything was fine. Mm -hmm. Assuming because he got the first check that he was winning. But um, no, the White King is going to hide behind its own knight, behind its own pawns, and the Black Rook and is unable to help. Okay, Queen E1, King F5. There's crazy lines galore. If you try and move like rook d3, knight b6 check, I think. And suddenly, again, black loses. Rook e5. Insanity. I mean, wow. it's a domination of a rook against a queen and a rook. I mean, it's, this is remarkable. How does black draw? <laughs> I can't I mean, believe we're asking this question. Wow. 11 minutes on the clock and there's a turnaround <laughs> like this. Again, without the evaluation bar, we would assume that Black had a way to win until we del delve deeper, and it hasn't hit him yet, Max. Um, as you say, how to draw? Uh... Yes, that's not a question he's asking right now. I think he's still in this must be winning mode. All of us, every single person watching this, would be under the impression that Black Black must be winning. That it just cannot be real. The king is checkmated. You're down a queen. I mean, you're not even threatening to promote. That's not exactly really a threat, and yet. And yet, Black's pieces are in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, I was going to say, even if you play a move like Rook H3 or Rook G3, White's not even trying to make a new queen yet. Uh, but somehow, mm. somehow, White is at least holding on. Wow, I thought we were about to wrap things up. But now we're going to be here another few hours, Daniel. We love chess. We get more chess. Okay, E7. Vamos. Let's hold the draw. How, okay, how about if I try and be a bit sneaky? Queen mm -hmm. to be one check. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if this the is confidence sneaky, in your voice. King e5. <laughs> Queen g6. I wanted to stop you without allowing rook c8 to come with tempo. Okay, so let me try the primitive approach rook c8. And now I was hoping to go rook a1, and then I realized rook a8 just. Oh. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> um, okay, but maybe you can give perpetual queen g7. <sighs> And yeah, there's nowhere to hide for the White King. Yeah, because King D7 I can take with check. That's a bad idea. Mm -hmm. 
Perpetual. I mean, Black saves it by the skin of his teeth. Oh my gosh. Max. <sighs> Max, Max, Max. He's going to be heartbroken. Uh, now he's under... Well, he's got nine minutes to recover from this. He's a whole queen up. How can he not be winning? Chess is so unfair. Yeah, Rook A3 was the mistake. I don't even know what the winning move was because even in the better version that could be could have been yielded by A2, uh, it still wasn't easy. I mean, it was showing an advantage for Black, but not a big one in, mm -hmm. in this position. Let's, uh, in this type of position. Yeah, maybe we just go back and briefly investigate before we kind of catch up as Max makes a move, makes a decision. Where was the win? Uh, because it has disappeared it, on, in the game. It was Bishop A3. You had to actually save the Bishop. But still, this is not easy. I mean, somehow Parham found a way here, here. E7. Oh, E7 takes, takes. King B2. And White is winning, but... Even if Max had reached this position, I would argue it's okay. It's winning, but it's far from simple. Like knight d5, now yeah. only move a rook g3. Yeah, and now it's winning. White has no way to defend this pawn. You have to step in front of it with a king, and yeah, Black starts to push the b pawn. This was the the winning path that Max had to find. It started with Bishop a3. And yeah, good luck finding this with only a few minutes on the clock. Um, even with a couple of hours on the clock, good luck finding this. this even is, with an engine, it's still hard. I mean, jeez. Yeah. yeah, Parham. I mean, this is a skill. And this is one thing. You mentioned his big breakthrough tournament in Iran. Um, I was actually invited to that tournament. Luckily, I declined because he went on to crush all these experienced grandmasters. But um, he would always get these positions struggling out the opening. Whoa, oh! Max is Queen H8. He's blundered. Oh, C8. He's going to lose? No way. He's panicked. And Parham realizes oh, he just... He, oh, yes, this is over. White wins. Oh, Parham, he's so resourceful. I was about to say, he always survives these bad positions and turns things around. Rook c is just simple tactic. And he spotted it. Look at Parham peering forward, staring at Max. <laughs> we need to... Let's go to the camera because Max has <laughs> let it slip. And he realizes as well, head in hands, the turnaround. Chess is so cruel. Unbelievable. And Parham will take every fiber of his being to just double check. He he knows Rook C8 is winning. The excitement is palpable across the oceans. Unbelievable. Chess is disgusting. Mm -hmm. And he has no options. He has to play Rook C8. So um, it's the Night Fork, and Night Fork's end the game. He's talking to himself almost here, Parham. Wow. Um, yeah. Poor Max. He's done so well. He deserves so much more, but... That's insane. That's he was winning the entire game, literally from move 10 to move 50. He was winning the whole time. He found just brilliant move after brilliant move. But this is just a testament to how good these top guys are. It's it's just impossible. It's Sisyphean. You, know, the, you roll the rock all the way up the hill. You have that last hurdle, but you have they brought you whittled down your clock just to the point where you start feeling nervous and then you don't even get a draw you lose you don't even get half a point it's cruel very very cruel yeah and you have to climb that hill again pushing that heavy rock and i mean how do you bounce back from this uh, rook c8 we're expecting him to find it here parham i mean yeah, it's not necessarily an elementary tactic, but it's very findable, judging on all these night forks that he's found already. And there we go, the winning move. Will Max realize now he is lost full 360 in the space of a few moves? Double exclamation mark. This is it. And I mean, he's a whole queen up just for a night, but he can resign. Wow. Chess is simply the worst sometimes. Yeah, or all the alone best. In that, yeah, all the best, but uh, best for Parham. All alone in that dark playing hall. Those uh, fake stars in the sky. But uh, Max is going to be feeling really alone right now. Yeah, I Oof. mean, it's just, you can sense the pain. It's purely, I mean, it's, honestly, the pain cannot really be put into words of losing such a game against such a player um, when you were right there. But, I mean... You can just chess is stunning on every front, and I mean this is 
just an amazing accomplishment by Parham. Honestly, it, the comeback of the tournament, perhaps, just a full 180. And Max is, you know, the realization is dawning on him. He realizes there are no moves. Queen h7, f5. Bad luck. The queen is boxed in. Everybody contributes. G4, f5, the king, the knight. White's pieces are all on the perfect spots. Black's pieces all on the worst possible squares. Rook, if the rook was anywhere but a3, it would be able to give the lateral check to the king. If the king was anywhere but a4, maybe the rook would have slid backward. But that's just how it works. Yeah. Geometrically, just such bad luck for Max. The black king on a4, it's getting hit by a knight fork. Simply knight to b6 is a deadly check once the queen takes the rook. and Just no way to fight on. He's down now to six minutes. Finally, a first shake of the head. And realization setting in. We've all been there, right, Daniel? So many, so many times. This is the type of thing we have to learn from in order to improve, in order to kind of uh, hone the killer instinct. But ultimately, it's just the clock. It's the atmosphere, the playing hall, the stakes at play, the uh, yes. kind of world stage. It's uh, it breaks the best of us. And yes, the eight. it's it's incredibly painful. There's just really nothing that anybody can say. There's no consolation. You just have to let time pass. Like the only solution is to play the next game. And this will sting for a long time. These games, they sting for months. Um, it's not an exaggeration. If you're a professional player, you remember games like this your whole life. Um, but if you're a true professional, you try to harness it into positive energy, uh, into motivation. But in the moment, this is all empty words. And all you can do is really just feel for Max. Uh, hope that he bounces back and simultaneously congratulate Parham on, I mean, something that I've maybe never, ever seen in my entire commentating career. I mean, a comeback like this to win an endgame like this and not with just a one move blunder, um, which of course came at the end, but through just dozens and dozens of brilliant defensive moves is amazing. Yeah, it's wonderful. Again, something to learn from, uh, from for everyone. Just keep fighting. Never resign. Uh, even when us as commentators are about to write things off, we get surprised. And uh, yeah, there's always tricks. There's always resources in a position if you calculate well, if you stop your opponent's plans. And uh, essentially, all he was trying to do, Parham, for 30, 40 moves was to stop the inevitable, stop the opponent winning. It was uh, that simple. And one chance, often you are granted a chance in chess when things turn around. So. Not much to be done. He's down now to four minutes, Max Marmadam. We will see a result any moment. It's just so cruel. No way to fight. No way to get the black rook behind. Yes, that's the thing. It's not the kind of blunder where, okay, now the game continues and you're worse. You're literally just blown off the board immediately. I was briefly occurred to me black and play queen takes c8 and then later try to get the rook around uh, to e1. But the issue is that white is another passer. And white can just push f5 at the right moment, and uh, the pawns will overwhelm the rook. Three and a half minutes now for Max. At this point, he knows it. I mean, he sees it. Unreal. Yeah. Wow. Look at that playing hall. The darkness that descends so quickly. Um, maybe we just very briefly put that on the board, Daniel, that variation sure. you mentioned. Uh, because it looks like you get close in a race, but not close enough. Um, the last key variation of this game. Yes, this might very well be tried by Max, hoping, obviously, for e8 queen, uh, rook e1. But among other things, I think the immediate f5 is probably good enough. Mm -hmm. And that's it. I mean, it's not even close. It's black is like yeah. a bunch of tempi behind. White makes two queens and wins the game. Could could black have put the king on a5 rather than blocking the uh, the pawn, the b pawn? Oh, and um, after, earlier on. Might b6 check after the fork. Yeah, but even here, now black is too tempting behind. Yeah. King back. Yeah. Yeah, it's over. Okay, queen h7 check is tried by Max. But f5 will follow. And maybe he can try to deliver some checks to the white king. Maybe some like rook a1 action, but he can't even go rook a1. I mean, white won't even rush with promotion. White will pick up the rook first. Yeah, that's a skewer. Rook a8 check. Wow. Yeah, loss for words, Parham. Great defense, but uh, ultimately, I mean, it feels like Max should get a quarter of a point or something for his efforts. Yeah, exactly. Is the arbiters converge and decide that 
you know he deserves or no rating loss from this game mm-hmm. but um, just... there's nothing like chess just so many hours of effort wasted in a single moment and that might be the most painful thing for a professional it's not the rating it's not okay tournament result prize money lost yes all of that is contributes but it's the feeling that you've just worked all this time and you know the, the reward disappeared in front of your eyes okay rook g3 parham still needs to be disciplined here i'm almost tempted to go king f4 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that actually might be the best move i don't know i mean king f4 looks like the sadistic way to do it i think that wins pretty much on the spot killing all the counterplay even promoting here i don't see how to catch the white king in the center it looks like you get two checks and that's it um but yeah why allow any counterplay whatsoever the white yeah, queen promotes. is going to land is going to land no stopping it king f4 first either way i think either or promote rook g4 king e5 there's one check on g7 you can hide on d6 and there's going to be blacks is going to get checkmated there mm -hmm. there's too many too many threats there yeah. yeah it's really similar actually to that eric icy game against jumabaya from the grand swiss if anyone wants to check it out it was also a white king hiding behind its knight on a similar square with a similar piece configuration um so yeah lightning striking twice unfortunately and this time on max Ramadan. but uh, paham again doing the right thing 40 minutes on the clock no need to rush you can enjoy this turnaround and yeah, I'm, I was going to say I was impressed by the poker face, uh, but Max, he's realizing a new queen appears. One check. Where will the white king hide? Yeah, king e5, just forward. Mm -hmm. That's been consistent with the way that Parham has handled this endgame. He's always kept active counterplay alive, um, even when it seemed like he was finally out of resources. His decision to play king e4 rather than king c2, that was a big one. Um, king c2 yeah. would have lost pretty quickly. Instead, he went for the gutsy call, just seemingly abandoning black's pawns. Um, but he saw further than any of us. King e5, that's it. Queen g7, Max resigns. It's over. Arham wins. Insane. Wow, oh, and it looked like he wanted to apologize to Max there. Um, every player, no matter how much you love winning, it feels a bit guilty if you steal it away from your opponent like that at the death. And Max understandably wants to get out of the playing hall, uh, out of the Athos Circus Theatre. Uh, yeah, it's yet another win for the white pieces. I was going to say earlier, I mean, that white had won four games already, but definitely not in this one. And there we see a smile from Paham Mansudlu. I think just the relief all pouring out on one moment. Absolutely. And he deserves to smile. I mean, you know, it's it's a tale of two opposite emotions. Um, and it's possible to feel, you know, joy for one player and sympathy for the other. Um, they're enemies at the board, but afterward, it's like you don't want to you don't want to rub it in your opponent's face. Parham is obviously very, very classy. And I mean, he deserved this one. It's it's I mean, with his defensive resilience, maybe he deserved a draw. But it's, saying the word deserve in chess is pretty meaningless anyway, um, because what happens on the board is uh, the deserved outcome, an incredible comeback win. One of the comeback wins of his career. This game is going to make the rounds on YouTube, Reddit, Instagram. This one will be talked about for a long time to come, and so will this round, David. That's right. And uh, you talked about outcomes, making your own luck. In the end, it was five players who made their own luck, all with the white pieces. Wins for Alexander Donchenko, Paha Magzudlu, as we saw there, Nodibek Abdusatorov, Wei Yi, and Pragnananda. A really bloody day. A lot of uh, action out there in The Hague. And uh, five decisive results, five white wins. That leaves us with the following standings. Things even tighter at the top. Four players now in joint first place. Abdu Satorov, thanks to his win, jumps up and joins the leading pack alongside Anish Giri, Pragnananda, and Gukesh. But they are chased now by a whole range, a whole bunch of players. And uh, again, only one point separates first place from eighth place. Anything still possible with uh, several rounds still to go, four games to go after today's action. Yeah, what a day. Obviously, this. The result is on the top of our minds, but important not to lose sight of uh, the other games, which seem like they were played on a different day in a different venue. 
uh, in a galaxy far, far away. But the tournament continues. And this is the uh, the brutality of this tournament. Max Warmerdam's reward is a game against Noderbeck uh, tomorrow, a big game that has implications for the tournament standings. But Prague on a roll once again. He faces his compatriot Vidit, another big game. There's no rest for the wary David. I think all the players would love another rest day, but they'll have to wait a couple rounds for that. Yeah, they have to earn their money, earn their spots, earn their rankings and rating points. And uh, these are the pairings we're left with tomorrow uh, for Wednesday, round 10, Alareza Faruja against Anish Giri. Also another big one as uh, Faruja aims to bounce back. Giri aims to get his first win in a long time at this point. Uh, Napomishi against Ding Liren, Jordan Van Forest against Wei Yi. You mentioned it, Dania. Big opportunity for Abdu Satorov if Max Varmadam can't recover from today's setback. Xu Wenjun against Max Uglu. Did it against Bragg and Donchenko against Gukesh. Um, yeah, breathless action and uh, more to look forward to. Uh, what's your big takeaway from today? Has it changed your perception at all and uh, who might win this tournament? Honestly, I don't even I, it's I don't even know what to say. Every every round, it feels like the standings shake up completely. This is going to be an incredible final stretch. I don't even know if I can call it a final stretch. There's four more rounds to play. Everything to play for in that time. So many exciting storylines to follow, David. And what a round uh, we were treated to today. This was this was incredible. Yeah, this was uh, chess at the top level at its best. And uh, that just leaves us to look at the schedule for the rest of the tournament. Tomorrow is round 10. We start at the same time, same place. Uh, 8.15 a.m. Eastern Time, 2.15 Central European Time, followed by a rest day, and then three last games. So it's the final sprint, the final stretch now. And uh, Dania, I know this has been a long day. I'm sure you're impatient uh, to get to Title Tuesday a bit later. <laughs> but uh, in the meantime, it just leaves us to say thanks. Uh, I've been David Howe. Uh, thank you, Naroditsky, for joining. Uh, Daniel Naroditsky for joining. And uh, thanks to all our viewers for sticking with us the whole five and a half hours. And we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye, everyone.